Dear colleagues, let me open our online workshop on the topic of inflation targeting in the world of the large and persistent shocks. So that is our second uh, workshop in a row after the successful experience of the previous year. This year we organize it with, uh, in cooperation with the Euro Area Business uh, Cycle Network. And uh, in this event, we expect that representatives of the central banks, uh, academia, international financial institutions, and financial centers will discuss the specific of the effective interpretation, implementation of inflation targeting policy in the period of uh, large and persistent shocks for the global economy caused by COVID-19 pandemic and the full-scale Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, so let me uh, pass the floor to Andriy Pishny, the governor of the National Bank of Ukraine. The governor will talk in Ukra Ukrainian with a consecutive uh, inter translation. So the governor, please, the floor is yours for the opening remarks. Dear colleagues, good morning. Я радий вітати вас на практичному семінарі інфляційне таргетування в світі значних і тривалих шоків. I am happy to welcome you at the workshop on inflation targeting in a world of large and persistent shocks. Мені здається, назва самого семінару і тематика сьогоднішнього обговорення дуже красномовні. I think uh, the name, the title of this workshop and the topics that we plan to discuss are talking for Nicole... themselves. Вони, як ніколи, мають практичний характер, адже сьогодні всі центральні банки на глобальному рівні мають справу практично з одними, одним і тим самим комплексом викликів. Uh, these topics that we plan to discuss today are important as ever because uh, most of the central banks are facing the same uh, challenges at the global level. Звісно, національні особливості є і будуть залишатися, але питання, які сьогодні виносяться на розгляд семінару, є принципово важливими, мені здається, для кожного центрального банку, для експертів, для фахівців, для представників академічного світу, дослідників, як теоретиків, так і практиків. Uh, naturally, uh, each country has uh, its uh, specifics, its uh, domestic context, but uh, uh, the issues that we will discuss today are very important for, the, for all the central banks, for experts, for professional representatives of academia, researchers, and other people present here. These requests, for their own specific countries, often have a lot of similar, especially in countries with risks that are developing, which practice політику інфляційного таргетування. Тому нам важливо поділитися досвідом та сформувати спільні відповіді на ключові питання. This, uh, although uh, these countries uh, have uh, own specifics, many of these challenges that they have, they have in common. And uh, especially if we speak about emerging market, market economies that are pursuing inflation targeting, that's why it is important for us to uh, look for uh, solutions together, for solutions and answers to the questions, to the important questions. Сьогодні ми поставили на мету знайти відповіді на три ключових питання. Today we are aiming to answer these three key questions. Перше, як забезпечити ефективність інфляційного таргетування з обмеженою трансмісією монетарної політики? First one is how to ensure effectiveness of inflation targeting with limited monetary policy transmission. Як досягти оптимального балансу між фіскальною та монетарною політиками? Second one is how to find or achieve the optimal balance between fiscal and monetary policies. Які особливості інфляційного таргетування в умовах нестійкої довіри? What are the specific characteristics of inflation targeting uh, with Ryan credibility? Фактично, обговорення сьогоднішнє можна звести до трьох ключових факторів. Ефективність, оптимальний баланс та довіра, пошук довіри. Uh, so we can uh, 
the gist of these questions uh, that we will discuss today is about efficiency, optimal finding optimal balance, and about uh, credibility, ensuring credibility. Ці питання є надзвичайно важливими. Світ вперше за останні 40 років зіштовхнувся з ризиками збереження високої інфляції та сповільненням економічного розвитку на глобальному рівні. These questions are very important because for the first time during the last 40 years the world is facing uh, high inflation risk and a global economic slowdown. В умовах невизначеності внаслідок пандемії COVID а потім повномасштабного вторгнення Росії в Україну, країни зіштовхнулись з букетом економічних шоків, які створили ідеальні умови для прискорення росту інфляції. Uh, with the elevated uncertainty followed by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and then full-scale Russian invasion uh, to, of Ukraine, uh, the world uh, uh, was presented with a bouquet of economic shocks which uh, create ideal condition for accelerating inflation increase. Мені здається, світ вперше за 40 років в зв'язку з сукупністю цих драматичних факторів знаходиться у вирі ідеального шторму. Uh, it seems to me that uh, due to these coincidences and this uh, alignment of these factors, uh, the world uh, for the first time during the 40 years is now in a so-called perfect storm. Ідеальний шторм це сукупність факторів, кожен із яких, звісно, має певне драматичне значення, але в своїй сукупності вони створюють картину глобального впливу. So uh, when I say perfect storm, I mean that uh, the factors aligned in a way that uh, if uh, separately they already have a dramatic effect on the economy and on the world, together they have even uh, more effect and create uh, uh, certain conditions that are difficult to deal with. Це букет економічних шоків, з якими нам доведеться мати справу найближчим часом і вже сьогодні, які здійснюють визначальний вплив Наступний втиск з боку попиту внаслідок відкладеного споживання та значних стимулів з боку центральних банків та урядів. This bouquet of shock, as I said, will uh, due to this bouquet of shocks, we will have to deal in the nearest future and even today with the uh, certain uh, factors, for example, demand-driven pressure caused by the deficit consumption and significant fiscal and monetary stimuli. Шоки пропозицій внаслідок структурних зламів ланцюжків виробництва як на національному, так і на міжнародному рівні. Then supply shocks caused by structural breaks of production chains at the national and international levels. Спричинені російським вторгненням шоки вартості енергоресурсів та продовольчих товарів, що в значних в зазначених вищих умовах дуже швидко проявляються в цінах кінцевих споживачів. Energy and food prices shocks caused by the Russian invasion under the existing conditions uh, that have a quick effect on final consumption prices. МВФ у своєму оновленому прогнозі очікує, що світова інфляція прискориться з 4,7% у 2021 році до 8,8% у 2022. According to the IMF's updated overview, global inflation is expected to accelerate from 4.7% in 2021 to 8.8% in 2022. Водночас, економічне зростання за прогнозом знизиться з 6% до 3,2%. At the same time, the economic growth is forecasted to go down from 6 to 3.2%. У 2022 році та 2,7% у 2023. Центральні банки країн світу знову постають перед своїми класичними протиріччями. The central banks face the classic dilemma. Досягнення цінової стабільності за рахунок жорсткої монетарної політики, що зумовить тимчасові втрати у зростанні, чи ігнорування інфляційних проблем і довгострокові втрати 
в економічному розвитку. They either have to choose to achieve uh, price stability through tight monetary policy, uh, but this will, uh, will lead to a temporary slowdown of economic growth, or they can ignore problems with inflation and long-term losses in economic development. Монетарна політика це завжди комплекс непростих рішень. Однак саме зараз це комплекс важких і часто суперечливих рішень. І ми бачимо сьогодні, наскільки різною і відмінною буває політика центральних банків перед тими самими викликами. Uh, the monetary policy decisions are never easy, but today we know that monetary policy calls for especially hard and often contradictory decision, and we can see that different central banks uh, make different decisions and their approaches are varying. З одного боку, центральні банки мають спільний з урядом мандат у довостроковій перспективі. Це підтримка стійкого економічного розвитку. On the one hand, uh, central banks and government, they have a common long-term goal to maintain sustainable economic growth. З іншого, саме центральний банк має піклуватися про макростабільність в короткостроковій та середньостроковій перспективі. On the other hand, uh, uh, it is the central bank uh, that shall take care of uh, macroeconomic stability in short and medium term. Надмірна реакція монетарної політики у відповідь на інфляцію послаблює економічне зростання та підвищує ризик рецесії. Excessive monetary policy response to inflation will weaken economic growth and increase the risk of recession. В той же час толерантність до інфляції може розбалансувати інфляційні очікування та нестиме ще більш тривалі та болючі втрати для економіки в майбутньому. At the same time, uh, tolerating inflation may result in unbalanced inflation expectations and uh, cause prolonged and more painful losses to the economy in future. Дуже нелегкий вибір. It's a very difficult choice to make. І в цьому аспекті баланс між фіскальною та монетарною політикою є необхідною умовою для правильного рішення. And from this viewpoint, a balance between fiscal and monetary policies is a necessary prerequisite to success. Практика показує, що надмірна акумуляція дисбалансів у фіскальній політиці та фіскальне домінування призводять до згубної для економіки хронічної інфляції та фінансової кризи, що зрештою змушує центральні банки до ще більш жорсткої контрциклічної відповіді. From practice, uh, we know practice shows that uh, excessive accumulation of imbalances and fiscal dominance uh, lead to chronic inflation that poisons the economy and to a financial crisis that at their final end forces central banks to give even stronger counter-cyclical response. Як наслідок, здатність реалізовувати свої мандати обох інституцій значно обмежується. As a result, the ability of both institutions to exercise their mandate may become uh, very limited. Пошук балансу сьогодні – це необхідна умова для забезпечення макроекономічної стабільності та стійкого економічного розвитку. Uh, today, to ensure macroeconomic stability and sustainable economic development, we need to start looking for this balance. Необхідна умова, але недостатня. It is a necessary thing, but uh, it's not enough. Варто також пам'ятати, що в умовах посиленої невизначеності та нестійкої довіри до монетарної політики центральні банки вимушені ще активніше проводити політику стабілізації з метою недопущення розбалансування очікувань. We also need to remember that uh, under the conditions of uncertainty and varying credibility of the monetary policy, central banks have to be even more active in their stabilization policies to prevent imbalances of, of expectations. Крім того, з боку інструментів політики, забезпечення ефективності трансмісійного каналу внаслідок накопиченого структурного профіциту ліквідності та створює потреби в неконвенційних методах. Again, speaking uh, of policy tools, uh, uh, we can tell that uh, uh, to ensure effective transmission, uh, effect effectiveness of the transmission channel, uh, we need to look for unconventional methods. На щастя, 
Історія має безліч успішних прикладів боротьби зі стійкою і надмірною інфляцією. Та врешті виходу на траєкторію сталого розвитку. It is good that uh, history knows many examples of successful campaigns against persistent and excessive inflation that allowed uh, to come to the trajectory of the sustainable development. Окрім розвинених країн, які пройшли свої шляхи дезінфляції ще 40 років тому, сьогодні існує велика кількість країн з ринками, що розвиваються, досвід яких може стати ключовим для досягнення глобальної стабілізації економічних і інфляційних процесів. In addition to developed countries that uh, came through their disinflation trials uh, 40 years ago, Uh, today we see uh, a lot of uh, emerging market economies uh, uh, that have the experience that might be a key to finding uh, solutions for global stabilization of economic and inflationary processes. Ukraine also has uh, this kind of experience already. It's a unique uh, experience and knowledge. Національний банк України в умовах обмеженої, а тепер і повномасштабної війни довів, що здатен приборкати та стримувати інфляцію. Uh, the NBU have proved that uh, uh, under the conditions of uh, localized and now full-fledged war, it's still capable to uh, curb inflation and to limit its effects. Після запровадження інфляційного таргетування у 2015 році Національний банк, Національному банку України вдалося знизити інфляцію з пікових 60% та стабілізувати на рівні 5% цілі. After introducing inflation targeting in 2015, the NBU managed to take inflation down from the record 60% and stabilize it at 5% target. Відмова від фіксованого курсу, посилення інституційної якості та незалежності Центрального банку стали ключовими факторами успіху. Switching to the floating exchange rate and strengthening the institutional capacity and independence of the Central Bank were the key factors of this success. Сьогодні Україна, окрім глобальних викликів, змушена боротися з наслідками повномасштабного вторгнення, яке зруйнувало третину економіки і продовжує руйнувати далі. Apart from global challenges, Ukraine is currently forced to deal with the fallout from the full-scale invasion, which has destroyed one-third of the economy and keeps causing destruction. І хоч в своїй реакції на повномасштабну війну Національний банк України був змушений відійти від еталону інфляційного таргетування, Наші принципи і наше прагнення не зазнали змін. While uh, responding to the full-scale war, the NBU had to deviate from the uh, benchmark inflation targeting approach, but our fundamental principles and aspirations have not changed. Національний банк України відданий своєму мандату, що дозволило утримувати макроекономічну стабільність та стабільність фінансової системи навіть в умовах, повного шторму і активної фази військової компанії. The NBU is committed to pursue its mandate which has made it possible to maintain macroeconomic stability and the sustainability of the financial system even as the perfect storm rages on and uh, with an active uh, military actions in uh, going on. Перші кроки Національного банку України після Початку повномасштабного вторгнення Росії були спрямовані на уникнення панічних настроїв населення та забезпечення функціонування банківської системи та платежів. The NBU's first step after first steps after Russia launched the full-scale invasions were intended to prevent panic behaviors among the population and ensure the operation of the banking system and payments. Функціонуюча банківська система та система проведення платежів і стабілізована Національним банком ситуація – це колосальна перевага України в умовах цієї повномасштабної війни. The uh, operational banking system and functioning payment system is a huge uh, achievement and, uh, for Ukraine and the condition of this uh, active war. 
Для цього Національний банк України з перших годин започаткував жорсткі обмеження щодо руху капіталу і зафіксував обмінний курс з метою стабілізації інфляційних очікувань. In order to achieve this, the National Bank from the first hours uh, had introduced uh, strict restrictions and uh, also uh, turned to uh, fixed exchange rate in order to stabilize the system and uh, uh, in order to ensure operation of the banking system. Для утримання фінансової стабільності Національний банк України змінив свій операційний дизайн та забезпечив фінансову систему необхідною ліквідністю і здійснив низку заходів для підтримки фінансового сектору. In order to ensure financial stability, the NBU has changed its operational design uh, and uh, supplied financial system with liquidity in order to support the, uh, the favorable conditions. Заходи в житті Національним банком створили периметр довіри до рішень, які ухвалюються Центральним банком в умовах повномасштабного вторгнення і ментально, в тому числі, підтримали банківську систему і менеджмент банків. The measures taken uh, by the NBU allowed to create this kind of trust circle uh, under the full scale invasion, under the condition of the full scale invasions and uh, help the banking system on all levels and the management of the banks also. Крім того, для забезпечення безперебійності критичних видатків уряду Національний банк здійснив викуп облігацій внутрішньої державної позики. Uh, also, in addition to ensure the continuity of critical government expenditures, the NBU purchased uh, domestic government debt securities. Вчасна і рішуча поведінка і реакція Національного банку дозволила пройти перший панічний етап війни. The central bank's rapid response and uh, decisive steps uh, enabled the banking system to survive the earliest panic vulnerable stage of the full-scale war. Згодом для подолання дисбалансів в економіці, що швидко накопичуються в умовах безпрецедентного шоку, НБУ розпочав етап стабілізації монетарної політики, збільшивши ключову ставку до 25%. Uh, then uh, to overcome economic imbalances that were quickly accumulating uh, uh, amid an unprecedented shock, the NBU launched the phase of stabilizing its monetary policy by raising the key policy rate to 25%. Також Національний банк послабив офіційний курс на 25%. Uh, also, uh, the NBU adjusted its official exchange rate by 25%. Разом з позбавленням міжнародної допомоги це також дозволило зберегти міжнародні резерви на порівняно з ручному рівні. Coupled with the revival of international aid, this also allowed the NBU to maintain its international reserves at a relatively comfortable level. Такі заходи дозволили втримати макроекономічну стабільність. Інфляція на кінець 2022 року, за нашим прогнозом, складне близько 30%. According to our forecast, at the end of 2022, the inflation will be about 30%. Звісно, це набагато вище за інфляційну ціль. Але історичний досвід інших країн показує, що в умовах війни це досить вдалий результат. Of course, this is much higher than our inflation target, but as we know from the experience of other countries, uh, during the wartime, it is a rather successful outcome. Вже сьогодні Національний банк України мислить далекоглядно і адаптує свою політику таким чином, щоб після перемоги забезпечити умови для швидкого та сталого відновлення. The NBU is already planning ahead and adjusting its policies to ensure a quick and sustainable recovery after the victory. Знову ж таки, досвід післявоєнного відновлення країн свідчить, що саме вчасні стабілізаційні політики є ключовими для швидкого післявоєнного відновлення. 
Again, the world's experience of the post-war recovery shows that uh, timely stabilization uh, policies are the key to rapid post-war prosperity. Саме тому ми залишаємося відданими політиці інфляційного таргетування. Та вже сьогодні декларуємо якнайшвидше повернення до цього режиму за відносною нормалізацією економічного життя країни. Therefore, we remain committed to the inflation target policy, and even today we declare that uh, we will resume the AT regime as soon as uh, relative normalization of the economic activity of the country allows us. Адже низька, стабільна і головне прогнозована інфляція є запорукою макростабільності. After all, uh, low, stable and predictable inflation is a basis, a prerequisite to macroeconomic stability. And it creates a solid foundation for the productive development of the economy. I want Ukraine today to be faced with unprecedented and extremely specific challenges. Many questions are still unique. Although Ukraine is now facing unprecedented and specific challenges, uh, many issues uh, that we have remain common to us. I mean the limitation of the transmission channel. Balance between fiscal and monetary policies. Balance between fiscal and monetary policies. And uh, a variable Confidence. Uh, the main common feature is a commitment to our core mandate, and I want to confirm it, it's uh, ensuring price stability. Тож я очікую, розраховую на те, що протягом сьогоднішнього заходу ми матимемо змогу поділитися досвідом, обговорити актуальні питання та сформувати важливі практичні висновки, які допоможуть нам досягати своїх цілей. Therefore, I expect that uh, during today's event we will be able to share our experiences, discuss current issues and uh, form important practical conclusions that will help us achieve our goals. Українська команда знаходиться в постійному пошуку. Uh, Ukrainian team always is looking for better solutions. Найбільш оптимальних і ефективних рішень в умовах того ідеального шторму, в якого ми знаходимось. We are looking uh, for optimal solutions uh, under the conditions of this perfect storm that we are now finding ourselves in. Я дуже сподіваюся, що наш досвід буде корисний для вас. I hope very much that our experience will be uh, useful to you. А ваша експертиза допоможе нам. And your expertise will help us. В цьому пошуку. In this search for best solutions. І буде успішною компонентою. And it will be a uh, successful component of наших рішень. Of our decisions. Бажаю всім мирного неба, плідних дискусій і корисних висновків. I wish uh, to all you uh, to all of you peaceful sky over your heads and uh, meaningful discussions and informative conclusions. Слава Україні. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you governor. Uh, and now we may move to the first session which should be uh, moderated by Viktor Kozyuk, who is the uh, member of our NBU Council. But uh, due to the recent uh, missiles attacks, uh, so not always the access to the internet is available within Ukraine. So uh, I th uh, thus I uh, pass the floor to Volodymyr Lekushinsky, who is uh, the director of monetary policy and economic analysis department of the National Bank of Ukraine, to uh, moderate this session. Volodymyr, please, the floor is yours. Uh, dear colleagues, 
Dear guests, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to, to participate in this seminar. Unfortunately, as Sergei said, Viktor Kazyuk was unable to join. So I uh, I will moderate this panel. Uh, I, I will say a few introductory words. Like uh, I need to admit that uh, we behaved in quite a geistic way by concentrating the agenda on topics that are very topical for the National Bank of Ukraine. Uh, of course, it's a joke. Uh, these topics are uh, interesting for uh, most of the central banks. And uh, monetary transmission is very topical, I think, for, for all central banks, as uh, uh, after uh, realizing that uh, inflation uh, is not temporary in its nature, it's a rather per permanent one. So central banks started to increase key policy rates uh, in a decisive way. But it revealed that uh, after the period of uh, ultra loose monetary policy, financial markets are not in the same shape as they were before. So the initial impulse in monetary tightening that central bank is providing is not uh, finding proper response in the economy. Of course, uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, old habits die hard, and such old habits in the case of uh, financial system is reliance on cheap funding. It's uh, ample uh, amount of surplus liquidity in the in the system. So all these factors are an impediment for uh, proper monetary policy transmission. In the case of Ukraine, uh, National Bank uh, increased uh, key policy rate in a very decisive manner by um, 15 percentage points. Uh, in our case, monetary policy transmission, its speed and magnitude are close to our pre-war uh, assessments. However, in this environment, uh, we want to achieve faster transmission, especially to deposit rates, to provide um, provide uh, the the economy with uh, instrument and national currency that are uh, that could be used by firms and population, and to soften the. Uh, the pressure on uh, our uh, exchange rate. That's the main purpose currently. So we are elaborating uh, the set of measures to increase the uh, monetary policy transmission. And I think uh, central banks, other central banks are, are working in, uh, in the same way currently. Uh, but I would not uh, speak too much. I would rather give a floor to uh, to the uh, panelists. Uh, so I want to introduce our panel. It's uh, Thomas Holub, uh, the member of the board of the Czech National Bank. Uh, uh, it's uh, Shalva. Kartashvili, uh, it's uh, director of uh, macroeconomic and statistics department in the uh, National Bank of uh, Georgia. Uh, it's a Jaime Yaramilo Vallejo. Uh, he's a external board member of Central Bank uh, of Colombia. So uh, we will build uh, the, the agenda in such a way. Uh, we'll have a 15 minutes presentation, and then we will pick up some questions uh, from uh, from the audience, and uh, maybe I will raise some questions to discuss uh, among the panelists. Uh, so uh, first uh, in our in our agenda is uh, Tomas Golub. So please. Hello to everyone. It's uh, my big honor uh, to uh, uh, to participate in this event, and it's very impressive that the National Bank National Bank of Ukraine is able to organize such a nice event in the terrible circumstances that uh, your country is facing. 
Uh, monetary policy transmission is uh, one of the crucial uh, policy topics uh, in general, but uh, even more so in the current uh, environment of uh, tightening uh, of monetary policy by many central banks, including uh, the Czech National Bank until recently. So I prepared a few slides. Uh, shall I? Uh, shall sorry, uh, Thomas, you, you are muted. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, and, and did you hear me until now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, shall I uh, share my slides on my own or? Uh... Yeah, 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 please. Okay, so I will try to do it. Uh, so can you please see the slide now? Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, so I will start presenting. So I will talk about Czech monetary policy transmission mechanism, some stylized facts and, and the role of forecasting and policy analysis system in uh, analyzing, but also maintaining a good functioning uh, of the transmission process. Uh, the title uh, of uh, the panel is uh, challenges of inflation targeting and uh, with uh, limited monetary policy transmission. Uh, in fact, in the Czech Republic, I believe that uh, the transmission mechanism uh, works uh, reasonably well. Of course, it's not easy to understand uh, all uh, the channels and sub-channels of transmission. Uh, ideally, uh, we would like to have such good understanding, but uh, in the end, uh, when we uh, design our forecasting models, often we uh, have to choose a few of the transmission channels uh, that we model explicitly. Uh, in the case of the Czech National Bank, uh, we actually focus on the exchange rate, uh, transmission channel, interest rate channel, and uh, a very important one is also the expectations channel. Uh, the, the other channels that we usually communicate uh, to the public, such as the, the credit channel or asset price channel, are not present um, explicitly in our core forecasting model, but the model as such is uh, calibrating in a way to implicitly embody also those transmission mechanisms, at least in quiet times. Uh, uh, of course, uh, especially the credit channel, but to some extent the asset price channel may exhibit important uh, non-linearities in crisis times and, and uh, if such things happen, for example, a kind of credit crunch or other financial stability issues, uh, one needs to incorporate those aspects via uh, expert judgments in, in each particular period. Uh, in so much. Your slides are not moving. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move it. So in any case, it provides a kind of uh, bird eye overview, the, the core model of uh, how, how the transmission works. And uh, it's, it's very, uh, has it moved now? Is it okay? No, it's, it's not in, in a full screen mode, so it's not. Um... Oh, I have it in full screen mode, but uh, I will try to. I will try to reshare it once again. So can you now see the slide number three? Yes, but not in a full screen, but we can see the. And if I move, three. if I move it, can you see it? No, it's not moving. Okay, okay. Uh, you need to, sh to share this, the, the screen, which is full, full size. Like, okay, I will, I will try to do it once more. Oh yeah, now it, now it's full screen. Okay. It's full screen, but I cannot, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's moving. Perfect. That's moving. Perfect. Thanks. Sorry for that. Um, so, um, 
In the current uh, circumstances, when we started uh, to move uh, the interest rate upwards uh, in uh, the middle of uh, 2021, uh, people have started to question whether the transmission mechanism works, even the direction. Uh, there have been some people, for example, arguing that by increasing uh, the nominal interest rates, we increase uh, the financing costs of companies, and, and this may uh, increase the inflation further through the cost push component, or uh, there have been some arguments that by uh, hiking the rates, we might actually attract the attention to the inflation problem uh, from the general public and thus increase inflation expectations and ultimately inflation. But uh, the truth is that uh, here, uh, if, if you look at uh, several methods, uh, several models capturing empirically the Czech monetary policy transmission, uh, all the methods, uh, be it simple models like QPM or DSG models like uh, G3+, Plus that we are using as the core model, or even empirically estimated models as the S4, they broadly concur on, they, they all concur on the direction of the impact uh, of uh, interest rate changes uh, that contribute to stronger currency and uh, with a time lag. Uh, of about uh, four to six quarters, uh, also lower inflation. Of course, the uh, the exact magnitudes of the responses differ, so we, we never know uh, the transmission with certainty, but uh, the broad direction in the Czech Republic is, is clear, and uh, we simply need to be patient. It takes time for transmission to uh, feed through the economy, so after we started hiking rates, people complained that inflation is still going up, but we try to explain to the public that uh, we really need to wait at least one year to see a material impact. And we are now approaching the period, so it, it seems that inflation is coming down. Uh, we also try to emphasize that Usually the transmission mechanisms are not cast in stone, but they depend on the source of underlying shocks and also uh, on the behavior of monetary policy itself. So for example, when we introduced uh, our exchange rate commitment between 2013 and 2017, we tried to explain to the people that uh, the exchange rate pass through of such systematic policy may actually be systematically larger than uh, the pass-through that we observe uh, normally for uh, one-off exchange rate shock, which tends to be relatively small in terms of uh, consumer price inflation and relatively uh, dispersed across uh, the subcomponents of consumer basket. On the other hand, people, as well as policymakers, they uh, tend to like rule of thumb uh, estimates. They want to see what happens if the exchange rate moves uh, by 10%, uh, how much uh, uh, inflation in addition or, or less inflation uh, you will get. So uh, we also use our uh, core model to, uh, to model, for example, shocks to the exchange rate and uh, show the impact on the expected trajectories of uh, inflation policy rates and the real economy. So such rule of thumb approaches need to be uh, taken cautiously, but uh, on the other hand, they might be helpful in, in terms of educating people about uh, the functioning of transmission and uh, facilitating public discussions. Uh, the fact that uh, systematic monetary policy is important for transmission can be shown, for example, looking at our past experience with uh, how well uh, we can manage uh, the market interest rate outlook depending on our own forecasting policy paths uh, in our models and also depending on communication. And what we can see is that uh, usually uh, the, uh, the market yield curves tend to move closer to our forecast after the policy meetings, especially on those occasions when uh, the board's communications and decisions are consistent with uh, such a forecast. Uh, on the other hand, the experience also shows that uh, if the board decides to 
detach itself from the forecast, then its ability to anchor market expectations is uh, significantly weaker. Uh, the fact that uh, transmission is functioning and that it's embodied in our core forecasting model in a structural way uh, was used, uh, for example, when the exchange rate uh, uh, commitment was introduced in 2017 and uh, the, uh, the framework, the, the FPAS, helped us to calibrate uh, the policy instrument uh, at uh, the zero lower bound in an effective uh, way. Uh, the fact that it was effective uh, can be seen by comparing the development of core inflation in the Czech Republic and Euro area. Uh, before the policy measure was taken, our, uh, our core uh, inflation was actually uh, slightly negative or close to zero, but it then started to drift, it, drift up, uh, uh, unlike in the Euro area uh, when uh, uh, the, the core inflation remained uh, very low until the recent uh, inflation spike. And, and we can also find uh, some effect uh, of the exchange rate commitment using counterfactual analysis. The effect was positive, not just in terms of core inflation, but also in terms of uh, real economic activity. There, is, there are some doubts about the functioning of transmission, however, related to uh, the recent hiking cycle of the Czech National Bank. We started well ahead of the ECB or US Fed. Uh, the first hike took place already in June 2021. And, and so far, actually, uh, we've seen the Czech uh, inflation accelerating uh, well above uh, that uh, uh, the level of the euro area. So th this has led some people uh, to start questioning the effectiveness transmission, especially given the fact that uh, a relatively large interest rate differential uh, didn't lead to any significant appreciation of Czech Koruna. On the other hand, when we compare the Czech Koruna exchange rate to our regional peers, right, like Polish, Lotte, or Hungarian foreign, we actually see that uh, Koruna uh, managed to uh, develop in a stronger way. And uh, at least it was not making our inflation a problem worse uh, relative to uh, what we observed. At the same time, we also believe that soon our uh, inflation will start turning down uh, at the beginning of next year and our relative comparison to the euro area will look uh, increasingly favorable uh, over time. There is, however, one issue in terms of functioning of the transmission mechanism. Uh, that I uh, need to acknowledge, and it's the fact that uh, the high interest rate differential has uh, stimulated uh, Czech companies to increasingly take uh, loans denominated in euros. Uh, there is a long-term increasing trend of euro-denominated loans, which is uh, related to a kind of natural hedging of uh, manufacturing, exporting companies, and also of companies in the uh, real estate sector that's traditionally quite heavily euroized in the Czech Republic. But recently, the scale of those uh, euro-denominated loans has uh, increased to such an extent that I suspect that uh, some of those loans may be actually taken by unhedged uh, uh, companies with insufficient euro uh, revenues. And, and we all know uh, from the past experience that uh, this could provide uh, challenges both to the functioning of transmission mechanism, but also to uh, it, it may pose risks to financial stability if there is some significant depreciation of the currency in the future. This may lead to perverse effects uh, uh, in terms of balance sheet hits uh, to the corporate sector that may potentially offset or at least partly eliminate the positive effect uh, of weaker currency on uh, real economic activity. And that's all from my side. Uh, I hope I didn't go too much uh, beyond my time schedule and uh, I pass the floor uh, back uh, to uh, Volodymyr. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, 
Yes, we will uh, continue with the presentation of uh, Shalva Mathishvili. Uh, Shalva, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Okay, I think uh, you should be uh, seeing my screen now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to uh, present on this interesting topic. Uh, topic. And uh, before I go, uh, I just uh, want, uh, want to uh, thank you also for uh, organizing this uh, uh, workshop, even uh, when even the, during these uh, difficult times, even in this uh, phase of uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine, and then uh, let me use this opportunity and uh, express uh, support for uh, fight, uh, for this fight uh, for freedom. And uh, with that, so this is the, the this uh, most important part. But uh, let me now turn to economic side, and this is like uh, the the biggest challenge for central banks in uh, in terms of macroeconomic management is. Uh, inflation and uh, one thing that uh, the case of Georgia uh, can tell is uh, that uh, simply using interest rates uh, may not be sufficient for uh, small open partially dollarized economies like Georgia and uh, and like uh, many of us in the region uh, and uh, this is this will be the uh, key message of my presentation today even with this uh, fancy title the message is uh, simple and uh, it's that uh, we need uh, to use uh, several instruments uh, when uh, we have this kind of uh, ch challenge. So before uh, I uh, discuss George's case of how we uh, integrate, how we combine different uh, policy instruments to fight uh, this inflation challenge, uh, let me give you a, a couple of uh, stylized facts uh, which uh, motivate this uh, integration of uh, several instruments. And uh, the, the, uh, the main line here would be uh, going through dollarization, as you will see. Uh, uh, first, uh, I will want to emphasize that even uh, with uh, plain inflation targeting, it's uh, still uh, much more successful in managing inflation. Uh, for example, if you compare inflation targeters uh, relative to non-targeters, you see that inflation uh, challenge on average is uh, smaller like the, the average inflation, absolute deviation of inflation from its previous average is uh, uh, higher than the uh, upper quartile of uh, inflation targeters, which means that inflation targeters have fared better in terms of inflation management. However, and there is uh, this uh, uh, big but, uh, which means that uh, if we take these inflation targeters, uh, uh, this group and look within this group, then we see some heterogeneity within this group. And you will see on the right-hand side uh, that uh, this inflation targeting group, even if it fared better in, in terms of inflation, uh, there's this heterogeneity in terms of uh, dollarization for each country. For countries that had higher loan dollarization, they fared uh, as, as worse as inflation, like non-targeters, non uh, but inflation targeting countries with lower dollarization, they fared much better in terms of managing inflation. And inflation was uh, inflation deviation was uh, smaller on average in these countries. So this uh, underlines this uh, uh, challenge, which is brought by dollarization, and that's uh, the aggravation, the amplification of uh, initial shocks. So, and there are several channels through which uh, this uh, shock can be amplified. The impact on inflation can be amplified through dollarization. And one of the channels is uh, discussed in uh, our uh, one of our working papers. This is an NBG working paper discussing how financial dollarization, loan dollarization in particular, can amplify the impact of exchange rate on inflation. And uh, this, this goes through uh, this uh, debt servicing costs channel, meaning that when there is depreciation, uh, domestic companies even those that uh, have a relatively small share of imported inputs in their production, when they have these loans in foreign currency, they still face these uh, difficulties, these higher costs of debt service, and they feel this pressure to increase prices. Uh, even uh, non-tradable sectors may feel this uh, pressure on prices uh, coming from the exchange rate. 
So this graph shows um, uh, based on our uh, empirical estimates of uh, how much each percentage point of dollarization amplifies exchange rate pass through to inflation. And uh, based on this number, we calculate for some like uh, illustrative levels of dollarization, how much would be exchange rate pass through to inflation for these kind of different uh, levels of dollarization. And as, as you've seen, uh, for countries that have high dollarization, this empirical estimate suggests that the exchange rate pass through is uh, almost uh, twice as large as for our countries with, with low, low dollarization. So this is just one example how this dollarization can uh, uh, amplify inflation shock and uh, make it more difficult for monetary policy to fight uh, this inflation problem. So with this uh, in mind that uh, inflation is usually uh, a bigger challenge in uh, dollarized economies. Uh, so again, this is just stylized facts. Uh, uh, we need uh, some structural model to talk about the causality, uh, which we do have in, in our monetary policy, uh, in our uh, uh, paper. Uh, but still, uh, what this suggests is that uh, for those countries that have higher inflation, they usually have to respond with monetary policy more strongly. And that's also one of the stylized facts. We do see if you uh, take this uh, data uh, and compare how much monetary policy rate has changed in countries that have uh, high dollarization versus low dollarization, you see that uh, the former responded twice as strongly as, as the latter, uh, which means that uh, dollarized countries had to increase monetary policy rates much more strongly than non -dollar, uh, like low, low dollar, uh, dollarization countries. So of course, uh, this is a reaction, standard reaction to inflation challenge. If inflation is high in these kind of countries, monetary policy rate should also be high in these countries. But uh, this uh, brings some uh, side effects and that's uh, what I want to focus on, uh, which is that for countries that have high loan dollarization to begin with, high domestic currency interest rates may incentivize even more uh, foreign exchange credit. So this is a side effect of monetary policy tightening, uh, which is similar to hot money inflows in, in some countries, but in case of uh, uh, dollarized countries, this takes the form of uh, foreign exchange credit extended even by domestic banks. So this is a, a challenge which uh, can uh, incentivize central banks to use other instruments. And uh, this is something that we do see. Uh, and uh, let me show this uh, additional uh, stylized fact, which is that countries that had a uh, higher loan dollarization, they usually resorted to, uh, tended to resort more to these additional macroprudential instruments. So this is data uh, from IMF, this is database of macroprudential measures. And as you see, uh, well, one thing is that uh, we saw some uh, relative increase in the usage of macroprudential instruments over the years. But if you look uh, within uh, these uh, countries and uh, compare low dollarization versus high dollarization case, there you see that high dollarization countries use macroprudential relatively more frequently than uh, low dollarization countries, which makes sense, uh, like I said, uh, because uh, high dollarization involves uh, more difficult trade-offs. And uh, almost by definition, when we face trade-offs, if we want to achieve uh, uh, several targets, uh, if we want to uh, minimize the impact on several variables, we need several instruments. That's the Tinbergen principle. So with this uh, in mind and uh, essentially forced by the current circumstances, the uh, NBG had to use some other instruments. And th let me summarize quickly what these instruments were. For example, when we increased monetary policy rate, uh, which is now at an all time high level to fight inflation, we saw some acceleration of uh, foreign exchange uh, credit, especially foreign exchange uh, mortgages and, and business credit. And uh, because uh, increasing monetary policy rate even further would not tame this FX credit, we had to use uh, instruments like uh, prudential uh, constraints on the maturity of FX loans, which is essentially tightening uh, payment to income ratio, for example. Uh, which is uh, one of the standard uh, macroprudential instruments uh, nowadays. We also uh, like abolished uh, the so remuneration of uh, foreign exchange reserves, the uh, FX required reserves of commercial banks. And now we don't remunerate this uh, required FX reserves. And uh, this helped us in, in two ways. One is that uh, this uh, moderated uh, FX uh, credit uh, because uh, now banks see higher cost of intermediating in a foreign exchange. 
and therefore they charge higher interest rates on a fixed uh, credit. And this uh, was essentially uh, similar to monetary policy tightening, but in the fixed uh, side. And on the other hand, it also helped us to deal with this uh, Fed tightening cycle uh, a bit more. Uh, and let me explain uh, quickly what I mean. Uh, during previous uh, Fed tightening cycles, what we saw was uh, foreign currency deposit interest rates in uh, domestic in resident banks increased and people, domestic residents even had more incentive to switch from domestic currency deposits to foreign currency deposits. And this somehow accelerated, uh, uh, amplified the impact on the exchange rate. And uh, we, uh, with this uh, fixing remuneration of FX reserves at zero, we essentially uh, incentivized banks to maintain a relatively low interest rate on foreign, uh, foreign currency deposits. And through this channel, particularly, we essentially don't see much of uh, exchange rate pressures uh, at this moment. So therefore, this is uh, this uh, remuneration uh, instrument essentially served two purposes, moderating a fixed credit and uh, moderating the impact on the exchange rate from Fed tightening. Then uh, we also used another instrument uh, because uh, uh, transmission of monetary policy rate to uh, some of loans and especially consumer loans is relatively weak. Uh, this is something we see uh, in, in our data. Uh, and uh, if we still decided to continue to fight these consumer loans with policy rate, we would have to increase it uh, too aggressively, which may have uh, created some financial difficulties for, uh, for, uh, for, more, for example, uh, mortgage uh, uh, for borrowers uh, uh, that borrowed in, in long term uh, with long term contracts. So because of this, uh, uh, this trade off, uh, we decided to use another macro financial instrument, which is uh, again, uh, uh, expressed in terms of maturity of uh, consumer loans. Again, this is uh, equivalent to tightening uh, payment to income ratios for uh, consumers, lo consumer loans specifically. And uh, this uh, had uh, its in intended Im impact. Uh, less uh, households are now taking consumer loans and we face less impact on uh, inflation from this side. So this is another measure that uh, helped, uh, that uh, tried to help this uh, weakness in monetary policy transmission that we have. And finally, we see some uh, short-term uh, foreign exchange inflows. Uh, and uh, this uh, means that exchange rate is relatively strong now, uh, but uh, we see that uh, this may create some future depreciation risks. And therefore we may want to avoid this uh, overvaluation. However, fighting overvaluation with a uh, policy rate would mean reducing policy rates, which in the current environment uh, would be uh, would not be prudent uh, because domestic demand is already strong enough and is already uh, slowing this uh, inflation, uh, disinflation uh, process. So that's why uh, another, still another instrument, which is in the form of FX interventions, may also be useful to avoid this overvaluation. And that's uh, what the NBG is trying to do by uh, buying foreign exchange. Uh, now, let me give you some quickly some numbers uh, and what the effect of those instruments were. As you've seen, uh, when we started monetary policy tightening, FX uh, credit has actually accelerated uh, and consumer loans have accelerated. On this slide, slide, we have these consumer loans. And after we decided to use this prudential instrument to use this instrument to help this weakness in monetary policy transmission, we see that consumer loans now have started to decelerate. So the same picture is in the in case of uh, uh, credit activity by currencies. As you see, even when we were uh, tightening policy, which we started in uh, early 2021, along with tightening in monetary policy rate, we saw acceleration in FX credit. And once we decided to use additional macro prudential instruments, now FX credit is uh, declining again. And that's contributing to a decline in overall credit activity. So this is important for us because uh, what we want to achieve is moderate credit activity because that's essentially the key channel through which we can moderate inflation pressures because uh, central bank instruments are essentially demand side instruments uh, going through uh, credit. So of course, uh, this, uh, this is just uh, one example, uh, but uh, I think it's important example to emphasize the importance of using additional instruments uh, in, in countries like Georgia, when we face some weaknesses in monetary policy transmission on like high interest rate loans and foreign exchange loans. And we use this in a counter cyclical manner, essentially, 
But uh, those instruments may also be seen from a more structural perspective. And let me just simply quickly go through this slide and uh, we can uh, uh, spend more time if there will be more questions. So this is uh, instruments that we have used over the years to reduce uh, dollarization. We started the uh, de-dollarization agenda in 2010 and uh, we accelerated it uh, in 2017. And uh, there, as you will see, are some of the instruments like FX reserve requirements and uh, PTI limits uh, for foreign exchange credit, uh, which was uh, there before, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that we essentially try to use these instruments in a bit more counter cyclical manner this year, which was uh, dictated by the so inflation uh, challenge that we faced this year. So this is uh, all I wanted to emphasize uh, quickly, and I, I look forward to the, the discussion and the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we are moving to the uh, third presentation. Uh, Jaime, please. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, I want to thank the invitation to participate in this uh, panel. And I want to congratulate you uh, for being able to do it in the, in the midst of this barrage of attacks by. I'm sorry, we, we, we could, uh, it's something wrong with the mic, I think. We could barely hear you. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can increase the volume on this side. And by the way, I, I don't have any uh, share video, uh, share screen button in my uh, system. So I don't know if you guys can share it over there. Can you hear me? Hey, yes, but. Uh... I don't. I don't have a shared uh, screen. Um... Maybe you could uh, send me your presentation, and I. I could share it. I'll be so. Anyway, let me start uh, by, by um, let's see if I, if I put my screen on, uh, if it works. I was saying thank you very much for the invitation and, and I'm deeply honored to be with you. Uh, I have a special spot for Ukraine. Uh, it's involved in several uh, phases of your initial stages of the independent country in the end of the last century. And um, I have some to be back. Very happy to do so. Um, let me um, start by saying that uh, the presumption of economics is, is that um, you increase interest rate and somehow a miracle occurs and then the inflation rate drops. Uh, that is kind of the core, at uh, the core of, of inflation driving models and so on. And what I want to do is I want to, to um, notice uh, three very important points that have to do with this. Uh, the first point is that uh, inflation targeting has been very successful in delivering high stability in, in many countries. So it is an effective tool. Um, the second point is that transmission mechanisms of, of inflation are very complex. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, it's not a single channel, there are several channels. 
And then a third point I want to make is that the nation has the same time frame. And, and because they are institutional, uh, they may take time in structural, they may take time to, to uh, advance. Can we work presentation? I think this is a very old joke. Um, maybe those from my generation remember this cartoon where um, a teacher is uh, taking a look at a problem solved by the students. And then the guy has a set that says Denimarco recruits, which is why I'm going to say the And then you have the word that answer. And then I think we should be more specific about the subject. So can we advance, please? Can we advance? Okay. Advance. Advance. So these are the three points that I'm making. I was making, and let's go to the next slide. Uh, and let's look at the success in basic targeting. Next. This is quote. When we started in patient targeting in the year 2000. And we have in orange the inflation rate, the 12 month inflation rate, and then we've got the target in the blue line. And as you can see from the beginning, so we have inflation rate about 10 percent. The board gradually reduced the target all the way down to three percent way back in 2010, and then we cut the fair since about that. Anchor has helped the economy to go through several crises. There are two that are, are, are successful. One is the gold financial crisis in 2008 2009, uh, where we were hit by the capital outflows, and it was a very hard moment. Um, inflation targeting was effective in bringing that down. In 2016 17, we had another issue, which was the drop in oil prices globally. So that took us into a very difficult situation. Then we have the period of disinflation in time of COVID. And now we have this uh, resurgence of inflation to levels that we have not seen for many years. And the response of the board has been to increase the rate by eight and a half percentage points. Uh, nonetheless, that has not been enough to stop the increase. What are the shocks? One, we have the supply shocks of the pandemic, uh, the shipping, our containers, uh, devices. So the second was the full invasion of uh, the Russian and Ukraine. Why? Because uh, we import food from Ukraine and we import fertilizer from Ukraine. So we have been hit by that. And the third thing that did us was uh, civil unrest last year was used by the labor unions to block some of the bills, and that clearly had a huge impact on food prices. Uh, but we hope that if we continue the strong policy, uh, that they will fall down as it did in the previous quarter. Next slide, please. Now, this is a chart from the app. I want to make this because it shows you the complexity of what is root out there and how difficult it is to extract food from fish and Next, please. What I want to do is kind of simplify this into first, the expectation channel, second, the asset prices uh, channel, which is a well protecting the economy. Then we have the credit which is the cash flow of the economy. Then we have investment consumption and the earnings here are talking about um, the inevitable decisions that agents make, thinking of, well, if the interest rate is going up, I like to support investment or consumption. So it's, it's an individual thing. And then we have this impact on the exchange rate, where in reality, if you increase the interest rate, uh, you change your deal to you and did. And all these things have to impact by producing economic activity, and that is what brings inflation down. So the miracle thing that no 
total is quite quite thick. Uh, let's take a look at some of the points. Is it is uninterested expectations and investment consumption? Uh, expectations because you will have uh, a really regular chink group. Uh, talking about that, I think that's the maximum on the topic. Uh, in investment consumption, because as you will see further down the line, uh, that kind of sounds like. Next, please. So, the research part of this, this is something that I want to really stress is we need to kind of have this fantastic ability to assume things and precondition. And it turns out that life is more difficult than that. And you, you always assume that the market are there and the institutions are there to make all these things, all these transmission channels work. And maybe in many times it doesn't. It's not the case. And let me give you examples. You assume in markets, you assume that there's going to be pipeline markets. You assume that there's a capital market where it's public and that it's going to be about trading. You assume that there's a foreign chain market. Uh, you assume that there are some institutions, like the central bank that is independent, that can set its own policies. Like the complaint system that's really competitive, that they're competing on one side. And then you have the presence of institutional investors, which makes a huge difference in asset markets. So I want to answer this now after listening to Thomas and my colleague from Georgia, um, that having a currency that is foreign is also key to this. That is an institution. And, you know, we don't deal with our institution. Our currency is the only means of paying for legal tender. And banks are not allowed to have deposits on any currency. Uh, people can any loans from abroad, yes, they can, but they're loans. They're prudential and it's not. So, so those are some things that we always have to recognize. Next, please. Let's look at the asset markets. Uh, just for information, there are two major financial uh, asset markets in Colombia. One is uh, the products, bonds, and bonds. It's very small, relatively. Three or four percent of GDP. And then we have the tense one. The tense is, is uh, short for the short of it, which are the bond futures bank development. That is a market that is about 38% of GDP, where foreign investors participate. So 26% of what this is about this, which is kind of important. Uh, there's a market for the peso tests, and there's a market for the UVR tests. UVR is an index value. So that, by the way, is the difference between those two rates being a relatively safe asset versus a very good measure of risk and inflation. Uh, and then the other thing that's in there is the difference material. So let's take a look at what happens out of the Next. This is the, the asset markets, uh, the stock exchange. And what I did here, and, and I'm going to this exercise throughout my presentation, is index the variables so that December 2017 is 100. So you can see roughly uh, some kind of a relationship that is comparable, and it's not just sort of red, red boxes or matrices or whatnot. So this is this is an index thing. Next, please. And the next thing that I do is I take the first step to see if there's a, an impact there, if there's a response in there. And what I can see here is that uh, indeed, when the interest rate has gone up, especially in the recent period, uh, core cap has dropped, which is the index of, of, uh, of the stocks. So, in a way, next please, we could argue that this more or less works. I'm not going to say it works. No, nope. it's three or four percent of GDP. The response is not that clear, but let's uh, move to the next one, please. Next. This is the test market. Uh, in here, what I took was the interest rates uh, of this old test. And 
I could have inverted this and take the price that I thought I would pay for it and take things to the short like that. You can see the market moving. You can see a bump in the middle of 2021. What happened there? Lots of investment grade which were the major movement. So that was an issue. That implied a severe increase in the funding cost to the government. That's this. If I take those differences here, the ratio is very clear. It's very, very, very clear that, that, that as we increase rates, they were compromised. Um, the, there's a response out there in the active part. Next. So I'm going to give this a quick check. check uh, next, please. This is a credit mark. Uh, here, what I'm looking at are the, the current households. Uh, credit is indebted. That's been seen in the situation. Credit for households constitutes more than credit for firms, which doesn't speak well about our development uh, or future development. Let's put it that way. Uh, in here, the first impression you get is okay, these guys are increasing the interest rate and nothing is happening in the, in the credit line. Next. And indeed, after enough, you, you have all these movements in the rate and there's kind of no response in the credit market. No movement as uh, why is this the case? Well, because we have kind of mutualistic uh, banking system. And because we have all these questions. Uh, Transmission of the interest rates that the central bank sets into an interest rate that's positive to see the interest rates that uh, loan users receive, not their interest rate. And that is what has the system. Next. So this is a block. This is not a credit rate. A transmission is higher for Colombia. Uh, it's really not a problem. Policy population here is something here. Uh, Arab Central invested 15 trillion dollars, which means that when the line is going up, uh, the currency is decreasing. And if I look at the big differences, next please, uh, you see that positive correlation there. However, there's, there's two things in this period that are, are very, very important um, and that, that make this difficult. Um, that huge question as to whether we should expect a, a more definite response on the issue. One is the situation in the US dollar. We are part of the US dollar is kind of an area of influence. This is an issue on. And from that, the meeting in Cleveland to place by the Fed and in the US markets. Has a big impact here. Uh, it depreciates the current rate, which means more than the price. The second thing that happened is that we went to, we are in a political transition. The political transition stood out how it is here. And when people are not happy and nervous, uh, the currency tends to depreciate. So, next, what I would point out on this particular case is I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, if this is a type of transition channel in Colombia. It doesn't mean much, but it's, it's, it's kind of worrying. Uh, notice, in addition to that, that as the currency has appreciated, that has made life much more difficult in terms of our inflation. One thought is that it can be if possible, sure. Um, this question as to whether inflation matter for real growth. Um, and this is this kind of thought of the profile the rates of growth in the last 10 years, quarter by quarter. Uh, you see the three second quarters of the pandemic on the left, those are outliers. You see the inbound that came after the pandemic, those are also outliers. But the typical Columbia thing is that as inflation declines, uh, it's not that it causes growth, but it fosters growth. 
the first thing to us is matter. And this is a message that I have to you. It's not only is a patient by your team affected, uh, even if we're having a tough time today, it is also the case that it helps the economy grow better in the future. Next. So this is our, my final point is that IT has been very successful in delaying flexibility. Uh, and my point that mechanisms are imperfect and take time to get very specific. This is one of the questions that uh, Akitu is uh, posing to us as to whether we could do something about it. Um, I think this is a point for everyone in the world, uh, especially for the Ukraine, given what is going on with the Russians. And I, I just uh, call on you to keep up the good work and to keep pushing forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jaime. So uh, we are moving to Q&A session. So uh, I will uh, take questions from uh, audience. Um, if, if you have any questions, please uh, press the Q&A button and type them. In Q and A uh, chapter, so uh, we have uh, so far one question uh, to Tomas. Uh, so it's about main drivers of inflation in Czech Republic and Ukraine. Is it fully driven driven by only cost push factors, or there is some? Uh, some uh, demand pull factors from previous fiscal dominance and pandemic. And also a question uh, to Thomas about, uh, is it okay that your real interest rate uh, in terms of current inflation and the one year expected inflation in the negative zone, or you're looking on longer period? Yeah. So yeah, Tom, thank, yeah, yeah. Thank you for, very much for for these questions, which are of course uh, extremely relevant as regards the sources of inflation. I, I of course cannot uh, make a comparison to Ukraine because I don't know your situation well. But in the Czech Republic, it's definitely a mix of cost push and demand pull factors. Uh, we have uh, several analysts confirming this. Uh, of course, on the cost push side. Uh, it's uh, related to the global supply uh, and uh, value chain bottlenecks that uh, arose uh, once the COVID restrictions were lifted. Uh, the spike in energy prices, mainly uh, electricity and natural gas, which is of course uh, since February uh, this year related to Russian uh, invasion to Ukraine and also uh, the increase in global food prices, also partly related to the war and uh, the difficulties that Ukraine is facing with supplying the, the global uh, food market. But on the other hand, we also went into the pandemic with uh, a very tight labor market and some overheating in the economy. Uh, we were at that time trying to address uh, uh, this overheating by hiking nominal interest rates. But then the pandemic came and there was a synchronized easing of both monetary and fiscal policies to avoid a complete meltdown of the economic system as a result of the lockdown. But once the economy reopened, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the aggregate demand simply revived faster than the supply of the economy and, and we are facing pressures uh, from the situation towards higher prices. That's why we also have uh, one of the highest core inflation rates uh, in, in the EU. So we, we really started uh, to feel the need to, to address uh, the situation by hiking the rates. We started already in June 2021, and, and then we started to go in largest steps. And currently, the main policy rate stands at uh, 7%. And yeah, uh, related to the second part of the question, relative to 15% year-on-year inflation, this is, an, uh, this is a significantly negative uh, 
real interest rate if you look at it uh, from the exposed view, but we, we tend to focus on the real rates in ex ante terms. So uh, how the current nominal uh, interest rate compares to uh, expected uh, inflation one year ahead. And we believe that one year ahead, which means in the autumn 2023, we'll, we will be safely back in single digit inflation rates. Uh, and um, uh, it, from that point of view, uh, the real rate is either close to zero or slightly positive. However, it all depends on uh, inflation expectations, whether this uh, projected disinflation pass is also credible for, for the general public. And we have some signals suggesting that inflation expectations might have become a bit uh, unanchored. Personally, I'm concerned about this and I would personally prefer some further interest rate hikes uh, to address this risk of the anchored inflation expectations. Uh, and to also send a clear signal that uh, we behave in a kind of systematic way uh, by, by continuing to hike the interest rates to, to address the, the inflation risk. So we are, uh, most of my colleagues at the board believe that the current uh, interest rate level is already sufficient to tame the, the demand pool inflation pressures uh, I'm a bit concerned that uh, the current uh, interest rate is enough to bring us safely back to uh, single digit inflation numbers, but may not be yet enough to go uh, the full way to uh, the 2% inflation target. I hope this answers the question. That's actually a very good uh, point in terms of uh, whether policy rates are uh, negative or positive uh, depending on uh, on what uh, expectations measure measurement of expectations you are relying on and uh, i actually want uh, to ask other panelists uh, to to extend a bit on 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 this issue uh, whether you think that uh, current monetary policy stance um, uh, in your case uh, is okay in terms of uh, bringing inflation to target, or uh, there are risks that it's not enough, and you at some at some point in time you uh, need to go uh, sufficiently uh, uh, high in, in in terms of real key policy rate. Okay, let let me uh, jump on that. So. In our case, uh, just to give you the uh, basic facts, uh, inflation uh, currently, uh, annual inflation is uh, about 10.5, uh, 10.6, and uh, our policy rate is uh, 11%. So uh, even with the current inflation, real rate uh, is uh, still slightly positive. If we look uh, through the uh, expected inflation links, uh, which is like ex ante real interest rate, uh, this is uh, even higher. So we think that uh, currently we have a sufficiently high real interest rate, uh, but this is uh, based on the assumption that our baseline forecast, which is inflation continuing to decelerate is correct. But there is a big risk. There is a big question mark uh, there, uh, whether we will see continued decline in inflation, uh, which so far we uh, saw very little. We had 13.9% uh, inflation in the peak, and now it's 10.6%. Uh, so we do have some deceleration, but it's uh, not enough. And uh, like Thomas uh, said, uh, we think that this will be sufficient to generate some decline in inflation going forward, but whether it's sufficient to bring it all the way down to the target, uh, that's a big question mark. And uh, I think uh, we would uh, have to either maintain this tight policy for longer, which as I mentioned, is already all time high. Uh, policy rate is at an all time high or uh, we may have to even tighten more, uh, whether through policy rate or through some additional instruments, uh, uh, some, some instruments that I mentioned uh, uh, in my presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Feel that the, um, that the uh, the speed of which the inflation rate is dropping 
uh, physical view. Uh, and then we're going to stay in a plateau for some, some time until we go back close to, to the target of Jesus. Uh, but we're fine. We're right now at 12.2. Um, it's a fairly high rate of inflation. Uh, it is actually very big component of supply shocks. Uh, but not that I say, you know, we have a fiscal deficit of 6% of GDP. There is a demand issue. The big drama, though, is that the increased interest rate in the central bank is it doesn't get back how to spend. So we will have a fiscal debt complaining about that. What we will end up doing, unfortunately, is squeezing the credit center. Um, but you know, we play with the cards you get from the game. And what I'm glad is a very balanced fiscal And we have a very high inflation. So we, we have to keep up uh, increasing. Okay, thank you. So we have a question in the chat uh, from Matthias Meyer uh, to Thomas Holub. Uh, Czechia and Slovakia have the similar inflation trajectories, but uh, dif differ strongly in policy rates. Has the ex ex this experience changed the uh, Czech view on uh, potential future adoption of the euro? Well, uh, again, good question. I think it hasn't changed the, the general mood in the Czech society, which is the relatively skeptical towards Euro adoption. But uh, traditional uh, proponents uh, of Euro adoption, they take the current developments as a kind of sign that uh, monetary policy, after all, doesn't matter that much and that we could uh, live well also in the euro area under the more expansionary monetary policy uh, pursued by the ECB. I would be a bit cautious in making uh, very direct and straightforward comparisons of uh, inflation developments in individual countries because it depends very much on uh, policies taken by the governments to address uh, the spike in energy prices and also on uh, the structure of energy market. So my understanding is that in Slovakia, there has so far been no major increase of electricity prices for retail consumers, but it's coming in January next year. And, and from that, uh, therefore, next year, uh, people uh, or uh, the National Bank of Slovakia expects uh, inflation to run at 20% or even more, while in the Czech Republic, we will hopefully already be on a declining path towards single digit uh, inflation rates. And once uh, people see it, I think even the proponents of Euro adoption will once again lose this uh, argument in, in favor of adoption. And in any case, there is no official plan to adopt Euro anytime soon. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have a question in Q and A. It's about the increase in policy rate increases uh, have induced expansion of uh, FX credit. Uh, is this related more to inflation expectations problem? Given the monetary policy is all about the short uh, end of the curve, and given that the Fed is also tightening policy. So please, I think we will start with uh, Shalva. Shalva. Don't you mind? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question. That's really uh, important question. So what's behind this acceleration in a fixed credit? And I think uh, two key factors, um, which may be one factor after all, is uh, increases in domestic currency interest rates. So when we increased monetary policy rate, even though that's the very uh, short end of the yield curve, uh, we did see some increases in the long-term interest rates, including on mortgage interest rates and on business, business loans in, in uh, domestic currency. And when we have high interest rates, uh, this means that domestic currency is uh, more expensive. And also the, uh, the private sector usually, in this case, uh, fears uh, FX depreciation less. So in theory, in, in uh, you uncovered interest parity theory, we know that when interest rate increases domestically, then we have uh, so much appreciation on impact, then in the future, we expect some depreciation. But in, in practice, we see that when interest rate in domestic currency is high, we see some, at least in, in the short term, we see some uh, moderate uh, appreciation going on for, for a couple of uh, periods. 
And in this kind of environment, when domestic currency interest rate is high and you fear exchange rate depreciation less, then you are all the more inclined to take out foreign exchange credit. And I think this kind of uh, exchange rate uh, depreciation uh, fears subsiding uh, somewhat uh, against these high interest rates. It kind of uh, or incentivized uh, especially businesses uh, domestically to uh, borrow in, in foreign uh, currency. Uh, in terms of how this uh, links to the Fed decisions, uh, the Fed in this sense is uh, helping to moderate credit activity domestically even uh, by uh, increasing foreign currency credit interest rates and also uh, reminding businesses that uh, the dollar is, is also possible to appreciate, which means that exchange rate depreciation risk is something they have to take into account. They do not have to dismiss this. And, these high interest rates from the Fed and therefore high interest rates on FX credit domestically and this exchange rate risk still popping up again, uh, then this kind of uh, actually helped to moderate FX credit uh, in, in Georgia as well. Thank you. So, Tomas, maybe you want to add something? Um, yeah, well, I think the explanation is quite similar to Shalva's. Uh, the interest rate differential between credit and Czech korunas and credit in euros has gone up to five percentage points, which is a significant incentive for companies to resort to euro denominated loans, especially if they don't fear uh, exchange rate depreciation. It is true that uh, recently the exchange rate of Czech koruna against the euro has been very stable with the help of uh, foreign exchange interventions by the Czech National Bank. Uh, we, don't want, uh, uh, we don't want to allow uh, Czech Koruna to depreciate significantly because it would be adding to the inflation problem. So we are currently using uh, foreign exchange intervention as a kind of supplementary tool of our monetary policy. Uh, my concern is that this may create the impression of too much exchange rate certainty for the companies that they may simply underestimate uh, the exchange rate risk going forward. We haven't made any public promise to continue intervening uh, in the FX market for a long period of time. This is certainly not a kind of new exchange rate commitment with a reversed sign. So I can imagine bad scenarios that would lead to depreciation of currency and, and then the unhatched companies uh, would suffer financial losses uh, that could outweigh the interest rate differential that uh, they want to uh, benefit from. So uh, we, we tried to uh, really have uh, more intense discussions with commercial banks uh, through our uh, bank supervision department uh, to make sure that uh, if uh, foreign exchange credit is granted, it goes mainly to companies with uh, euro denominated revenues. In that case, it's safe and it can be even considered a kind of natural hedge. We, we however, want to discourage uh, euro denominated borrowing by uh, companies that don't have sufficient uh, foreign currency revenues. I see. Thank you. So Jaime, maybe you have something to add on, on, on this question or it's not relevant for, for your case? For me, when I started the presentation, I talked about these assumptions that we make on economics. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm listening to Thomas and, and I hear that they, they can push a lot of the exchanges. Uh, we have a policy of fully frozen exchanges in Columbia. Uh, so whatever the market has, that uh, the bank coming into the unit, then we consider that we need to increase or decrease the level of foreign reserves. Uh, our foreign reserve level right now is classical. Uh, it's a level that surpasses the the metrics that the IMF uses. Um, we have a little more exchanges than traditional there, um, but we don't need to be in that time. So that, by the way, makes a big difference in terms of uh, getting this inflation. Because we have throughout this that the, the increase in credit accounts, um, the, um, that has an impact on the 
all these questions, consumer questions. And he brought into the attention of uh, uh, the Lord, uh, uh, just like uh, the Czech Republic, they tend to, to, to use uh, a more graduated path to the research. We decided against that many years ago. Uh, same thing that the independence of the Montreal Court is meant to be offices, which means not having to deal with the sterilization of the stuff that goes on in the tree in the whole uh, But this is one of those things where, again, we're very good at making assumptions based on the truth. Thank you. So we don't have uh, more questions from audience. So I want to to bring some questions which uh, Professor Kaziuk proposed to discuss in advance. Uh, uh, so I, I uh, the first one is uh, what is the nature of uh, driving for, for driving forces that uh, hit transmission the most. Uh, whether they are structural or cyclical, uh, so I I I think it's uh, there are some general uh, factors uh, common for many economies, but maybe there are some specific ones. So I will ask the panel panelists to uh, to exp expand a bit on 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 the issue. So. I think we'll start start with with Jaime. Jaime, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's an interesting point. And, and when I saw you know, Victor's question, uh, I thought that you know, pretty much and I um, the plant that I had on the assumptions uh, has to do with two things: the structural factors, and that is a very good task. I mean, what is the point of having? Uh, an asset market channel, if asset price is set, you don't have asset prices. It really doesn't. Uh, what happens to add some credit? If you have a distorted credit market because of a lack of competition in the system, then you have an issue because that instrument, that channel, is just not there. So, in a way, our policy is an asset price based because we face that are those two pieces not? I think uh, there's always scope to work on these two things and, and develop our system, develop these two. Uh, I, I think uh, what Georgia is doing with microcontextual structures is a very good example of how you can actually get your hands into the market and try to improve the efficiency of your monitoring system. But certainly, absence of uh, institutions and collectors, it is very difficult to have those forces in place. Uh, we all have to remember that this is a theory that has developed mostly uh, in the US, in the UK, uh, and here, uh, all of which have a level of institutional development that is far greater than ours. And from that point of view, we cannot assume that this is a very forward happening in terms of uh, efficiency. Uh, now that said, yes, there, there are uh, things that happen out there that are shocking. Uh, like I was saying to you on the exchange group, uh, with the pesticides to change the long standing policy of these mines, then it becomes tighter and increases interest rates by a lot. And that makes whatever we've done on the interest rate uh, worse than us. So that hits us on the form change test, on the exchange rate test. But it has um, the support to realize that even though the structural institutional things are very, very important, there are other things to go out that can create a lot of things. Thank you. So maybe we continue with uh, Shalva. Yes, uh, thanks. 
So I think uh, there are uh, some some structural factors that may uh, hinder monetary policy transmission. Uh, one is something I uh, talked about, uh, which is uh, this uh, loan dollarization. Uh, this high loan dollarization essentially complicates uh, monetary policy making and uh, makes it difficult to manage uh, aggregate demand. And that's uh, one key hindrance to uh, monetary policy transmission. And uh, there are some other uh, potential problems uh, in monetary policy transmission, uh, which may be uh, dealt with a uh, monetary policy operations uh, framework, the respective framework. And uh, two most important uh, factors, I think, uh, is uh, dealing with uh, liquidity risks and uh, dealing with uh, interest rate risk. This is something we uh, have done uh, over the years uh, when we switched to inflation targeting. Uh, one was uh, dealing with interest rate risk, uh, essentially through uh, interest rate targeting framework, meaning that providing as much liquidity as is uh, demand for uh, liquidity from the uh, commercial banks for, from a financial system. And this essentially stabilized the uh, interest short end of the yield curve. And we also tried to communicate uh, uh, our intentions about uh, future interest rates. Uh, this is what we call uh, conventional forward guidance, publishing monetary policy rate and uh, uh, discussing different uh, scenarios under which uh, how central bank would uh, react to these uh, shocks. And this kind of uh, communicating reaction function and uh, making it uh, uh, easy to anticipate uh, for the private sector what interest rate may be in uh, some scenarios, what they, whatever they expect. This essentially reduces a uh, longer term part of the interest rate risk. And this also helped to uh, moderate this yield curve and make it uh, easier to manage uh, the whole yield curve, the longer term rates with a short policy, short term policy rate. The other part was liquidity. Uh, side, uh, which is uh, already, I already mentioned, but I just want to uh, give uh, one example, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, something uh, happened in 2015 in Georgia, which emphasized the importance of minimizing liquidity risk in terms of managing the economy. And this was uh, when we saw big depreciation pressures in uh, uh, domestic currency. And uh, there, there was some political pressure, some uh, uh, external experts discussing uh, the reasons behind this depreciation and uh, some of the uh, ideas that floated was that maybe central bank providing liquidity is depreciating the currency and there was this pressure to essentially curb uh, liquidity provision and uh, the, the result was uh, liquidity risk uh, shot up uh, longer term interest rates on government bonds increased uh, like uh, almost a six percentage point and uh, this was a big cost for the uh, government budget, essentially. And uh, since then, uh, the central bank tried to with, uh, withstand this uh, pressure and we pro continue to provide liquidity as much as uh, banks uh, needed to maintain uh, money market interest rates close to the policy rate. And after this, uh, some kind of a test or uh, showing the commitment to this uh, liquidity provision, then we saw that liquidity risk has declined Longer term interest rates are, are now much closer to policy rate. And since then the yield curve uh, more or less uh, reacts uh, 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 in a predictable way to monetary policy uh, stance changes. Uh, when we increased the uh, policy rate uh, this year, as well as last year, then uh, like I said, long term interest rates uh, gradually increased as well and uh, helped us in moderating the domestic side, at least the domestic side of credit activity. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, that's very similar to situation with, that we had in the past, like uh, with all the speculations, the central bank provides liquidity and all this liquidity is, is going to affect market and uh, you need to stop to doing this. Like, yeah, so say, say, same communication challenge. Uh, uh, Tomas, could you add please something on, on, on these factors? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in general, we don't have too many like issues with the functioning of the the transmission mechanism. Even the the euroization of uh, corporate loans, it's not such a big issue so far. But I I would say that it's the the main one at the moment, and it has both a structural component. There is a long term increasing share of uh, foreign currency loans by the corporate sector associated with 
growing openness of uh, Czech uh, companies and uh, uh, their export uh, focus. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a cyclical uh, cyclical component. So I think the current uh, sharp increase in euro denominated loans it's really related to uh, the cyclical increase in interest rate differential. And it will probably start to reverse now as uh, both the ECB and Fed uh, continue hiking quite fast while uh, we are on hold. Uh, the interest rate differential has already started to narrow and, and I think it will provide less incentive uh, for companies going forward uh, to take euro denominated loans. So, so the issue will partly reverse back to the long term trend. Uh, then speaking about inflation developments, I think the, the main structural issue for us will be the deglobalization of uh, the, the economy, the global economy after the COVID uh, and now the war. Uh, uh, the, the whole world was experiencing low inflation pressure previously related to increasing globalization and it's now partly reversing and and I think we will need to maintain a bit more restrictive monetary policy in the future than uh, what was the case in the previous decade, simply because of these structural pressures on higher inflation. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we are approaching to the end of, of this session. Uh, I, 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 I will be really grateful to, to, to the participants uh to their presentations for the discussion and for uh, their support so thank you thank you thank you very much bye bye and slava ukraine bye slava um to proceed uh, paolo uh, will uh, discuss uh, some results of recently uh launched paper at time on uh, discussing the return of fiscal policy all screens yours Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Perfect. Let me then uh, share the screen. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I share. Joan uh, wishes that uh, the, the war ends soon and uh, we have a swift return to peace, which will be good for Ukraine, but for the world in general. So my presentation is going to focus more on thinking about uh, fiscal frameworks and how we have been learning from the last years and decades and uh, with the um, uh, now put a bit more of the focus on how we think fiscal frameworks need to reflect more the interactions with monetary policy, which has been something uh, has become more pressing in, in recent years. So the world has been hit by a succession of shocks, as John already mentioned, including the pandemic, with implications for people's lives and livelihoods. Uh, in order to respond to this crisis, countries have adopted uh, very large fiscal measures, uh, supportive measures, and that implied that many countries suspended their fiscal rules, or their uh, rule-based frameworks, and more than 100 countries in the world are, have rules, so this is really um, very significant. Uh, as we exit the pandemic, uh, and debts have, have risen significantly, uh, many countries are now a return, a return to fiscal rules, and this is an opportunity to review the lessons uh, from recent years and, try, and how we can improve fiscal frameworks more generally. And one, one key aspect, again, that you already mentioned is that we are in a really a difficult, a world of difficult policy trade-offs and uh, the interactions and consistency of fiscal, monetary, and financial policies is absolutely critical. Uh, and the presentation will discuss how fiscal rules or fiscal frameworks more generally can be improved, taking into account these lessons and challenges ahead. 
And of course, my presentation reflects the work of a large team at IMF, which is. So let me just give you very briefly that uh, crises have a large impact on how countries abide by rules. And in the charts, we compare uh, fiscal deficits and debt levels to the limits or anchors under the rules. Uh, in terms of deficits, we observe a spike on the number of countries that have deficits well above limits around the global financial crisis and particularly the pandemic, when 90% uh, of the countries deviated from their deficit limits. This is not surprising because it was a crisis, but we also see that a still large share of countries continue to have sizable deviations outside crisis periods. And this has contributed to a persistent rise in debt deviations. So especially among advanced economies, the share of countries systematically above the limit or, or fiscal anchors rises persistently over time. And more than half of the countries are well above their debt limits or anchors. In some cases, the deviations from uh, the debt limits are more than 50% of GDP. So we're talking about very, very large deviations. And this raises issues on how to deal with this uh, in many countries and as we consider a return to fiscal rules. So, uh, as already been mentioned, fiscal policy is at the critical conjuncture. But as countries, emerge, as countries emerge from the pandemic, policymakers face record levels of public debt. Okay, the debt surge during the pandemic was the largest single year increase since the World War II. Uh, before the pandemic, the cost of carrying high levels of debt was relatively low, especially for advanced economies. The neutral rates were an undeclining trend and inflation was low. So it was easier to, to manage higher levels of debt and few countries actually managed to significantly reduce debt levels prior to the pandemic. But now most countries are experiencing much tighter budgetary constraints due to rising borrowing costs, even as debt ratios fall. Weaker growth prospects, large contingent liabilities, uh, combined with rising risk premiums is leading to growing concerns with debt sustainability special for emerging and low-income countries. So in this context, governments are under pressure to develop medium-term fiscal plans. And in that context, are also many are considering a return to fiscal rules and how they can be improved. One aspect I wanted to mention here is that when you're thinking about fiscal frameworks, it's also crucial to reflect on the interplay between monetary and fiscal policies. In the most recent major crisis, the global financial crisis and COVID-19, fiscal policy played a decisive role. Governments took unprecedented measures in terms of the size, but also the type of measures. And moreover, the effects of the interactions between monetary and fiscal policies were in full display. And here I illustrate with a period of 2020 and 2022, and what you see for 2020, which was an impressive uh, 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 synchrony between fiscal and monetary policy. So in a, in a very large number of countries, we saw both massive monetary loosening and fiscal loosening uh, in response to COVID. Uh, so the, the two policies uh, were trying to achieve, uh, uh, react to a situation of an economic contraction, health crisis, obviously, and in, a, in an environment of very low inflation and very low interest rates, which allowed uh, the, the, made it possible the fiscal response, the unprecedented fiscal response in 2020. In 2021, as the, as the economies already started to rebound and uh, inflation started to rise, monetary policy uh, uh, paused in most countries, and fiscal policy started to tighten uh, first. So we saw countries already starting to tighten and part was the withdrawal of the emergency measures during the pandemic, right? And 2022, we see now a completely different world with high inflation and where most uh, central banks are tightening and uh, fiscal po policy is also tightening. Again, the two policies are responding 
to very different uh, concerns now than in 2020. Now it's a uh, concern is, uh, is ensuring price stability and avoiding that inflation gets, expectations get an anchor. So you have uh, a significant uh, response of the two policies. And as I, I will mention more, uh, these actions of monetary policy have significant fiscal implications. Uh, and I'll talk to about uh, a bit more, but the general point more from a, a policy framework perspective is that because uh, or the lessons is because of the effective lower bound has proven more frequently, fiscal policy needed to be more active than originally envisioned. So this is changing the way we think about fiscal policy. But this also requires building larger buffers in normal times so that governments have the fiscal space to react. Similarly, in periods of large inflation surprises, as we are witnessing now, fiscal policy needs to support the efforts by monetary policy to fight inflation. So we see really a rethinking of the role of fiscal policy in reaction to these shocks of the last years. Let me go then. So in our work at the fund, we are been thinking how you can uh, upgrade the, the medium term fiscal frameworks to address some of the past shortcomings and also help navigate these difficult policy trade-offs. And I want to spend a bit of time on two issues that have generated significant discussion when designing fiscal rules, uh, which is fiscal sustainability and uh, economic stability which are two key objectives of policymakers. Now, just to give you the first question is about fiscal sustainability. And the long-term decline in interest rates has ignited a very lively debate, especially just before the recent rise in inflation. But some argue that with a permanently low neutral rates, there is basically no limit on how much governments can borrow. Uh, and this was uh, driven, obviously, for what we have seen in the last decades, uh, as the charts show for the examples of Germany and Italy, uh, that decline in the long-term interest rates had a significant impact on the ability to manage larger debt levels. Okay. So to, to try to get a bit more to this question on uh, how much can governments borrow, because we do think there is a, a limit to borrow, we revisit this question using a model that highlights the demand of sovereign bonds as a function of its attractiveness or convenience yields. This, this builds on the work by Mian, Straub, and Sufi. Uh, and the diagrams show a deficit and debt trade-offs to ensure fiscal sustainability for a typical advanced economy in the left and then emerging markets in the right. And the horizontal axis is the public debt to, to GDP and the vertical axis is the primary deficit. So the left side of the peak is what's so, the so-called free lunch zone that many uh, economists have focused uh, before this latest uh, rise in inflation. And basically it's where countries can borrow without having to tighten primary balances. However, what we show is that the right side of the peak, fiscal does need to tighten because otherwise that becomes unsustainable. And uh, if you want to think about the, the what is the limit, uh, the LL is, is the debt level based on a maximum primary surplus, which we looked at historical data for uh, an average countries in, in advanced economies was about 2.5% of GDP. This is what in the literature some people use you, you calculate the maximum primary and from there you can estimate the debt limit. And here would give you um, uh, what you see in the chart of L. Uh, however, um, it, it is not feasible to run these large surpluses forever. This is the maximum countries can get and usually is um, and usually it's only for a few years. So you can think about the sustainable uh, level of debt would be lower consistent with a primary surplus that is politically and economically feasible. And for instance, if a country can only sustain 
primary surplus of about 0.5% of GDP over the long term, as is suggested by historical data, the corresponding sustainable level of debt for an advanced economy would be about 200%, uh, which is point L star. That is, debt levels above L star can be seen as a high as an area of high and rising risk of debt distress, as markets may lose confidence on the ability of governments to deliver sufficient high primary surplus to prevent an unsustainable debt. Uh, so one other point I want to make, the long-term decline in the neutral interest rates increases government's ability to borrow over time. And you can see it in the figure shows the two lines for each income group, depicting two different period times, mid 2000s in the blue line and the baseline of the pre-pandemic year in red. And the key difference between two periods is the global interest rates are higher for the earlier period. As a result, the line shifted outwards implying larger fiscal space just before the pandemic. Uh, the question is if, if this trend will continue or if we could have a, a, a reversal on the, on the long-term interest rates. Just don't spend too much time. But of course, fiscal limits. So the, the chart shows you the long-term trends and the, the concept of long-term debt sustainability. But the fiscal limits, however, also depend on other factors and can vary significantly across countries and time. And when setting fiscal frameworks, fiscal rules, governments need to take into account the uncertainty around key macro financial variables and other risks. And the attractiveness of governments also depends on structural factors such as the quality of institutions and, and policy frameworks. And fiscal limits also depend on factors that could shift considerably in the short term horizon. So for the estimates of fiscal limits can change quickly with market conditions and risk perceptions as we have seen in, in recent months. In particular, when governments are operating with debt in areas considered riskier, they may face difficulties in rolling over their debt. Also the tightening of global financial conditions can lead to a loss of attractiveness for government debt, especially for emerging markets. So the short, shows how fiscal space can diminish depending on the interest elasticity of public debt. The green bar shows that an increase in investor sensitivity to the level of debt, as we are seeing now in the markets, can have a large impact. And for example, in our example, decrease fiscal limits for advanced economies and DMs by 40% and 20% of GDP respectively. One, one last point is that history also tells us that even long run interest rates can be very volatile. And we saw during the sovereign debt crisis in Europe after the global financial crisis. And this is consistent with the findings in the literature showing that interest rate spikes occur very close to debt crisis. So let me just mention one more aspect to worth to stress is to take into account, again, the interaction between fiscal and monetary policies. And here, what we see is a two-way uh, links. So credible fiscal policies will help central banks achieve price stability objectives. So if, if you have an uncertain fiscal policy, it can be very disruptive uh, for uh, uh, growth, but also for uh, central banks to decide what is the path for monetary policy. So as monetary policy focuses experts on anchoring inflation expectations, it will be easier to do that if there is a credible path that economic agents believe to ensure fiscal sustainability, even as interest rates rise. On the other hand, fiscal sustainability is enhanced with credible monetary policy, with a credible monetary policy framework. The ability of governments to borrow at relatively low rates depends on the credibility of central banks. If central banks are not able to anchor inflation expectations, the cost of borrowing by governments will be higher as investors will demand higher risk premiums. So the, the challenge, at least from the fiscal policy, is to design fiscal plans that provide credible forward guidance. And here, rule-based fiscal frameworks can help to signal to markets and to central banks what are the plans, what are the fiscal policy ahead. So let me mention very briefly uh, another question we look in our research, which is relates to the stabilization role of fiscal policy. 
So fiscal rules help avoid procyclical policies as they promote healthier public finances. On the other hand, there are concerns that rigid fiscal rules could make policies more procyclical, not allowing countries to adjust to the economic circumstances. We analyze these questions using a, a and a local projection methods, and we study the relationship between fiscal rules and cyclicality of fiscal policy, focusing on recession periods. Uh, and the analysis uh, focus on these recession episodes to observe the behavior of fiscal policy in the adverse exogenous shock. And overall, our analysis does not show significant difference in fiscal policy response to recessions between countries with or without fiscal rules. And one important aspect is that uh, is the need for fiscal buffers. So fiscal buffers allow countries to have more countercyclical fiscal policies. So for example, countries with pre-recession deficits closer to or above their rule limits constrain spending relatively more. Okay. But the evidence also shows that rules with flexibility like escape clauses can help reduce this pro-cyclical. So, the breadth and challenges and risks highlight the importance of having a consistent macroeconomic policy frameworks. And the, our advice from the fiscal angle focus on the need to develop the medium term fiscal frameworks that strike a better balance between flexibility, to, especially to respond to shocks, but also credibility, uh, especially now uh, as there are great more concerns with uh, debt sustainability. And let me just highlight a few points on, on our analysis. Uh, what we, we learned is that complex fiscal rules that try to balance the many different policy goals have not proven very useful. Uh, and so we think medium term fiscal plans can enhance fiscal management and provide a much better sense of uh, what is fiscally sustainable. And you need transparent medium term fiscal anchors to, to guide policies. It is also important to have flexibility in response to shocks in the, uh, uh, in, the economic, in the economy. In the case of large shocks, uh, escape clauses can allow significant flexibility within the framework. But this implies that buffers need to be built to make room for fiscal policy against future shocks. As the chart shows, debt jumped 10 to 15% of GDP around the global financial crisis and the pandemic, reflecting economic contraction and precedent policy measures. At the same time, there are only two years between the global financial crisis and COVID-19 that led to a net decrease in public debts around the world, implying that buffers were not being built. So for this reason, we are the fiscal plans and rules should link more closely to comprehensive fiscal sustainability risk analysis that ensures a path to, the, to that sustainability over time and build up of appropriate fiscal buffers in good times. So, Operational rules here can play an important role in translating these medium-term goals with the annual budget. And the operational limits are set in the medium-term plans based on macroeconomic projections and consistent with this, again, uh, medium-term anchor and risk assessment. And in this context, uh, stable inflation, uh, low and stable inflation is a critical input for the fiscal framework and for that management. to main takeaways, so not to take too much more time. So some of the key lessons we have been learning from the last years is that fiscal rules have been increasingly adopted worldwide. They can help guide uh, policies and, uh, and uh, explain to markets what countries are trying to do, but they had limit, in practice, they had limited success in promoting the buildup of buffers and compliance has been weak. Uh, so the return to fiscal rules must consider the, all the recent lessons and current challenges, and especially take much more into account these fiscal and monetary interactions and the need to manage risks. So here we argue that the medium term fiscal framework can provide a credible forward guidance to navigate these pro policy trade-offs. This will call for a comprehensive set of reforms which go beyond the, the design of numerical rules. So we need, countries need to invest much more on defining me credible medium-term fiscal plans and anchors to guide annual budgets. We need also low and stable inflation 
and clear monetary policy objectives, which are critical inputs to these fiscal plans and to make them credible. Simple operational rules, which more linked to the stabilization role and the existence of well-designed escape clauses. And all this requires also much more focus on risk-based approach and, uh, in, uh, in designing fiscal frameworks. So especially the important to need the need to, to build larger buffers during time. Thank you. Stop. Many thanks, Paolo. Um, let's move to Matthias now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And um, can you see my slides? Slides are up, yeah. Can you do Perfect. Perfect, very good. Okay, so um, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for putting this uh, paper on the program. Before I start my walk, before I start my talk, I want to express my um, strong hope that uh, Ukraine can soon uh, end this war victoriously and on favorable terms. And the following I will talk about um, the link between fiscal and monetary policy. And uh, this is a joint project with uh, my two fantastic co-authors, uh, Lucas, who's a very talented PhD student in Mannheim, and Claudiana, who's at uh, Banque de France. And uh, because of Claudiana's affiliation, <clears throat> I want to make sure that these the views here um, do not um, reflect neither Bank de France nor the Euro system. So the broad uh, question that we um, address in this, in, the, in this paper, in this project, is how systematic monetary policy affects the response of the economy to business cycle shocks generally, and more specifically to fiscal spending shocks. Um, this question, is uh, in some sense a classical question in macroeconomics. And if anything, I believe it's a question that has become more relevant over the recent past, which uh, for example, is characterized by a high and increase, while well, increasing levels of uh, military spending uh, in response to the, to the war in Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> in theory, um, how systematic monetary policy shapes the uh, effects of uh, fiscal spending is, uh, I would argue, quite well understood. Uh, just to fix ideas, suppose, for example, a stylized Taylor rule in which uh, this, this coefficient, time varying coefficient phi t captures, can be thought of as capturing uh, systematic monetary policy. Now, this is an, what typically comes out of uh, DSG models is that the expansionary effects of higher spending on GDP are dampened. The, the larger phi is the more aggressively systematic monetary policy uh, operates uh, against it. Um, well, in theory, we think this 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 link is as well understood, and there are many other theories than the simple one I, I put up here. Um, empirically, we think much less is known about um, the link between systematic monetary policy and fiscal spending shocks. Um, in particular, when I say empirically, I mean uh, a reduced form uh, without imposing any, 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 any much, much structural assumptions. Um, we think the main reason why we don't have much um, um, reduced form evidence or reliable reduced form evidence on this question is there are two major challenges. Um, one of them is the endogeneity of uh, the potential endogeneity of systematic monetary policy. So, the, in, in the context of the simple Taylor rule, the fighting may be high because we are in recession, or because we are in boom, or because there's expansionary fiscal policy. Um, and another problem, um, a broader problem, if you, if you like, in, uh, is the is the Lucas critique, which uh, cautions us against exploiting statistical relationship for. Um, for policy analysis, because the statistical relationship uh, may change if systematic monetary policy uh, changes. Now, what we do in this paper is we address both of these um, challenges by providing a new identification design, which I will talk, tell you more about uh, later. This identification design can be applied to any type of business cycle shock you may be interested in. In this, in this paper in specific, we uh, apply it to the question of uh, the effects of government spending shocks. And broadly speaking, what we find is that for, an, uh, and we apply it to the US, we apply that for a, an average US systematic monetary policy, the fiscal multiplier is roughly about one. If the FOMC uh, is, uh, is more hawkish than average, the multiplier can fall to zero. And if it's more dovish than average, it can raise up to two or, or even higher. And we find consistent response of both interest rates and inflation. Uh, this paper contributes um, probably most closely to two related literature. First one on uh, systematic monetary policy, 
uh, what we um, do here is to address both of these empirical challenges I mentioned before in a reduced form setup. Um, the paper also contributes to literature that uh, studies estimates the effects of government spending shocks and their state dependency, including contributions by Yuri Gorotinchenko. What we, uh, our novel contribution here is to provide causal evidence on the role of systematic monetary policy in the state dependence of the effects of government spending shocks. Okay, let me now move on to uh, sort of the main part of um, the uh, presentation. And let me tell you how we identify uh, the effects of systematic monetary policy in the US. So this is the, this is a graphical illustration of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, which is the uh, body uh, deciding monetary policy in the US. And uh, one, one thing to keep in mind here is that there are 12 members in total. Eight of them are permanent uh, voting members. Uh, four, the, the four other members are rotated through the pool of regional Fed presidents, excluding uh, New York. And this, uh, this is, there's an annual rotation um, organizing this, this, uh, this and it's, it's mechanic, and that's what we will use for identification. But before I come there, um, let me tell you that we uh, have, based on my co-author, Claudiana's um, prior work, we have a classification of FMC members. So we know for 130 FMC members between 1960 and 2014, whether they are a hawk, where hawks are more concerned about inflation, or a dove, where doves are more, less concerned about inflation and more about employment. And this is based on real-time uh, newspaper coverage. And, 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 and Claudiana has shown that these measured perceived preferences actually reflect actions and tendencies and beliefs and can be traced back to education and, ex and experience. So to measure systematic monetary policy, is uh, inherently an aggregate object from these individual preferences, we first provide a numerical scale, which is uh, sort of this part here on the, on the, on the right uh, bottom corner, um, where we assume uh, numerical values for uh, um, a hawkish or a dovish uh, FMC member, and then we aggregate uh, these individual policy, these individual numerical policy preferences up by taking the uh, arithmetic average, which we think is a, is a reasonable way of aggregating these preferences because the FOMC tends to favor a consensus. So the median voter may not be the best model for the FOMC. Importantly, this measurement of systematic monetary policy does not need to, does not require us to specify a Taylor rule as I gave you in the, in the, in the first slide as a motivating example. We don't need to uh, specify any policy rule, neither, no, nor do we need to specify the policy instruments. Okay, so this is a very um, model-free measure of uh, systematic monetary policy, if you like. Um, now, in, in the potential concern with this general, uh, with this aggregate measure of systematic monetary policy is that it may be endogenous to the state of the economy. Uh, for example, there's some narrative evidence about Nixon influencing uh, FOMC members uh, leading up to, to his re-election, uh, but we can more broadly think that uh, high levels of inflation may could lead to more uh, dovish, uh, sorry, more hawkish FOMC or um, so on. So to address this uh, potential uh, endogeneity in the aggregate uh, hawk dove measure, we go back to the rotation that I mentioned previously, and we only focus on the four FOMC members that are rotated in and out through a mechanical rule. And we think this is um, this, uh, the variation that we capture in this way is plausibly exogenous because, first of all, the rotation is mechanical. That's exogenous to the state of the business cycle. Second, um, the regional Fed presidents typically serve long term, so appointments don't happen often. Uh, and even if appointments happen, the appointment is, um, um, or the, the pro Proposals are made by regional boards, so they're less, arguably less re uh, related to federal politics and less political. And uh, third, these regional Fed presidents very rarely change their preference, at least in our measure. Okay? So um, that's why we think this is, is a good instrument. Um, here's the, the, the time series evolution of um, the aggregate talk off balance in blue and the rotate, FOMC rotation instrument in, in red. Uh, over the overall sample period, 1960 to 2014. As you can see, um, we have uh, persistent and large fluctuations in blue, while the uh, FOMC rotation instrument features much more transitory fluctuations, which really reflect the, uh, the mechanical rotation in and out of FOMC members. Um, okay, so let me next come to um, 
the uh, empirical uh, motivating question how government spending depends on systematic monetary policy. So what we propose is an identification design that could be used for other shocks, but in this area, other than fiscal spending shock, but we focus on the spending shock for this paper. Um, the identification design is, in a nutshell, an interactive local projection model, which can be motivated by um, from a class of um, um, DSG models. Um, so in this interactive local projection, on the left-hand side, we have some outcome variable of interest, let's say GDP, and we regress that on, on, a, on a fiscal spending shock, ST, and on the interaction of the fiscal spending shock, ST, with uh, our aggregate hawk, hawk duff uh, balance, plus we control for the level of the hawk duff balance and um, some ag additional aggregate uh, controls. Now, this hawk bar is the sample average of the hawk duff balance, so we interact with the deviation of contemporaneous hawk duff balance from its sample average. Now, we estimate these regressions on our uh, quarterly on a quarterly sample from 96 to 2014. One of the outcomes of interest will be GDP. Another key outcome would be government spending. For our baseline um, fiscal spending shock will be the military spending news shock series from uh, Ramia Zubiris 2018 JPE. Um, in a sense, we closely follow this specification. It closely follows their frame, their, their linear framework. When you take out the two uh, hawk terms here, um, we, um, and we do we do follow them closely by specifying these regressors here is exactly in line with them. So we take four legs of GDP government spending at the shock. And then our in the following slides, I will show you the IV estimates of um, beta and gamma estimated uh, using this uh, instrument <clears throat> vector where hawk TIV is our rotation uh, instrument. Okay, so in the following, I will first show you beta, which captures the response, uh, which will capture a response of GDP and government spending to a fiscal, to military news shock when the um, hawk duff balance is at its sample average, okay, this term being zero. And then I'll show you gamma, which gives you the, as the differential effect. And then I will put beta and gamma together to talk about the state dependency. Okay, so first of all, the betas. So what you see in, on this, in, in these two figures, um, the blue solid line is the point estimate of betas, and the shaded areas are the 68 and 95% confidence intervals, uh, respectively. Uh, and the shock, the military spending news shock, is scaled to um, uh, correspond to 1% of, of, of GDP. Okay, so in response to the shock, most importantly, the most important takeaway from this figure is that we see for an, an average FOMC composition, we see a significant um, increase in, um, in both in GDP and in government spending. And the fact that GDP becomes significant at rather long horizons may reflect the fact that the government spending response also responds most longly at, at long horizons, which is, uh, which is not surprising given that we talk about military spending news shocks. That, that's that's the, the, the variable constructed by uh, Raymond Zubiri. Okay, so let me next show you, move on to the to the gammas, which give us the differential effect. So to be clear, um, this, this, this line here is the point estimate of <laughs> differential GDP response when there are two more hawks in the FOMC than, than average. Okay, and we see a significant, uh, a significantly smaller uh, response of GDP, while the differential response of government spending is, in, is rather insignificant and, and small magnitude. Okay, finally, uh, we want to put this, uh, the beta and the gamma together. Uh, we subtract and add gamma from the beta to obtain um, an estimate of the total response of GDP when the FOMC is more dovish than average, more dovish by two members than average, and when the FOMC is more hawkish than average, more hawkish by, by two members. And as you can see, um, under the more dovish FOMC, the GDP response significantly positive, while under the more hawkish FOMC, the GDP response is uh, negative, a less, bit less significantly, but uh, rather negative, um, while the G, G response is uh, insignificantly different, somewhat larger for the dovish. FOMC. Now, note that uh, the shocks are military spending news shocks, and this is the total government spending uh, response. And we, if we split it up, we actually see there are some differential response in, in non-military spending. 
Okay, so next we want to translate these uh, these estimates into into fiscal multiplier. So what we do is we compute a cumulative um, fiscal spending multiplier in line with Remy and Subairi, and we focus on the <clears throat> on the four year horizon. So on average, what we see here on average we have roughly a, a multiplier of one, it's a bit above one. Um, so a one dollar increase in, in, in spending increases GDP by 1.3 um, dollars. Uh, well, if you if the FOMC is more hawkish by one member, the multiplier drops to zero. Well, it's insignificant, but uh, point us into zero. While if the FOMC is more dovish by one member, the, the multiplier increases to above two. Note that uh, these two estimates, plus one hawk, plus one dove, they are significantly different from each other. Um, it's also interesting to observe that if we if we had estimated a linear model, uh, which means a model in which these gamma terms are restricted to be zero, so which would not allow for <coughs> state dependence with respect to systematic monetary policy, in that linear model over the, over our sample, the average multiplier would be smaller, but more, most interestingly, it would be very insignificant. Well, it's significantly different from zero in in our nonlinear model, which is further evidence suggesting that. The um, state dependency with respect to systematic monetary policy matters. Um, okay, now you may wonder where are these large differences coming from? The large differences in the in the fiscal multiplier for relatively small differences in the in the composition of the FOMC. Um, so one answer to that question is, is here in these slides. What I'm in the, in the slide. What I'm showing you here is the response of various nominal and real interest rates. Um, First, in, in blue here, um, in, in the first row, the average responses, the betas. And then in the second row, the uh, state dependent responses, the responses when the FMC is more dovish by two members or more hawkish by two members. And wh what you can see is that uh, under the more dov dovish FMC, not only does the, the, the interest rate not increase, it even decreases by, by a bit. Okay? Um, while under the more hawkish FMC, the, the interest rates tend to uh, uh, increase um, uh, significantly more more strongly. Um, now, um, if you compare, for example, to uh, quantitative to estimated DSGE models as, that estimate the effects, uh, the, the sorry, the fiscal multiplier at the zero lower bound when the interest rate response uh, would be zero, um, um, the the multiplier can easily be be a two. So I think in that sense our uh, Estimated um, multipliers uh, are not completely outside uh, the range of um, estimates that uh, exist based on based on uh, quantitative TSG models. At least. Um, another question you may ask is, you know, if these if the, the hawks are motivated by uh, taming inflation and they do increase interest rates by more in response to a fiscal expansion, what actually happens to inflation? Okay, so inflation is pretty the inflation estimates are not very precise i should say but if anything if we focus on the second row if anything at least the expected inflation and core inflation is rather lower um, under the more hawkish regime than under the more uh, dovish uh, regime okay let me know um let me also tell you that we have a, a, a whole range of additional results on, on crowding in on how this how the system in monetary policy it relates to existing measures of monetary policy shocks. Um, there is, uh, we have, you, you may worry about um, the um, hawk duff uh, measure not being comparable across time because what is a hawk now is different. Um, is, is different. I mean, the classifying someone as a hawk now may um, be a, a duff under, under the classification used uh, 10 years ago, say. So we show that the results are, um, are robust to taking sort of a five, a five to ten year moving average deviation in the in the hawk dove aggregation to a, a, a control for slow moving trends and uh, in the in the benchmark conception of what constitutes a, a hawk or a dove. All right, uh, let me now um, come to my conclusion. So what we um, um, have done in this paper is is, is two two things. First, we have proposed a new identification design that allows us to study the propagation of any business cycle shock you may be interested in through uh, US systematic monetary policy. Now, this um, 
identification design relies critically on two inputs. First, uh, a measure of historical variation in perceived systematic monetary policy. And second, an instrument that uh, uh, allows us to address the potential endogeneity in that measure. And that's uh, in the, our novel contribution. It's, a, it's an uh, FOMC rotation. It's what we call the FOMC rotation instrument. The second um, contribution of this paper is to provide new evidence, reduce our evidence on how the government, how the fiscal spending might play depends on systematic monetary policy in the US. And we show that there is a significant reliance on um, systematic monetary policy and we find rather large differences in the multiplayer across different um, regimes in monetary policy. Um, with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Matthias. Uh, so I will just open the floor maybe to questions uh, from the audience or from the other panelists. Right. So, in the meantime, while these are getting uh, while these are getting uh, mature, let's say, um, I I just wanted to start by asking a, a few questions, maybe, uh, Paolo. Um, so, return to fiscal rules um, seems to be a way to signal more commitment to to uh, to let's say policy paths. Uh, uh, fiscal policy paths. Is this something that has is 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 this something that has been in a sense, conditioned by the fiscal responses during the COVID period? Is this a mix of, you know, this, let's call them cyclical factors uh, and more structural factors, such as, you know, increased pension uh, uh, pension outlays in the expected in the future because of aging, uh, perhaps uh, too high too high uh, debt levels and so on and so forth. So what, what motivates, in a sense, this, uh, this uh, return? To, to fiscal rules. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, in general, countries adopt fiscal rules uh, in, after crisis or when they have uh, growing uh, debt sustainability concerns. Uh, the markets start to price or higher uh, cost to for the debt of those countries. So that tends to be a strong motivation in uh, in many countries. What we what we have seen in the global financial crisis and now in the pandemic was the problem was that when you try to adopt these rigid numerical rules, uh, while they can help initially signal a commitment to healthy public finances, they can undermine the quality of fiscal policy, especially in the response to shocks. Um, if they are to reach it. So we have seen in the global, fin after the global financial crisis, countries started to adopt more uh, what we call escape clauses. So basically the ability to uh, uh, to uh, not abide by the rules temporarily if hit by a shock. And this has happened in the pandemic. So a vast majority of countries have uh, activated escape clauses or outright suspended fiscal rules because they needed the ability to quickly respond to this massive shock. Uh, and they did so appropriately, but the problem of course was that uh, debt rose significantly. That was uh, in a context initially where monetary policy was being loosening. So interest rates were very low, inflation was low. So that was manageable, but the, as we all know, the environment has changed significantly and uh, countries are now increasingly worried uh, with, uh, with the debt dynamics because markets are starting to uh, price significantly, uh, mo much more expensively uh, if you are considered to be a high risk country. So that is driving this return to fiscal rules, but the, the long-term considerations are also there. So countries want to go back to these frameworks that provide credibility but at the same time, and, and basically show, and some more countries are doing these long-term debt sustainability analysis, which includes considerations of aging and climate change related investment. 
to uh, to show they are taking that into account, but still a small number of countries. Uh, so so they are trying to, and this is what we are we are also advocating to countries is you need to strengthen your fiscal frameworks to allow these both two uh, objectives that are sometimes a tension, which one is to show credibility to markets uh, and to people that uh, the governments are committed to fiscal discipline, and at the same time, give, grant enough flexibility to respond to the different economic conditions and shocks. Um, and a key issue is the um, the the ability to ma to to manage better uh, risks and an assessment of risks and this depends including as as uh, others have mentioned with the science paper i think is very nice uh that the the effectiveness of fiscal policy and the fiscal stance really depends also on the inflation but also on the monetary policy response so this is where we think, you know, going back to rigid fiscal rules is problematic. You need uh, a medium term fiscal framework that allows more flexibility to, to design your operational rules based on all these considerations. But yes, the achieving uh, signaling credibility of public finances is a key motivator behind the fiscal rule. Many thanks. So in the meantime, we have a question to Matthias uh, uh, from uh, Victor Kozuk. He's asking if um, you've considered that the more hawkish Fed offsets fiscal impact and if the analysis takes into account the level of public debt. Yeah, that's an excellent question. We, we, we thought quite a bit about that. Um, so um, I can tell you, well, the baseline estimates that I showed you do not take into account the level of, of public debt, um, but the results are quite robust to adding uh, that as a control. And this, a related concern we had was the way that the new spending would be financed could uh, could have play, play a role. So we also have a a, a control for that, and uh, it surprisingly makes uh, makes little. Uh, difference to the effects of systematic monetary policy. I mean, we, we do think it, it plays a difference per se, but uh, it, do, it does not seem to be systematically related with our variable capturing uh, systematic uh, monetary policy. Mihnia, if I, I may, I also have a question to, to Paul. Go ahead, yes, sure. Um, so I, uh, in, the, in the end of your talk, you were <clears throat> highlighting, uh, among other things, that uh, low and stable um, level of inflation is critical for achieving that sustainability or a return to uh, fiscal rules. And uh, I was a bit surprised. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe it's a bit provocative to ask, but I was a bit surprised because the um, um, at least the transitory spike in inflation can be a pretty good thing if your if your debt to GDP ratio is far away from from target. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. No, oh, thank you. Yes, we are actually doing some work on that. Uh, no, definitely what we see is that um, inflation surprises can uh, have significant fiscal impacts, uh, both on the deficit, because you, have, you tend to have surprises on um, upside surprises on revenue. And if your budgets are not indexed to inflation, uh, you have a, a reduction in real spending. So you tend to have a, a, a positive uh, in, impact on the deficit. Oh, I'm sorry. So a surprise in inflation redu tends to reduce the deficit. Um, um, what we have seen in practice in the current environment is that governments, especially European governments, are using that additional, I wouldn't say space, but that effect from inflation to increase spending uh, on uh, special on these energy related measures support to households so that we while we estimate that inflation by itself can have a significant effect on reducing deficits uh, temporarily we don't see it so much in practice because governments are increasing spending significantly in response to the energy crisis in europe especially but yes it can help the other part is on the balance sheet of governments so, so a, uh, a large inflation surprise by increasing nominal GDP reduces significantly the debt ratios. 
so so what we we see for example uh, in 2021 already that the the significant hike uh, surprise hike in inflation helped reduce uh, to some degree the large increase in debt that we had observed in 2020 so we say on average like one third of the large increase in 2020 has, has been already compensated in 2021 uh, because of the higher nominal GDP. Of course, this includes inflation and the surprise also strength of the, 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 the rebound from the worst of the pandemic. But in 2022, based on what we are seeing already, we're gonna see again another positive effect on debt ratios in many advanced economies and some emerging markets. However, this effect actually is very small or negligible for many low-income countries and some emerging markets because their debt is indexed to inflation or to the exchange rate. So they have FX debt. And what we see is that movement, uh, this high inflation is also having a significant impact on exchange rates and interest rates and risk premium. So, so what we see is that, for example, uh, low-income countries and, and some EMs are seeing almost no benefit from the surprise in inflation, and they are going to see the cost in the future because what we are seeing is interest rates are now uh, projected to be significantly higher and borrowing costs significantly higher. So, so that would be my last point: is that surprise inflations tend to have a, a temporary positive effect uh, uh, on the on uh, so reduce debt levels and reduce deficits, but over time, they if inflation is persistent. Uh, this would lead to significantly higher interest rates and borrowing costs in the future. And so that is bad for that sustainability in a long-term perspective. Uh, but you're right in the short term, especially if the if governments, uh, if central banks can contain inflation and keep the inflation expectations anchored, they could potentially have uh, this positive effect in the short term without too many costs in the long term. So it, it is possible. Many thanks. So um, um you know I want I wanted to to also uh, pick up from this last uh, one of the slides that you had uh, about on the interaction between monetary and uh, and fiscal credibility um and you know the this this thing you mentioned before that in a sense these fiscal rules are a signal that um, uh, there's commitment to certain uh, to certain expenses to certain income and so on and so forth um so this reflects in a certain sense um the habits this developed by monetary policy uh, by the monetary policy toolkit um but in a sense the fiscal was always there to catch up everything that monetary couldn't so fiscal rules or maybe communication on future fiscal commitments is this useful to to increase credibility, or could this turn counterproductive? Uh, you know, in a world of large and persistent shocks. Uh, this is a question, in a in a sense, to to all panelists. Of course, it's not just I'm, I'm starting off from Paolo's uh, very good slide that was showing that the two are dancing together, and that the expectations of inflation, expectations perhaps of debt limits or deficits, might actually interact uh, on the firm side, on the household side. So. Um, you know, in, in almost in a sense, when we talk about this, we implicitly somehow have commitments uh, on policy, on monetary policy, on fiscal policy, and their interaction one year from now or two years from now, and, and, and so on and so forth. So what, what do you think is, is the right way to approach this problem, particularly for emerging economies where this credibility needs to be earned on both sides? No, I, I think this is a very good question, and there are questions we are struggling and, uh, and discussing with the country authorities, and central banks. Uh, obviously, nothing can replace good policies, right? If uh, if governments and central banks take good policies, that that is the final solution. Uh, we do, but we do see benefits on having some more rules-based uh, frameworks. You know, Obviously, from the monetary policy, but also on the fiscal policy, um, 
And it is true, fiscal policy is much more complex. There are many objectives that uh, governments are taking, including distributional effects, uh, uh, supply side policies, uh, structural policies. Uh, but and uh, what we are saying is that, yes, that cannot be reflected in an automatic numerical rule. That just doesn't work. Uh, but that's why we say you, it is better to focus on these medium-term fiscal plans with uh, fiscal anchors. And, and the idea is that you can balance these, these two. Um, so you, you granted some flexibility for governments to adjust, to set priorities, and they, those can change. But you're also signaling markets, this is where we want to go. This is where we want to converge over time, be it uh, a debt anchor or deficit anchor. But this is a signal to, to the markets, to the population, to central banks, that this is where fiscal policy is trying to reach. And what we see some evidence is that if, if those plans are credible, they immediately lead to a reduction in borrowing costs. So markets do seem to price uh, these credible plans. So they, they seem to see benefits to it uh, uh, and they will reduce the, the borrowing costs to, to governments. Uh, the, another important aspect I think, which had been underestimated in the past, but it's becoming more important now is because of these uh, links between monetary and fiscal policy uh, is that, um, you know, there's, I've talked to several central banks and they, they, they need uh, some type of coordination with fiscal policy that would help them set monetary policy. But at the same time, they, they, they need to keep their independence, right? You need, you cannot uh, have a central bank that is has to somehow act according in coordination with ministries of finance is a very difficult. So fiscal rules to some degree can can solve this problem because uh, central banks are still would still be independent, but they understand that they know what is what are the fiscal policy objectives, what where governments are going when they are setting monetary policy. So rules can also help in that type of coordination or game. Uh, when setting policies. Uh, so that could be one way. And this is really important uh, as we have now seen that governments have decided fiscal policy should play a much larger role in responding to shocks, right? So we, we have seen uh, that the size of policy action, the type of policy actions have been unprecedented. So if you want to do that, yeah, that will depend tremendously on what is the monetary policy stance. Of what is the inflation uh, perspectives? So, so we, we having greater clarity on the fiscal path is going to be very important uh, to have more uh, uh, um, credible policy frameworks. Yeah, you know, many thanks. Uh, maybe any other comments from the other panelists? Yeah, can can I address shortly? Um, add to that, um, uh, I fully agree with everything that was already said. That uh, especially in the times at the time of, of large uh, large shocks, uh, the departure from from some strict or, or, or kind of uh, fiscal rules that, that are not allowing for 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 big adjustment uh, is kind of natural, uh, and it was clear both during the pandemic and, and, and nowadays, uh, I think it's also quite, quite visible. What I would say that the uh, fiscal rules are very critical in normal times. Uh, otherwise, I think it would be very difficult for governments to, 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 to keep the discipline and to, to really collect the, 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 the the revenues and the, the sp policy space that uh, really in the event of, of, I don't know, pandemic, war or, or other critical situation would be very, very, I mean, necessary to, to address the problem. So I would say that, that policy uh, fiscal, rooms, fiscal rules are, are critical, probably in normal times, but they pay off in, in, in times of, of turbulence and, and crises. And that's the main reason why, why they should be in place 
whenever possible. Many thanks, Jonah. So, Matthias, there's a question to you um, uh, regarding your presentation. So, um, the question is if um, uh, your analysis controls for periods when inflation and output are moving in the in, in different directions, and it would be interesting to see if these results hold also in times of recession, presumably when both hawks and and doves kind of align in their interests, in a sense. So, this question sounds like uh, very much in the spirit of a recent uh, JME by. Michel Gassier, who has been at uh, NBU for a while, and um, Francesco Zanetti. Um, so we have not, uh, we have not, con we have not really looked into that, and I'm not sure. Well, maybe we should, but I think one one answer to the to the question is that I, I think this should not affect our results. To the, I mean, to the extent that our instrument is valid, this does not affect our estimates. Okay. So potentially a systematic monetary policy could be different because of um, um, because of being in a demand or supply driven recession, or those could be sort of confounding factors that also affect the level of the uh, fiscal multiplier. But to the extent that um, our FMC rotation instrument is orthogonal to demand versus supply driven recessions, um, which actually we can we could directly look look into. Um, to that extent, it should not affect our, our estimates. So uh, thanks for the question. There is uh, some, uh, some, something, to, something else to look into, which we haven't done yet. Very good, many thanks. So uh, if there are any further questions, uh, now is the time to pose them. Otherwise, we're precisely one minute away from the break that I think we are looking forward to. If not, so many thanks to all panelists and to the questions, and uh, we will see you all back in about 30 minutes. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. again. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So, yeah, uh, so we are ready to continue our uh, inflation targeting uh, workshop, and it's an honor for me to present the next keynote speaker. Uh, Yuri Hrednichenko. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of the participants know Yuri well, as he is uh, uh, one of the most cited young economists uh, uh, in the world and the number one top economist according to the uh, REPEC. Um, he has many prizes and other awards, but anyway, I would like to present him as a um, uh, uh, presidential professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Yuri also has many other affiliations. Uh, he is an editor of Journal of Monetary Economics, um, a faculty research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics and Center of Economic and Policy Research, and a visiting scholar at the San Francisco, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, Yuri is Ukrainian and a longtime uh, friend uh, of Ukraine. Ukraine is uh, uh, and was at the core of his uh, research interests for many years. He has many articles um, about Ukraine, uh, its monetary policy, inflation expectations, and uh, uh, also a number of uh, advisory policy notes. Um, uh, Yuri also uh, was a, um, among the key uh, uh, persons who inspired uh, to hold, uh, uh, to establish and hold um, uh, the National Bank of Ukraine and the Rodovy Bank uh, Polski annual research conferences. Um, he he is also an editor of uh, uh, research journal of the National Bank of Ukraine, uh, Visnik of the National Bank of Ukraine. And uh, today Yuri will speak about the art and science of managing inflation expectations. Thank you, Yuri, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's always a great pleasure to be with the National Bank of Ukraine. Um, it's a big honor and pleasure. 
me share my slides. Okay, so the art and science of inflation expectations. Um, now everybody is talking about inflation and it's, it's obviously a very important topic, um, not only in Ukraine, but also in developed countries in the US. Uh, concerns about high and uh, persistently high inflation. And so some people question well, what kind of models we should use. Is this a problem with models that miss this? Or is this a, a problem with I got disconnected. Now we can hear you well. Okay, I'll share my slides again. All right, so <clears throat> I was saying that inflation expectations is a big deal. Everybody is concerned about this. And one of the questions out there is whether uh, this happened because we had their own model or because we had uh, some type of discretionary behavior which created this inflation. Now, inflation expectations are. Uh, um, everywhere in our models. You know, you, for example, you look at the Phillips curve, inflation expectations are there. It gives us the connection between the real economy, output gap, and inflation. Uh, it also shows up in consumption uh, decisions. So it's important there as well. It's important for uh, pricing assets, uh, Tobin's Q uh, in uh, asset pricing. Uh, famously, it's also in, uh, in the Taylor rule. Okay, and so we have versions of the Taylor rule where you respond to actual inflation, but you also have some versions of the Taylor rule where you respond to expectations. And, uh, you know, statistically expectations in the Taylor rule are better uh, kind of descriptions of what policymakers are doing. But to this day, there is a debate about, you know, whether this uh, specification was expectations should be used by policymakers, or it should be something, you know, more backward looking or more, uh, more current. Now, you would think that, you know, it's not going to make a ton of difference most of the time. And it's true, most of the time, it's not making a ton of difference. This figure here shows the dynamics of actual inflation in the US. This is the black line. You see, there is a lot of volatility here. Uh, it also gives you a now cost from professional forecasters. That is in the current quarter, what professional forecasters think inflation is. And the blue line is one year ahead inflation forecast. And so what you should see here is that the black line is very volatile, but the blue line is relatively smooth. Now, most of the time up until COVID, it doesn't really matter what kind of measure you use uh, for policymakers. Uh, making you know all of these measures are basically giving you more or less the same picture but now when you see what was happening post-covid here we see a sharp difference the actual inflation accelerated very very fast and stayed elevated for quite some time now when you look at now costs you see it's consistently this red line is consistently below actual inflation and this is a big difference okay? so if you look at, at this number here it's like three four percentage point difference now, if you tailor rule here, this coefficient is 1.5 or something like this. This difference, you multiply by 1.5, it has hugely different implications for where the policy rate should be. This is even more extreme when you look at one year ahead inflation expectations for professional forecasters, this blue line. This line here is moving even less. So if professional forecasters are telling you we're not expecting a ton of inflation going forward, so all we see here is just a temporary spike in inflation, you should not be raising uh, inflation, uh, I'm sorry, you should not be raising interest rates aggressively, okay? So it makes a crucial difference in this episode what kind of measure used for policy making, actual inflation, uh, kind of short-term now cost inflation expectations, or one year ahead inflation expectations. Now, why would this blue line evolve so slowly? Okay, so why do we have this different behavior of inflation expectations? Now, you would think that with so much research and so much importance attached to inflation expectations, we should know everything about inflation expectations. Uh, but it's not true, it's not true. And to highlight this, I will give you a few quotes from prominent central bankers. This is from Alan Greenspan when you know, he was talking at the FOMC uh, and he was saying, look, I don't know what it is, 
I can't make a judgment, but I know it's a key variable. So we kind of care about inflation expectations, but we don't know what it is. And we would like to have a better understanding of inflation expectations. Now, some years later, Ben Bernanke gives a major speech about inflation and inflation expectations. And again, he, he says in the speech roughly that it's a, an extremely important variable. It's important for policy, uh, but we don't have complete answers. So we still don't know much about this. And the evidence is particularly scarce for businesses. That is how firms set their prices. Now, some years later, Janet Yellen also gives a major uh, speech about inflation and inflation expectations. And she says, most importantly, we need to know more about the manner in which inflation expectations are formed and how monetary policy influences them. She goes on and says, you know, it's important how we can use it for policy. And you kind of get this impression that we, we understand that inflation expectations are extremely important for explaining macroeconomic dynamics and for policy, uh, but we don't know how these expectations are formed and how we can use them for policy. Uh, Jay Powell recently didn't give a speech specifically about inflation and inflation expectations, but whenever you listen to his press conferences or kind of other speeches, he keeps talking about, you know, they're watching about, uh, they're watching inflation, inflation expectations, they're terribly important, and we, we want to kind of know more about where they're going and how we can use them for policy. So, you know, this, this, this quote can give you an impression that we know actually very little about inflation, uh, inflation expectations. But it's not entirely true. We actually made a ton of progress over the years. Uh, we have better models. We have better measurement. Uh, we don't have complete answers for sure, but we are not at the state when we know uh, nothing about inflation expectations. And uh, I'll give you a short overview how much uh, progress we made over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, kind of if you go to early uh, post-World War II macroeconomics, Inflation expectations were not really a part of uh, our models. It was almost like an afterthought, a residual, a wedge, psychology, right? We don't know what it is. It's just, you know, some mechanical way of how people are thinking about the future. Typically, uh, expectations are described with past realizations of inflation or other macroeconomic variables. So it's kind of a very simple mechanical way to summarize what people are thinking about the future. Now, obviously, this framework failed miserably in the 1970s when we had the great inflation and uh, we had simultaneously high inflation and high unemployment, kind of similar to what we had uh, in, in some countries more recently. Uh, and so this obviously created a, a macroeconomic revolution, the full information rational expectations, where you had another extreme uh, in this framework you have economic agents that know everything about everything. So they know the structure of the economy, they know the shocks, they can quickly calculate the equilibrium, they can calculate optimal policies and responses for themselves as well as for other agents in the economy. So it's kind of an extreme version of how much people can know. So you have this extreme where everything is known to everybody and you have this extreme where people are actually not that smart if you will. Now, these two extremes are not entirely satisfactory. This is unrealistic. This is also unrealistic. People are not stupid, but probably not as smart as predicted by uh, the full information rational expectations. And so a lot of work over the years has, has been focused on trying to come up with some intermediate solutions you know, somewhere in between these two. And in the nutshell, you had uh, two classes of models. One is where you preserve rationality, but you say people don't have the full structure uh, don't know the full structure of the economy or they uh, don't have full information. And another model where uh, you uh, you kind of know uh, the structure of the economy, but uh, you do not have rationality. And so to this day, there is active work between you know these two subclasses trying to figure out what kind of models are going to be uh, the best uh, description of the reality. And we have some progress here. I'll describe this. Um, a bit later in my lecture. Now, having said this, that you know there is this work where we try to um, have an intermediate solution, an intermediate description of how people form inflation expectations. This framework here remains the mainstream in macro. 
And this is really striking uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that it started with very humble uh, beginnings. This early paper by Moose uh, was you know, a relatively obscure paper saying that expectations have to be model consistent. Um, and you know, for a while, it didn't get any traction. And only many years later, when Bob Lucas uh, showed the power of uh, this idea that expectations have to be model consistent, we really had this full information ratio expectations. And they had a variety of applications. One of them was Lucas critique, basically saying, look, you know, if you change policy, people are going to change the way in which they form inflation expectations. And, and so we, we have to come up with models where you have, you know, primitive objects in the economy, uh, like utility, production function, and so on. And uh, we should allow uh, people to form expectations in the best possible way. So if policy is changing, it's going to change the way how people form inflation expectations or other expectations. Now, this idea was so powerful that now almost every central bank out there, I'm sure it's also true for the National Bank of Ukraine, has a, a forecasting model where you have agents who are fully informed. Uh, they know everything about the structure of the economy and they know who is the governor of the National Bank of Ukraine. They know governors of other countries. Um, and so they can quickly calculate all sorts of optimal policies uh, for themselves and other agents. So this is kind of a testament of the success of this. Um, another example of, of the success of this model is that we had kind of old ideas in macro about how various macroeconomic variables are related to each other. For example, the Phillips curve, inflation and unemployment rate. And the early versions of this idea didn't have any expectations but then in the course of this you know, full information rational expectations, uh, we came up with basically the same Phillips curve uh, with you know, some modifications where expectations are going to be uh, featured more prominently. And we have more sophisticated models than uh, this ones. But the idea is that uh, you can basically recast lots and lots of insights we had in early macro uh, uh, developments and, and and custom in this you know, full information rational expectations framework. And so if you look at the basic structure of macro models today, you know you have new Keynesian macro where everything is micro founded as, as, as Lucas wanted. It has full information rational expectations. It also has extremely forward looking agents in the economy. And so this is really kind of the bread and butter of modern macroeconomics. Now, if this is so dominant, if this is so important, uh, then you would think that all this, you know, elements are going to be tested and tested again to, to show that, you know, we really have the right type of model used for policy and forecasting and for understanding macroeconomic dynamics. Kind of one element of this exercise should be that we want to check if rational expectations are consistent with survey data when we ask people to make predictions about inflation, GDP, unemployment, and so on. And this is a huge literature. It goes back, you know, 40 years, uh, a lot of important work, and I'm not going to do justice to it, but I will summarize it with basically two bullet points. One is that in the long run, full information rational expectations is a good description of how people think about the economy. That is, eventually people figure out what is happening. They can understand the shocks, trade-offs, and so on. But in the short run, or even medium run, you have massive deviations from um, full information ration expectations in the survey data. So people don't know the structure of the economy. They fail to realize that there are shocks. And you know what was happening during the post-COVID recovery when we have this sharp divergence between expectations and actual inflation, this is one manifestation of this problem. That you know, when people make predictions and we compare these predictions to realizations, we have large persistent uh, forecast errors, okay? And that's important for policy. You know, should we have inflation targeting? Is this the right model? Is this the right variable in our models? When we think about this. Now, if you have these results, then you always say, well, in probably we should have a slightly different model where we have to relax full information rational expectations, at least in the short run. Uh, but there was some uh, disagreement out there uh, at Prescott unfortunately passed away recently, was basically making this point that we don't really need the surveys uh, to measure expectations. If you have a model, 
you can compute model implied expectations and that's all you need to know because surveys are not going to be useful for you. People are going to lie, they are going to tell you some numbers which mean nothing. And so this is not really a test of uh, any theory, right? It's not really something that we can easily measure this expectations business. Now, this was one view. Um, other people disagreed and they said, look, you know, we can actually do a lot of important work uh, with, with surveys and, uh, you know, the data is not going to be perfect, but if we see something there, which is not entirely consistent with this beautiful theory, we should not discount this data as saying, well, you know, it's just bad data. Uh, maybe we should think about models that we need to modify to uh, accommodate what we see in the micro level data and survey data, where we see these departures from full information, rational expectations. Now, what are these departures? You know, why, why this you know, debate is so important? I'll show you some figures <clears throat> uh, to hopefully convince you that we have these departures, deviations from full information, rational expectations, and we should take them seriously. Uh, for policy and also for modeling macroeconomic dynamics. Uh, the first figure I want to show you is the dynamics of average inflation expectations in the US over time. The blue line is household, the green line is professional forecasters, and the red line is asset prices, financial markets. The black line is what happens with firms. And so what you should see here is that in this early part of the sample up to you know, early 2000s, the blue, the green, and the red line, professional forecasters, asset pricing, and households are basically doing the same thing. They have more or less similar forecasts. But then sometime in 2000s, we see a sharp departure. Households predict much higher inflation, a lot more volatility. Professional forecasters and financial markets are basically predicting the same thing. So think about this as kind of rational, more or less informed agents in the economy. We probably don't have fire for anybody, but if we need a proxy for that, this is probably the type of agents we should see. So you see here, inflation expectations are very, very much anchored, relatively low volatility. Now the firms, remember Bernanke was complaining that way, we, we have very little evidence on how firms are setting prices. And, and we have a new survey for that. Uh, we have a survey of uh, CEOs, uh, top management of firms in the US. They kind of in between households and professional forecasters. When the survey was started, they looked more like households. Then uh, kind of in early pre-COVID times, they converged to professional forecasters. And now this black line is again telling us that people look as if they're uh, households. Also notice the huge differences here between professional forecasters and asset markets on one side and households and firms on the other side. You know, kind of the people who make consumption decisions, investment decisions predict much, much higher inflation rates than professional forecasters and assets. And this is going to be important when we think about whether this inflation is accelerating the economy or if it's hurting the economy, why people are so unhappy about this current state. So what we should get from this is that we should not treat this agents similar to this agents. There is a big departure between households and firms on the one side, and then professional forecasters and financial markets on the other side, okay? This is also telling us that full information rational expectations right there is not probably a good description because if everybody is full information rational expectations, then we should have exactly the same forecasts. Okay, so this agents and this agents should have the same forecast, and they don't. All right, so this is one way to, to see that, you know, fire is already failing. This is another way to, to see this. Uh, this. This figure here shows the dynamics of disagreement across uh, households, across professional forecasters, and, and this is not professional forecasters. This is, uh, I'm sorry, so this is professional forecasters. This is households, and this black line is firms. And what you should see here is that within professional forecasters, uh, there is some disagreement, but it's relatively small. When you look at households, it's much bigger. When you look at firms, again, somewhere in between. Again, if you have full information rational expectations, 
you should see very little disagreement because everybody has the same information. Everybody has more or less the same model. Everybody should have the same prediction. We see for households that this dispersion is like 10 times bigger than dispersion for professional forecasters. So it's telling us households don't have the same information set for sure. They don't really have the same model. The same is true for firms. They don't share uh, the information across each other. They are not like professional forecasters. And also see that the dynamics is different. There is a lot more disagreement now among firms than we had before uh, COVID. So again, it's telling us that there is something that is not exactly full information ratio expectations. Now, another metric that is useful for thinking about uh, differences between people and uh, uh, rational agents is how much uncertainty they have in their inflation forecasts. And this figure here shows the kind of the distribution of probabilities assigned to high inflation scenarios. This was done in 2019, first quarter. This is still tranquil time before COVID. And what you should see here is that professional forecasters, this red dots, are basically saying we're going to assign extremely low probability to scenarios where inflation is going to exceed 4%. So this is like 90% probability that inflation is not going to exceed 4%. And then, you know, there is a small group of people saying, well, you know, maybe there is some chance here between 10 and 15%, 10 and 20%. But basically nobody saw that there is more than 20% chance that inflation is going to exceed 4%. Now you look at firms, field bars, or households, empty bars, and you see huge probabilities assigned to this high inflation scenarios. Okay, so it's not unusual to see somebody saying, well, there is a 50% chance that inflation is going to exceed four or 5%. In fact, you know, if you take an average across all these bars, it's going to be something like 25, 30%. That is households and firms assign 25 to 30% probability that inflation is going to exceed four or 5%. And this is really striking because in the US in 2019, you didn't have this kind of inflation for 20, 30 years. And so, you know, if you're fully rational, you know, why would you think something like this can happen next year? You know, with one year ahead inflation expectations. Uh, now, eventually we know that households were better at predicting uh, this, but in real time, it seemed like, you know, households have no idea what has happened and they have really bad forecasts, but it's not true. Anyway, so what I want you to get from this is that uh, professional forecasters have like really anchored inflation expectations. They didn't think high inflation is possible. You look at households and firms and they thought high inflation is entirely possible. It's not an unreasonable scenario. They were happy to assign high probabilities to the scenarios. Now, why would something like this be, be there? You know, one possibility is that people just have different perceptions of reality. They have different perceptions of inflation. You know, you go to a store, you buy one consumption basket. I go to a store, buy a different consumption basket. And because of that, we have different perceptions of inflation. And as a result, we can have this big volatility in inflation rates just because sometimes I have expensive milk and you don't. Now, it's certainly true in the data, uh, not only for households, but also for firms. Now, there is a lot of disagreement about uh, past inflation. This is pre-COVID, okay? This is also pre-COVID. There is a lot of disagreement among managers about what the rate of inflation is. Some people thought it's zero, some people thought it's 10%. There is a lot of dispersion and actual inflation was just below 3%. Now, the reason why this figure is important is because if you have full information rational expectations, we can disagree about forecasts for a variety of reasons. But we should definitely agree on realizations. We should share information about the past, okay? Because, you know, this is publicly available information. You can go to the website of the statistical office. You can look up these numbers. It's published in newspapers. It's said on TV and radio. So it should not be a problem for people to report this number correctly. And yet we see big departures. Now, this is the most, re the most, most recent reading we have for this question. Uh, in the post-COVID recovery. And here you see even bigger dispersion of beliefs, perceptions about actual inflation. 
Some people say it's zero, one, some say it's 10, 15, actually it's five, um, much more disagreement. Okay, so this is not consistent with full information rational expectations. People should share information. They should definitely know their realizations of macroeconomic data. Here's another interesting metric for us uh, to think about. If you have uh, agents who have anchored inflation expectations, then one of the requirements for them should be that they should not revise their inflation expectations by a lot. So if you ask me what you already think inflation is going to be, and I tell you 5%, you ask me again next year what inflation is going to be. If I have anchored inflation expectations, I should tell you, okay, it's going to be 5%. So even if it's not uh, anchored at 2%, at least I don't vary this over time. I have a firm belief of where inflation is going to be. And you know something like this is true for professional forecasters. You see small revisions in their inflation expectations from you know one year to another. You look at households, huge variations. It's not unusual to see somebody who is changing his or her expectations by minus five percent or plus five percent. Firms again are somewhere in between, and it's not just short-term inflation expectations. This are field bars. It's also true for long-term inflation expectations. So when I ask somebody, what do you think inflation is going to be over the next five years? You know, people should basically say 2% <clears throat> because whatever happens today should have very little bearing on the future inflation. At least in the US, until recently, inflation was not terribly serially correlated at the annual frequency. It was a very small correlation. So it's as if inflation is white noise. And yet we see that households have extremely persistent inflation expectations. It's as if they think inflation is a random walk. And that's certainly not consistent with, uh, with anchored expectations. So it was the true data generating process we have uh, in, in the US. Uh, now, another useful statistic is uh, what is the correlation between short-term and long-term inflation expectations? And again, the logic here should be that we can have variation in one year had inflation expectations, short-term inflation expectations for all sorts of reasons. But it should not be correlated with what we think about long-term inflation expectations. Again, the reason is that whatever happens today should have no bearing on future inflation in five years, 10 years, because inflation is not serially correlated. Everybody should think it's going to be 2%. And so there should be zero correlation. You look at firms, households, firms, households, professional forecasters, and you see significant correlation. Now for professional forecasters, notice the scale is much, much smaller. So there is some variation there, but it's very, very concentrated. You look at households and firms, and here you have much more variation in these numbers. Now you may say, well, you know, probably this is reflecting the fact that uh, people have different views about where the inflation target is. Okay, so this may be one reason that can create this movement between short-term and long-term inflation expectations and one way one simple way to measure this is to ask people to report their perceptions of the fed inflation target this was done for firms uh, before covid they asked firms you know what do you think is the inflation target of the fed a third of people said we basically don't know then 20 percent of people said you know some philosophical spiel about you know what they think about the economy and monetary policy uh, all sorts of you know ideas some uh, conspiracy theories that you know it's run by such and such a group of people all sorts of problems um in any case so we can't really assign a numeric value to this response so you add this to bars and you have like 50 percent of people who have basically no idea what the uh, Fed is trying to do in terms of uh, inflation. And then you have somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of people who gave you a response within a you know, reasonable range between one and a half and two and a half percent. Others, uh, you know, were on an either upside or um, downside. Now, one <clears throat> uh, interpretation of this is to say, well, you know, people just don't take the Fed as credible and this is a problem. Uh, and Certainly, this is a possibility. Uh, I think a more likely explanation is that if you have low and stable inflation for so many years, people just don't care about monetary policy of the central bank. Keynes famously said that he wants to have 
economic policy as boring as dentistry. So you go to a dentist and you don't care you know, what this person is doing with your teeth. You know everything is going to be fine in the end and you don't know about uh, techniques, all sorts of steps that are necessary to deliver the desired results. Maybe we have the same situation. Most people just don't think it's important. Now, whether it's true or not, um, it, it remains to be seen, but you know, as a stylized fact, we know that in countries with low and stable inflation, it's much less likely to find people who know much about monetary policy. Now, if you go to Ukraine, I'm sure, or other countries with high inflation, it's much more likely that people will know that there is a national bank, uh, central bank, it has monetary policy, it does something, it prints money. They will know lots and lots of things about monetary policy. So this is not in our DNA not to know anything about monetary policy. This is really a function of you know how much we can get out of this. It's a matter of incentives. Now, let me summarize this finance I had uh, so far. We have predictions about how anchored inflation expectations should look like. For example, they should be close to the target. The people should disagree, not disagree too much. They should not revise their beliefs. Uh, People should assign low probabilities to extreme events. Their short-term and long-term inflation expectations should be basically uncorrelated. You look at the data and you see none of this is true in the US. Okay. Now, one line of argument we can use is basically Prescott saying, well, you know, this is just noise. People don't know what they're doing, uh, just pure noise, uh, but it's not true. You look at the quality of inflation expectations for different groups of uh, agents in the economy. And this is for firms, and uh, we see this, you know, clear positive relationship here. This is kind of quality of uh, perceptions. This is quality of inflation expectations. And if you have firms who have strong incentives to have good inflation perceptions and forecasts, they will do that. Okay. This is this group of people. If you have firms who don't have very strong incentives, for example, they don't go into reset prices for a long time. Why would you care about inflation? It just consumes your resources to collect and process this information if you're not going to use it. You're going to have bad perceptions of inflation and also bad inflation forecasts. So it's not just noise. Now, how much difference it can make for policy? Let me use the COVID uh, dynamics. Uh, I'm sorry, post the uh, Great Recession uh, and post COVID um, dynamics to highlight the differences. Uh, you know, at this time, uh, many central banks uh, struggled with the zero lower bound. And so you have to use unconventional policy tools. And Mario Draghi was basically summarizing how this works. You know, nominal rate is fixed at zero. You can't do much there, but you can raise inflation expectations. And if you do this, the real rate is going to decrease. This is going to stimulate investment, employment, and so on. That's how it's kind of going to work. So as inflation is a good thing. It's going to stimulate the economy. Now, is this really how people think about these issues? Uh, do they really believe that you know, more inflation is a good thing for them? And uh, I will use COVID to illustrate this. This is professional forecasters, how they uh, revise their beliefs as the crisis was unfolding. So just before the COVID started, they think inflation is going to be 2%. And they predicted that output is going to expand you know, somewhere between 2 and 3%. Now, as the scale of the COVID disaster was becoming more and more clear, we see that they start to change their beliefs and move in this direction. So in June 2020, they said, okay, we're going to have relatively low inflation and we will have a huge uh, economic contraction. So it's as if they think it's a demand-driven shock, right? We have so much slack in the economy, it's going to push inflation down, and uh, this will be the dynamics for us. Now you look at households and you see a very different dynamic. You start, first of all, with high inflation expectations. That's not unusual, we discussed this before. And then you start to move in this direction. So as people revise their beliefs of macroeconomy down, they think we have a big problem in the economy they raise inflation expectations. They're going in this direction rather than decrease. Okay, so these guys are decreasing inflation expectations. These guys are increasing inflation expectations. So this is demand-driven crisis. This is supply-driven crisis, stagflationary, if you will. We have high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. 
So people have a kind of a dark view of inflation. Here they say it's all demand driven. We can handle this. Now, this is not just you know, obvious from this dynamic. You can look at other metrics. And uh, this figure, this data come from the daily survey of the Cleveland Fed, which is really cool. The black line is expected inflation measured at the daily frequency, but I'm going to use a five day uh, moving average. And the red line is what happens with uh, the saving rate. You know, This is the share of income that people want to set aside. And what you should see here is that generally there's a positive correlation between these two lines, which is telling us when inflation is high, people are not willing to consume. They want to save. That is people withdraw from consumption. They don't take inflation as a good thing. And you can see this in other metrics. Uh, for example, fear of losing the job. Okay? So this is a really bad scenario. Positive correlation. Storm of food and supplies, right? So create reserves. Similar story. Refrain from purchases of items. Uh, uh, similar story. You don't want to buy a durable good or anything like this. So people think inflation is a bad uh, state of the world. Now, this is during COVID, but it applies more generally. Uh, and to kind of visualize this for you, I'm going to focus professional forecasters and households. This is professional forecasters over many, many years in the US. And uh, I take out forecaster fixed effects. I also take out period fixed effects. So everything is going to be normalized around zero here and zero here. Now this figure is telling you that if you pick a person who has above average inflation expectations, this person is going to have above average expectations for the gross rate of output. So it's as if you have some notion of the Phillips curve out there, which is downward sloping, and you have demand-driven shocks. Okay, you have more output, that's going to generate more inflation. You have below average output, you're going to have a disinflation. Okay, so very clear upward sloping relationship. Now you look at households and it has a very different relationship. You have inflation expectations above average, you're somewhere here. This is going to be a below average predictions for the gross rate of output, okay? So people think inflation is stagflationary. They think it's the bad state of the world. And by the way, if you look at surveys of households in, in Ukraine, that's going to be exactly the same thing. Nobody in, in Ukraine thinks inflation is a good thing. So when we think about stimulating the economy, we should never ever say that we're going to raise inflation to stimulate output. It's not going to be helpful, it will backfire will reduce consumption, not increase consumption. Now, remember, I kept telling you that firms are going to be in between professional forecasters to households. Uh, and it's true in, in this data as well. Here for the US, uh, we have a much smaller sample. So it's not as uh, kind of clear as we see uh, for other types of evidence. But broadly, they don't take inflation as, as a good thing. Now, this is not just the US. You can look at other countries, developed countries. France, Netherlands, New Zealand, Spain, Germany, France, and you know, all those countries, the same relationship for professional forecasters, upward sloping, upward sloping, upward sloping. So everybody, people think that inflation uh, and uh, GDP are driven by demand side shocks. And, and this is true, by the way, if you go and do a DSG model or VER or something like this and see what kind of shocks are driving business cycles in these countries, it's true that most of the variation is coming from demand side shocks and so this is not a crazy um, belief you look at households and you see a very different picture okay so again i showed this to you before this is other countries again everywhere you have this very sharp downward sloping relationship this is telling us that you know what we have in our model is not necessarily <clears throat> a good description of how uh, consumers and firms uh, are thinking about macroeconomic developments or policy. And so we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that full information racial expectations is, is a convenient theoretical tool, but it's probably not a good description of how people are thinking about the economy. And so we have to develop our policies, including inflation targeting, in light of this way of how people are forming their inflation expectations, if we want to really want to use inflation expectations as a policy tool. Now, to summarize, Full information racial expectations is, is a huge success in, in macro, right? So it, it was really a huge revolution and uh, it has uh, the deserved prominence in our models. Uh, but we should also understand that 
that in the survey data, uh, we have massive departures from full information rational expectations. Now, how we should deal with this? You know, should we develop better models? Or should we discount uh, this uh, survey evidence? Um, I leave this up to you. Uh, but the current work is basically trying to come up with models where you have enough discipline to be uh, for models useful. So kind of have this core from fire that you have a lot of discipline from this theory can be right in only one way. Uh, well, if you departure from this, you can have so many different departures. You, you have no discipline. So you want to preserve that you know, beauty of the theory that you can be uh, you know, constrained by the model very, very tightly so that it has a lot of predictive power. Uh, but at the same time, you, have, you want to have some flexibility to explain what is happening with inflation expectations and other expectations in the survey data. Um, now, how you can make progress uh, for this in terms of theory. Well, we have lots and lots of models of how people uh, form expectations. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ed Prescott famously said when he was uh, describing the state of business cycle research that, you know, we have beautiful models, but the, the, the data are lagging. We, we have something like this with inflation expectations and I guess in general macroeconomic expectations. We have beautiful models, but we're we have data lag and we have to come up with um, better uh, surveys, for example. And uh, as Bernanke said, we really need surveys of inflation expectations, not just for households, and, uh, but also for firms. And by the way, I want to praise the National Bank of Ukraine for running surveys of households and firms. The NBU is really among one uh, of the few central banks that has a long running survey, high quality survey that is, I'm sure, very useful for policy. Now, once we have this and we have this, we can iterate between models and uh, tests. And, uh, you know, we come up with a theory, we take it to the data. If it works, it's, it's great. If it doesn't work, we go back to the drawing board and try to come up with a different model and keep iterating until we converge to the, to the right model. So this is work for us, for academics. Uh, but for policy, I want to highlight um, several issues here. Um, one is that we should understand that people have massive inattention uh, in general and specifically to, to policy makers. Uh, it's less of an issue in Ukraine because inflation is high uh, and you know, we have war and, and, and so it's clearly, uh, not the case that people don't pay attention to what the National Bank of Ukraine is doing. But, you know, once the times are going to be calmer, we should appreciate that people are not paying a ton of attention to what the central banks are doing. And so when we think about our policies, we have to really try to capture the attention of people uh, within the time where we have. Uh, we should also understand that there are massive frictions uh, in terms of how people form expectations, how they get information, how they process this. For example, there is this fascinating research saying that IQ is uh, a strong predictor of the quality of inflation expectations. Uh, I'm not sure we can do anything about this. We can't change IQ, but we should understand that there are different agents in the economy. Somebody may be very quick to understand what the NBU is going to do. And some people will have a really hard time thinking through the implications of NBU policies. We should also appreciate the fact that people can think differently uh, about you know, what is happening in the economy. For example, during COVID, most people thought inflation is a terrible sin. Professional forecasters and policymakers saw that inflation is a good sin. And you know, once you have this heterogeneity, different agents in the economy, it's important to understand that different people are going to think about these issues differently and maybe at different speeds. And so if we want to have a successful policy, we have to take into account that we have this heterogeneity in the economy. Now, in light of this, what we should do, we should be very simple and direct. And I keep telling that, you know, the Twitter is kind of the best way to think about this. You have 140, maybe 200 characters. This is how you should communicate with the general public kind of very brief messages up to the point, be as concise as, as possible uh, when you communicate with the general public, because otherwise you're not going to get their attention. Try to give them a holistic perspective. We're doing X because of Y to make sure that this misinterpretation is not an issue because people come up with their own 
serious of what is happening and why. And so it's important to guide them in terms of thinking about what is happening in the economy and why policies are moving in a certain direction. Um, I will focus on targets rather than instruments. Uh, what does it mean? You know, if we want to say we want to have low and stable inflation, this is our target, we should not be talking about how we're going to achieve this. We should not be talking about this is going to be the policy rate, this is going to be the lending facility and so on. Think about dentists, right? So they're not telling you what they're going to do exactly. They just tell you everything is going to be fine and then you will have healthy tears. Just trust us. Okay, uh, I think it should be the same approach for central banks. They should say, we're going to deliver eventual low and stable inflation for you. It will take some time, it will be a challenge, but we don't need to go into all sorts of details about how we're going to deliver this. And finally, um, if we really want to manage expectations, which is a key ingredient for any policy regime, including inflation targeting, uh, we, we have to have good measurement of inflation expectations. We have to have a better sense of where the economy is going, why it's going. And so we have to build this infrastructure uh, to make sure that we can have kind of real time assessments of what is happening in the economy and what people think about the future dynamic. Otherwise we may be operating at the blind and, and this is not a good state. And the last point is, as I told you, uh, people have very uh, short spans of attention. Uh, we should not expect people to listen to just one press conference and remember this for the rest of their lives. It's not going to happen. We have to have sustained campaigns. Think about this, this is you know, a marketing campaign. If you want to sell your product, you have to be consistently present uh, on TV and radio, newspapers and so on. It should be the same with policy making, you should be constantly talking to the general public, trying to convince them what you do is uh, this objective or, or, or you know, this is what we're going to do in terms of policy. Let me stop here and thank you again for having me uh, at the conference. Uh, thank you, Yuri, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we are ready to take uh, questions uh, from from the audience. Uh, I would like uh, to answer one of the uh, questions raised uh, um, that uh, uh, the seminar or workshop will, will be available. Uh, the record of the seminar will be available on the NBU website. Um, so uh, one question is uh, about the relationship of expected output growth and expected inflation, is it really holds uh, like a real line relations or it could be non-linear after some amount of shocks? All right, so the figure I showed to you is a bin scatter plot. So basically you create uh, bins of the horizontal axis. You group say 50 observations into one, you calculate an average. And then for this bin, you calculate the average value in terms of the vertical axis. And, and so it compresses a lot of heterogeneity. It kind of gives you maybe a, a distorted sense of how much fit you have uh, in the data. Uh, so it's kind of one caveat. Another caveat is that what we did there was based on historical data. And so historically it looks approximately linear, but if you have more shocks, uh, different environments, you may find something nonlinear. Just with this data, uh, you can't reject the null that it's approximately linear. Thank you. Uh, we have a, uh, another question uh, from the audience. Uh, consumption and, invest and investment are concentrated. Arguably, the expectations of the right tail of agents accounting for a large share of aggregate consumption and investment are what matter most. Is there any evidence that the expectations of high wealth, income households, and CEOs are closer to expectations of professional forecasters? If so, are the expectations of the average household and CEO less important for business cycles and policy transmission? Thank you. You know, one example of uh, what CEOs of big companies are maybe thinking, uh, Elon Musk, I don't think he had a, a Twitter uh, about his inflation expectations, but I'm sure if you ask him what inflation is going to be, he will give you some unusual number, not necessarily what is predicted by professional forecasters. Now, more seriously, when you look at the quality of inflation forecast by the size of the firm, 
uh, you know, larger firms uh, probably weekly better, but they are not close to professional forecasters. The same is true for households. You have highly educated people who have better inflation forecasts. I mentioned the high AQ people have better inflation forecasts, but you know, these people are like 10% of the economy, 20% of the economy, you still have 80% of the economy that has inflation expectations, not really close to full information or rational expectations. So my point is that it's true that there is a group of people who has high uh, quality expectations, but it doesn't mean we have to discount others because they still account for a big chunk of the economy. Okay, and uh, we have uh, several uh, questions from the panelists. Uh, may I advise, uh, invite Michne? Many thanks, Yuri. This was a very good overview of, of so many things that we're, we're trying to wrap our heads around. I, I have a question that connects two slides on, uh, at, at different positions in your, uh, in your presentation. One of them shows us that high inflation uh, is associated with higher savings rate or higher uh, uh, estimation of losing a job or it's generally a barometer, let's say it's, it's a measure of how bad the economy might go. And the other one is uh, the Mario Draghi uh, uh, explanation on why QE works or is expected to work. Now, of course, it's, it's not the place to discuss this, but if you expect, if you're at the zero lower bound, you expect inflation to go up, you think you're going to lose your job, you're not necessarily going to go get a credit. Now, I don't know if this is the same or not for firms, you showed a lot of heterogeneity, but I would presume that for some firms, especially the ones that are tight margin and so on and so forth, high inflation is not necessarily good. So again, they're not gonna take credits. So how do we reconcile in a sense, these two, these two pieces of information? Two pieces that firms don't think in high inflation is a good thing? No, that, that households and firms would, look at inflation as a bad sign and mm -hmm. at the zero lower bound or at least what we had before they would not necessarily see these uh negative real rates as a reason to invest consume buy house buy buy stuff so is there something that that's that's perhaps missing in this in, in this connection between these two yeah, so one thing which may be connecting this to is financial markets. The financial markets are rational and they think that high inflation expectations eventually benefit households. Maybe this will result in lower interest rates. And so this will be, uh, this will make it easier for the banks and other lenders uh, to lower interest rates for households and firms. And so these guys will look at nominal rates and they'll say, well, actually, you know what? Uh, my house, buying a house is more affordable, buying a new factor is more affordable through, through this channel, so you can still stimulate the economy. Um, I think the, the key point is that what people think and what is happening in the economy, there is this distance. And so somebody has to close this. And you know maybe financial markets is one way to do this, but there could be other channels how this works. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And uh, the floor is goes to Rifat uh, Oh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. Um, Yuri, sorry. wonderful and wonderfully and eloquently delivered as always. Um, so I also think that surveys correctly capture people's and firms' true expectations. Having said that, um, it then becomes a puzzle. How is it that given the crazy expectations, inflation was so stable. That is somehow these people actually expect inflation to be 5%, but they're happy to raise their own prices by 2% and accept wage increases of one and a half percent and whatnot. So how did those two things square? Um, it's a great question. I don't have a, a, I think a super convincing answer, but my view how this works is, is like this. If you think the world is flat, locally it's true. And so the price of a mistake is small. You may say, well, you know, 2%, 3%, not a big deal. So I'm happy to accept 2%, even though I think it's 5%. And from this, you're not going to suffer massively. If you in Turkey or in Ukraine and you think inflation is 5% and you <laughs> raise your prices by 2%, obviously this is a big mistake. And then eventually you will be punished by the markets and you will change your beliefs and change your behavior. But in low and stable inflation environments, like in the US, you know, if you on average raise prices by 
it's not a big deal. By the way, so one thing I also wanted to emphasize is that there is a big discrepancy between uh, what kind of expectations people have about their personal situation and what they think about the aggregate economy. For example, for firms, if they ask you, if you ask them, what do you think inflation is going to be at the aggregate level, they'll tell you like 5%, 3%, some, some number that is unreasonable by many metrics. If you ask them, you know, what is going to happen with your personal unit cost or with your wages or prices of your competitors, the quality of those responses is going to be much, much, much higher. So locally on their island, they have a good idea of what is happening, but they don't care about the broader economy because it's too complicated or not really related to what they do immediately. And so if you think, you know, the world is flat on your local island, you know, it's totally fine to assume 5% inflation and then raise prices by two because everybody around you is raising prices by 2%. Okay. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, we have several questions from the audience yet, uh, and I um, want to say sorry in advance if someone is not answered uh, uh, right now. But I uh, would uh, take uh, a question from David Archer, which is quite interesting for me um, as a practitioner. Um, and a person who is also involved in analyzing inflation uh, expectation surveys. So are there any good ways of extracting expectations from behavior rather than relying on what people say? For example, what assumptions about inflation do small businesses make explicitly or implicitly when budgeting or writing contracts? All right, so uh, there is some work uh, using actions to infer inflation expectations. For example, you can look at the consumption oil equation and you could say, given the consumption growth and the current nominal interest rate, this is what people should be thinking about inflation. And so this is one way to do this. Uh, and you know, this is a reasonable approach, but we should also understand that this approach assumes that there is a model which is making a connection for us between the actions of the people and what they think is going to uh, this mean in, term of, in terms of inflation expectations. If you have our own model, obviously this is not going to work. And, and so it's not a kind of free lunch kind of solution. You, you have to impose some structure if you want to use this, this approach. Thank you. And I think the last question may be, um, to make inflation expectations from backward-looking adaptive to forward-looking adaptive and learning, uh, what do you recommend uh, would be uh, the best persistent communication policies, direct, directly through the best press conferences uh, or maybe uh, through indirect channels of communications? So, you know, we economists believe in division of labor. Uh, I'm not sure we will ever, you know, we professional economists be very good at marketing campaigns, explaining to people, you know, why they should be more forward looking, why they should not be backward looking. Uh, and so it should be done by somebody who is very good at this. And, you know, we don't have a marketing department in the National Bank of Ukraine or Bank of Turkey or the Fed. Uh, but maybe we can hire somebody who is going to help us to reach the general public and explain to them that they should be more forward looking, the life is not as bad as many people think, and some inflation may be actually a good thing. I'm again sorry for those who didn't receive uh, the answers for their questions, but we are really running out of time. And thank you, Yuri, very much for participating in our workshop. Uh, and thank you for being a good friend for Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we are moving to the third session. Uh, it's uh, inflation targeting with Brian credibility. Uh, the issue of credibility is very vital for inflation targeting. You know, this motto of inflation targeting, do what you uh, say what you are doing and do what you're saying. So it's all about credibility. And uh, actually, uh, if everything goes good and, 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 and smoothly, so that's uh, not what you're thinking about uh, your credibility but if you have a shock so it's better to have a credibility because it really makes things uh, easier for monetary policy 
because uh, you know uh, what we mean by by credibility in terms of monetary policy it's where well anchored inflation expectations and what that's what helps uh, the, to the central bank to to avoid uh, very uh, adverse developments in times of crisis uh, when you have uh, like for, for 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 people in times of crisis is quite rational to to rush to buy uh, goods to buy uh, foreign currency to withdraw money from the banks and what could prevent uh, them for, for doing it it's actually the credibility of central bank which is uh, makes things easier uh we have uh, uh quite uh let's say uh, the, the different uh, to different topics of presentations, but all related uh, to the issues of uh, inflation expectations and credibility of central banks. So uh, uh, our panelists are uh, uh, Refet Gurkenyak. So welcome, Refet. Uh, Federica Strutzenerger. Hi, Federico. Uh, Carlos Carvalho. Hello. And we have uh, Oleg Karinok. Hello. So the schedule of this uh, panel is uh, follows. I, um, I will give the floor to the participants to present for uh, 15 minutes. Then we will have a Q&A session and then uh, some discussion uh, around the topics of credibility and uh, expectations. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, Refet. Uh, so Refet, Refet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, let, let me get my slides to the right place first. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here for two reasons. This is a very nice conference and also uh, gives a sense of um, being able to support uh, my Ukrainian friends. Now, um, this is a sad paper from a personal perspective and a fascinating one from a professional one. Um, as you may know, Turkey has undertaken a rather crazy monetary policy experiment. And you may have heard of this in the past year or so, but it's been going on for a decade. And this kind of experiment is terrible when you are a citizen being experimented on, but it's fascinating when you are a macroeconomist looking for identifying variation. And a good way of putting this, um, in the words of Eduard Chalet, who discussed this paper, is we assess our monetary policy models in two ways. One is the Cristiano Icombe Evans way, where there's a monetary policy rule. And we think of how the economy responds when, are, when there are shocks to that rule. Okay. The other one is the Kledega de Grotter way, which is where the rule itself is changing. And you ask what happens when there is a new monetary policy framework. The CGG framework, of course, was mostly concerned with the gain in the credibility of the Fed with the Volcker disinflation. Okay. So we're going to ask a reverse question. Imagine that you had a central bank that was credible, that was doing good monetary policy, um, and these models, of course, identify good monetary policy with uh, satisfying the Taylor principle, right? And then you shift to a framework where you no longer satisfy the Taylor principle. What happens then, okay? Our macro models have fairly clear implications about what will happen. Our data doesn't quite have much to say about this because I would say, luckily, given the Turkish experience, most countries has not uh, followed such let me not call it insane, but at least bizarre policies. Okay. Now that we have this, uh, we can talk about you know, what happens if you follow a policy where the central bank essentially isn't allowed to raise interest rates for a decade. Okay. Now, this then is going to whet your appetite, uh, hopefully to read the paper itself. Um, the paper has a lot in it. So I'm gonna go a little bit over the main points and then we'll try to highlight a few of these. Okay. One of them is the discussion of the New officiarian effect. We wrote the first draft of this paper. And then in presenting, we realized that we don't quite understand how it is that 
the new Fisher effect. That is, if you lower interest rates now, inflation will go down now. That's the new Fisher effect, okay? Which is clearly in contradiction to the standard, you know, Taylor principle-based DSG model. Is consistent with the Fisher effect, which is if nominal interest rates are lower at steady state, given the marginal product of capital and the growth rate of the economy that exogenously determines the real rate, inflation will have to be lower in the steady state. Okay, If one is violated, how is the other one true? So the paper now has a um, nice and accessible discussion of this. And I'd like to spend a minute on this, which I will. Then we talk about what the hell was going on in Turkey. This is useful for, I would say, three reasons. One of them is, I think, you know, everyone should know something about Turkey because it's a great country. But the second one is, um, regardless of whether you're a monetary economist, macroeconomist, if you're any kind of applied economist, you're always looking for exogenous changes in stuff. Okay, and and usually we're happy to have you know tiny exogenous changes, and and Turkey has this experiment where you know we had this huge exogenous change that was very long lasting. Okay, and we are able to actually show that this indeed was exogenous. Okay, so it wasn't driven by, in particular, fiscal policy pressure. Right, and the third reason is it's useful for our purposes because we are interested in the dimensions of our macro models that are usually not tested. What happens when you don't satisfy um, basic deterministic conditions? Okay, in that world, then we're going to go and begin to ask a bunch of questions, such as. Um, as you know, one of the things when you're teaching, say, uh, economics to undergraduates for the first time, um, one of the beautiful things is the law of one price, internationally known as purchasing power parity, and very much like the expectations hypothesis, where, uh, you know, human mind wants to say, yeah, 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 you know, obviously that has to be the case, and the data detests this, right, you know, PPP is violated every which way, but in general, when we test PPP, you know, we're looking at two countries where, yeah, you know, inflation in the UK is 1.9%, in the US is 2.1%. You know, let's see whether the exchange rate depreciated by 0.2%. Okay. In those small fluctuations, very much along the line as Yuri was talking about in his talk and in the QA, you know, um, errors aren't very costly and adjustment costs might be large enough. So the real question is, imagine that one of these countries has, you know, 2% inflation and the other one has 40, right? What happens to PPP then, right? And we're going to show that PPP actually works very well in the data when you're looking at turkey-sized, you know, experiments and inflation deviations, okay? Then we're going to say that also carries then to the Misi-Rogov stuff where you can actually use inflation to forecast exchange rates and indeed you can beat the random walk and have better forecast of inflation than random walk using the inflation information, right? Um, we're then going to say, you know, look, um, these changes in Turkey were happening in an environment where in general institutional quality was deteriorating. That's not going to surprise any of you. Um, then we're going to estimate the Taylor rule and say it sucked. We're going to show that it used to satisfy the Taylor principle and then began to not satisfy it. And then the coefficient became not significantly different from zero. That Taylor rule estimation has various issues where um, you know, Carvalho and Nekio had some beautiful things to say about. We're not gonna have time to have that debate, but these are really interesting questions to think about how one should go about estimating that, okay? And then we're gonna begin to say, okay, now that we have, um, established that Turkey has not been satisfying the Taylor principle, and we see that inflation has gone through the roof. Is this consistent with our models? Okay. The problem, of course, is our standard standard model is going to say, when you don't satisfy the Taylor principle, the world is indeterminate. So anything is consistent with the model. Okay. But we're going to take that and tweak it, where the world is eventually determinate but with periods of weak and strong monetary policy where it's a regime switching world, in the weak regime, you're not satisfying the Taylor principle, in the strong regime, you are. And it's rigged such that overall, there is determinacy. 
But then we get to ask, you know, if you're dealing with the same inflation shock in the weak regime versus strong regime, what happens? Okay. It's not going to surprise you that the model is going to find, you know, if you are hit by an inflation shock in the weak regime, inflation will go through the roof, which is what we see. And then um, the other thing we're going to do is to say this regime switching, this is fine, but there are better ways to think about this. And we're not terribly proud of having introduced this in the Turkish context, but very much like we are now so used to thinking about models with the effect of lower bound. You can also imagine a model with the effect of upper bound, where the central bank is not allowed to raise interest rates above a threshold. This, of course, unlike the lower bound, is not a, um, in a sense, physical constraint. It's not a participation constraint properly. It really is a political constraint. But this is going to become more and more important um, because central banks are unable to raise rates due to financial stability concerns, fiscal policy concerns, whatnot. You know, UK might be a good example of this in the recent past. What happens then? Okay. And, um, and then lastly, we're going to have a bunch of event studies where we're going to say, you know, look, on the day where this happened, here is the response of the financial markets. Right after that happened, this is what happened to inflation. You know, when the central bank began to cut interest rates, the market rates began to go through the roof. Um, and those are hopefully interesting on their own, right? Okay. So the one bit that I really spend a um, few of my precious moments is properly understanding how the new Keynesian model and the new Fisherian effect relate to each other. There's a lot of mumbo jumbo on this, um, along with some subtle thinking. And I think one of the sad things is people who should know better often talk about the new Fisherian effect um, in the same sentence with the MMT. Th these are not related either way. And importantly, one of them actually does have decent theory behind it. The new Fisherian effect is something that is theoretically possible and may happen in a you know, properly macro-founded model in an internally consistent way. MMT has no such claim to you know, being reasonable in any world. Here is how things work. This is your Fisher equation that says the nominal interest rate is the real interest rate plus expected inflation. OK, fine. This is not economic theory. This is a definition of the real interest rate and has to be correct at all times. It has to be correct at steady state too. Thus, at steady state, the nominal interest rate will be the real rate plus steady state inflation. And we're going to take it to be the inflation target. Fine. Then comes the argument that at the steady state, the real rate is exogenous to policy which most our macro models and most here is like you know, 99 and a half percent will say, yes, that is the case, okay? In which case it is the case that if the steady state nominal rate is lower, inflation will also have to be lower. And, and that's the Fisher effect, that's there, all right. Now, that Fisher effect has been well understood for decades and decades. The neo Fisher effect says essentially, well, we have a Phillips curve in our, New Keynesian model, and that Phillips curve relates current inflation to future inflation. If you are able to commit to lower interest rates forever, that implies that the steady state interest rate will, will have to be lower. The steady state inflation rate will have to be lower. But if that future inflation rate is going to be lower, through the Phillips curve, through forward-looking inflation adjustment, inflation today will be lower. Okay, And that's the new Fisherian effect. There's theory of this, mostly developed by um, Uribe, and Uribe himself and Uribe and Schmidt Groy have various empirical work that says we see this in the data too. Okay, so what gives? And this is something that is very precious for countries like Turkey because, you know, if you're able to lower inflation by lowering interest rates, not doing so would be fairly idiotic. Um, and then you can also see that we have tried and didn't quite work out that way. Right. Okay. So why not? Okay. So the good way of thinking about the new Fisherian effect is through the Taylor rule. And the Taylor rule says, well, the Taylor rule says the interest rate is governed by the real rate plus, right? So this bit here is the steady state nominal rate. The, okay. It's not steady state because this is RT. So it's going to be the real rate 
plus the inflation target plus I've simplified this. I could have put in the output gap in there too, but we just have cluttered the notation. Right? It all depends on this phi pi. Right? We all understand that when phi pi is greater than one in this world, we're gonna have determinacy. Okay. Now imagine that I start from a world where inflation is higher than the target, which is the case where I want to disinflate. Right? Okay. Now what happens if IT is permanently lower? It's important to notice that this equation continues to hold, okay? This describes the setting of the policy rate at all times. So if IT is permanently lower, something on the right-hand side will have to be permanently lower too. What is it going to be? Well, it can't be the shock because this is a mean zero shock by definition and it cannot be permanently anything. It has to be on average zero, right? Okay. It may be that phi bar is lower. Okay, what would happen then? Phi bar, the inflation target is lower. It brings down through the Phillips curve, actual inflation, current inflation lower with it too. So this parenthetical term is unchanged. Okay, so no effect on the nominal rate, but notice that phi bar is also here. So phi bar goes down, IT goes down. This is what makes the new Fisherian effect model consistent. That is what could happen is you're gonna go out and say, inflation target is lower and you are actually credible. Therefore, expectations of steady state inflation goes down. With that, actually inflation goes down. Hence, you are able to lower the nominal rate today without changing the real rate. And this is model consistent, okay? But notice the argument that works through being able to lower the expected steady state inflation to its effect on lowering the nominal rate. The Neofisherian argument is the reverse. It says, by announcing that you have lowered the nominal rate, you're gonna lower inflation. Can it work? Well, if people infer that steady state inflation is going to be lower, it would work. The better question is, what if they decide that steady state inflation is not going to be lower? You end up with just lower nominal rates. What happens then? This still has to be satisfied. And the only way it's going to be satisfied is if phi pi is lower, okay? So effectively, you are announcing that you're a central bank that is not going to react to inflation, which is why the nominal rate is lower now. In which case, you're not gonna end up with new Fisherian disinflation, but you're gonna end up with new Keynesian indeterminacy. Those two things are related, okay? So good, okay. Now we're gonna move on and I'm actually going to stop in a minute, but the point is going to be this. The Turkish ex experiment, and we can actually statistically date this, begins in 2010, okay? That is a period where debt to GDP is 40% and is declining. There is no, and you know, not only debt to GDP was low and reducing, the markets actually saw this as being very good fiscal policy. So you, this is reflected in the CDS spreads too. There is no way of relating the pressure on the monetary policy to fiscal impetus, okay? It really was A, a political desire for expansionary policy, B, a misguided learning of policy where in 2009, when we cut the policy rate from 23% to 8%, we grew like crazy because we were doing proper counter cyclical demand management in the thick of the, global financial crisis. And from that, the government concluded that you cut rates, you grow without inflation, okay? Didn't quite understand the implications about potential and you know, demand deficiency. And lastly, you know, politically, personally, whatever, uh, the prime minister at the time and the president now was convinced that the only good interest rate is the low interest rate, okay? But those are the things that make this exogenous monetary policy changes, okay? Now, so then we can check a whole bunch of things on, you know, look, this is the exchange rate of various emerging market economies. You know, Brazil is here um, among many others against the dollar. This is Turkey. This is the sense in which this began in 2010, okay? Um, you know, this is inflation. It's not gonna surprise you that those two things were diverging together and that's your PPP. So we can show those things, okay? that PPP actually applies when the inflation differentials are large enough. I'm gonna skip these ones 
and briefly tell you that you estimate a Taylor rule and you end up with this. This is your phi pi. This was statistically larger than one, at least you couldn't reject the null that it was statistically larger than one before 2010-ish, you know, the financial crisis gets a bit iffy, but then afterwards, you know, it's not larger than one, then it's not really different from zero either, okay? And this is what makes this world in the eyes of the new Keynesian model indeterminate. How do we deal with this? We move to a model where it's the standard new Keynesian three equation model, except that we allow for regime shifts in the Taylor rule coefficient, okay? So there is a weak policy regime and a strong policy regime. What happens? You get the same inflation shock that in the strong policy regime, inflation goes up, comes back down fast. In the weak regime, it goes up like crazy and comes back down much slower, okay? So you lose control over inflation. Even better is to say, what happens if I have a effective upper bound where you follow your Taylor rule when you can, but then once you hit the upper bound, you're constrained by the upper bound, okay? This is the upper bound. If you didn't have the upper bound, you would have raised the policy rate and controlled inflation. When you are bound by the upper bound, inflation once again goes through the roof, okay? Now, the sense is here, if I had asked you, you know, imagine a country, not easy to do, that has decided to keep policy rates low forever and lower inflation by lowering the policy rate. What would happen to the exchange rate? What would happen to inflation? I think you would all would have said, inflation is going to go through the roof and the country's currency is going to depreciate like crazy, okay? That statement is actually economic theory. It's based on your training that is rooted in this model. And I'm telling you that that model is correct and therefore you're correct, okay? So that's what we have to say. And then we have a whole bunch of, right? So this sentence, I think I'm very fond of. The new Keynesian model is good in analyzing good policy, but it turns out it's also very good in analyzing inane policy, right? Um, then you have a whole bunch of event studies that I'm not gonna show you, but I hope you're gonna look at it because it's very illuminating. But that's the paper and that's, what we learn about credibility, monetary policy, and loss of credibility after you have gained it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's really impressive. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are going to the second presentation. Uh, so, Federica, please, the floor is yours. Excellent. Can can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent, excellent. I'm a little bit far away because I'm in Buenos Aires, so I'm kind of in a different hemisphere, but it's a, it's a real honor to be able to be here in this uh, trying times for Ukraine. So it's, it's, it's a real pleasure and uh, very happy to be here. And actually, by the way, I have to say that I worked at the Central Bank of Ukraine back in 1994. I don't know if you were born at that, at that time. But um, at the time, the governor was uh, Viktor Shushenko, and, and kind of it also was a very a moment of a lot of turmoil in Ukraine, as it was detaching from from the Soviet Union. So, so it was uh, very interesting, and it's it's so it's it's a little bit like coming back in, in some in some way for me on a personal level. And of course, there are a lot of similarities, you know, between Argentina and Ukraine, even though we're far away, not only in its agricultural production being, being an important part of the economy, but also in, in cultural cultural and, and macroeconomic instability. You know, we both had our episodes of debt defaults and, and relatively high inflation and IMF programs over the last decade. So, so I think I, I feel very much related. And, and certainly I feel related to the topic that you have suggested us to talk about, which is about the credibility and the and the dangers of losing credibility and what have we learned, particularly those which have gone through the experience of a monetary policy, of living through monetary policy experiences where credibility has been put in danger. So, so I'll try to share a little bit my experiences on that here with, with you today, okay? And um, as I was uh, thinking about uh, this talk, I... I first uh, remembered a literature, which is not from monetary policy, but uh, you'll see the connection I'll do in a minute, which um, basically is the literature on sovereign debt. 
And uh, when, when countries default on their debt, typically they turn not to be very strongly penalized for these uh, episodes of defaults. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, how much spreads increase in the year immediately after the default, it's about 400 basis points, but that spread, that additional spread goes down to 250 in the second year, and it's basically zero in the third year. If you ask yourself how quick can a country resume access uh, to financial markets, it's typically between zero and two years, so these kinds of exclusion lags are not very, not very long. We can find them in the data. And actually, if you think about how fast an economy or a government resumes net borrowing from foreign creditors, while that was about five years in the 1980s, it fell to four years in the 1990s, and it's uh, less than three years in the 2000s. So, so that exclusion from the market is also not, not very significant. So the question is, why, why is that? And the... Um, there's a paper in, in 1998 by Grossman and Huick, and they talked about excusable defaults. And basically their idea was that debt, even though it's a debt contract, to some extent sovereign debt operates as an equity contract. And when there's a particular problem for the sovereign, things get restructured and it's understood that it's a normal thing of the, of the, of the contract. And, the, and somehow it's justified the country does that restructuring, okay? Um, so their idea was that because uh, when countries are hit with a shock, it makes sense for them to restructure. That's the reason that these restructurings, restructurings happen. And then we don't see a very strong punishment from the government, from the, sorry, from the market. Of course, there are examples. Argentina is always an example of all the bad things. Two years ago, we restructured a debt, which was 25% of GDP and had an average interest rate of 5%. So we went ahead with a very aggressive restructuring of that debt. And the, the markets viewed that as a non-excusable non default. And what happened, if I show you, for example, here you have here in green, the spread of Latin American sovereign debt, that's on the right-hand side axis, about 500 basis points, between 300 and 500 basis points. And the red is Argentina, which of course you have to read on a different axis on the left-hand side because we're basically 2000 basis points. And the starting point of this graph is when we did the restructuring. And you see that after that, kind of the market lost total confidence in 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 and credibility in Argentina, and then the spreads actually didn't didn't never stopped uh, increasing up to around the two thousand basis points that we have here. Okay, so so you have excusable defaults and you have non excusable defaults, and um, actually I think that if we think about IT inflation targeting, there should be something similar to that, in the sense that you can have shocks which may have the central bank reacting in a relatively, let's say, accommodative way, and that the market understands that there's a justification for them. And then in the same way, and this is the connection I wanted to make, in the same way that in the sovereign debt literature it does not affect the credibility going forward, and that's the reason why spreads don't increase, then this shock should not affect the credibility of the central banker either. So I think we, we have to start thinking about this excusable default concept basically transposed to the inflation targeting literature. Okay. And for example, I thought a good example of this, we're going to show some good examples and some bad examples. And of course, when we go to the bad examples, we're going to have refets a description of, of Turkey and we're going to have Argentina's, which is kind of their hand in hand. Uh, but a good example of this shock is Indonesia's 2005 oil shock, which basically at the time Indonesia was importing oil, had a very significant uh, negative shock. The local oil company, Pertamina, was not able to, to increase production in a way to, to compensate for that negative shock. And then you have a big shock, domestic prices go up. And in fact, the Central Bank of Indonesia adjusts its inflation targets, but was very strong in keeping the long-term inflation targeting. And people thought this is kind of an excusable deviation. 
And if you look at this, uh, the evolution of inflation in Indonesia, you see that it kind of has spike and then it comes down very quickly. So, so I would say this would be an excusable deviation. And of course, as you see how I'm building my argument, I think Ukraine today has some reasons to be perceived as an excusable deviation to the extent that it has. Now, let me show you two, I'm, I'm going to back to that slide in a minute, but let me show you two examples of non-excusable deviations. And the first one is the one that Refet already talked about. Uh, uh, Turkey starts with an inflation targeting program in 2001, tremendously successful. It brings down inflation from 70% to below 10%. But in 2009, they had an inflation target of 4.5% and their inflation rate was uh, about 9%. So they said, let's do something. Let's move the inflation target to where the inflation is. We've been so successful this last 10 years that uh, let's continue being successful. And uh, they moved the inflation target. And I think that if you look at the graphs for the Taylor coefficient that Refet showed, actually when you have the change in targets, the estimation of the coefficient starts coming down. So that means that it's exactly as he described that the way people perceive that change in the target was that you had a central bank which was not committed to lowering inflation and that certainly affected inflation expectations. And then we know what happened with Turkey after that, okay? Exactly the same story, exactly the same story was lived by Argentina. I was governor at the time. At the end of 2017, you see here how inflation had come down very nicely in the two years before that. So at the end of 2017, the economy was growing. Poverty was in 30-year low levels. Inflation was decreasing as shown in the graph. And the government decided that it wanted also to increase the inflation targets and, uh, and lower interest rates. And the way the market interpreted that was not the Fisher effect that you know inflation is going to come down, but exactly the opposite, which is that you were having a monetary policy which was not going to respond to inflation. And immediately the system de-anchored itself. And then inflation actually started increasing very quickly. And today Argentina is running a 100% annual inflation rate. Okay. So, so you have excusable deviations and you have non-excusable deviations. Turkey and Argentina are non-excusable. Indonesia, and I would like to argue Ukraine, would be excusable deviations. So let me just use this slide to, to just, I'm actually I'm repeating things that Rafet already said. When you look at central banking, particularly when you talk with central bankers in say developed economies, they've been so successful with inflation targeting that they think that it's just a question of just moving the interest rates and everything will be right and very quickly. But we have to remember that the inflation targeting regime, when we analyze it in a new Keynesian framework, is actually very unstable. If you have, for example, a fixed interest rate, the model money is endogenous and you have multiple equilibria. And the way I like to think about that is if you have a fixed interest rate and your prices increase for whatever reason, that puts pressure in the money market. It pushes up the interest rate. And because the central bank wants to keep the interest rate fixed, then it has to print money to bring down the interest rate. So it ends up convalidating with passive money the increase in the price level, okay? So that's why we need the, because of that indeterminacy, we need the Taylor principle, which is that only when people understand that the central bank is going to react with very, with a lot of strength to an increase in inflation, then that anchors the system. There's a technical thing that we may want to mention that it anchors the system because from a technical mathematical point of view, the system becomes totally unstable. So there's only one equilibrium that doesn't make you not blow up. So, so some people may feel a little bit um, uneasy with that way of anchoring expectations, but uh, like, if you don't go to the equilibrium, you blow up, but uh, we're very used to it in, in monetary policy. And uh, Refet basically showed that before the change of targets in, in Turkey, the Taylor coefficient was above one. So you satisfy this principle. And after the change in targets, he related it more to the financial crisis as well. Probably that, of course, was also a factor. The um, Taylor coefficient was smaller than one. And uh, so I think that the, the, the instability that Turkey had after 
2009 is totally consistent with his interpretation. And the interpretation that people did in Argentina was that when the inflation targets were changed, certainly it was because monetary policy was, was going to be easier and interest rates were not going to react to inflation as they had in the previous two years when I showed you that inflation was coming down and that had a devastating blow to credibility, okay? So I want to use these things to see what kind of lessons we want to draw from this for Ukraine today. But before doing that, let me show you this graph, which is very interesting because this is the US and the policy rate in the US is the black line here. This is over the last say 10, 10 12 years. And the, the dashed lines are the market expectations at each moment in time, which let me say also coincide with the expectations of interest rates of the board members. You know that the board members publish their expectations of interest rates going forward, okay? Now, what is this graph telling you? This graph is telling you that the Fed for over a decade has been weaker in with the interest rates than what market was expecting. And that it has been easier with interest rate than what the members of the board, this is not shown in the graph, and I'm telling you because the, the, the expectations of the member of the boards coincide with the dashed lines here. So the central bank was always more dovish than what their board members were expecting it to be in the previous meeting. So this has to have a dent on credibility sooner or later. And I would say that the most dramatic of these uh, losses of credibility in the US is here in the U-turn when President Donald Trump started attacking the, the, the Federal Reserve, asking for lower interest rate. The market was expecting interest rate to go up and the Fed brings down the inflation. So it's not a surprise for those of us like Rafet or me or you, which come from economies with high inflation, that we said this is going to be a problem. And this basically risks the possibility of the anchoring expectations, okay? Once you lose once you lose credibility, everything kind of becomes very complicated. Okay, so you may increase interest rates, and then people say, "Oh no, the only thing this is going to close is with a higher inflation rate." And uh, I remember at the end of 2017, I I increased interest rates twice. The first time inflation expectations ca came down. The second increase, inflation expectations went up because people say, "Oh, why is he increasing the interest rate again?" Maybe he's seeing inflation, which is worse than what we were thinking. So, so, so once you're out of the realm of the inf anchored inflation expectations, things become very nasty. The other thing that, uh, give me just a, a two more minutes and I finish. Um, also, you start thinking about the fiscal and monetary interactions because uh, once you increase interest rate and then people say, oh, well, that's going to deteriorate fiscal accounts. And if it is a, there is fiscal account, then monetary policy will not be able to sustain itself. So you start getting a lot of interactions which are very, very messy, okay? I think actually a very important part of this is if you actually try to fix the exchange rate, and I think Ukraine is, is, is doing this right now, this is kind of something that also is a little complicated because kind of it's very easy to bet against the exchange rate of a, of a central bank, which is fixing the exchange rate. Whereas if you have a floating exchange rate, I think you don't have that uh, source of instability. So, so I would definitely recommend as soon as possible to try to, to go back to a more floating exchange rate, okay? So let me finish with, with this slide, which actually I, I realized that it says exactly the same thing of the conclusions of the previous presentation, okay? And uh, so wh what did what did Gorodnenko uh, say? He says, keep it simple and direct, focus on targets and be sustained. Those were the th his three conclusions, okay? And what I wrote here is, the first thing is, you always have to be in control of the inflation. What do I mean by this? You don't want to say, inflation is not my fault. So for example, when Jay Powell for a year said that, inflation was transitory and because it was an increase in energy prices, he was basically saying that he was not going to move the interest rate. And if he's saying that he's not moving the interest rate, he's basically having a Taylor coefficient, which is zero. 
and that the anchors the system. So the, the thing that the, you want to avoid the temptation of saying, I'm not responsible for inflation. Doesn't matter what happens. You have to say, I'm in control. I have this, I have this responsibility. There are no excuses. I'm responsible. So I think that's the first thing that I would I would suggest. And I think it derives from the theory. The second is you want to keep the targets. I, I look at the experience of Turkey. I look at the experience of Argentina. Once you keep the targets, I say, if you change the targets, you don't have targets anymore. You lose total credibility. So you always want to stick to your target. You may deviate. You may not achieve your targets. You don't want to change the targets. So I would say, that that's very important. And the only way that you're going to build credibility is you want to be very consistent and basically operate all the times according to the way it's expected that you operate. Um, if, well, there was one question before as to how to build expectations. One thing that was very useful for us was that we created something called a survey of market participants on inflation expectations because the public tends to be backward looking and um, Analysts tend to be more forward looking. So publishing this survey of market analysts of inflation was very helpful for us to anchor inflation expectations. Remember, we were coming from a higher inflation and you're going to have that process. You're going to come down from a high inflation and you want to people realize that in the future inflation is going to be lower. So, so I would definitely recommend doing that as well. And my last comment, and with this I finish, is that in the previous presentation, it says you have to sustain your efforts. And I think that means that you have to be consistent, you have to be patient, and you just have to be logical. And then you wait for the results to occur. So, so I'm finished with this, uh, with this quote from Benjamin Frank, who says, he that can have patience can have what he will. And uh, so I think uh, the army is doing its, its side of, of, of the task in the field. And I think the Central Bank of Ukraine can do its task by equally being persistent and patient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Uh, so we are moving to the third presentation by uh, Carlos Carvalho. So please, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Volodymyr. Thanks to the National Bank of Ukraine for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to participate in the workshop and present. Also, give my support to the Ukra Ukrainian people. I was there in 2016 in what I believe was the first uh, inflation targeting conference in May of 2016. I have very good memories of, of the, the conference and those days in, in Kiev. Um, let me share the screen. Move things here very quickly. Okay, so this is still a work in progress uh, with with a bunch of people. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move a little fast, a little quickly. Um, okay, so what, what what we study in this paper is is how prices are set when expectations are unanchored, okay? And to that end, we exploit uh, the Brazilian experience where we've had, you know, different periods over time when expectations were anchored and then they unanchored, and then we managed to re-anchor and then they unanchored and so forth, right? So, so we're going to exploit this, this time variation in the degree of unanchoring of inflation expectations in Brazil and, and combine uh, the survey data with micro data on on prices, on producer prices, okay. Uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna basically study how prices are set uh, when when expectations de anchor or or unanchor. Um, so to motivate this, a quote by Ben Bernanke in a 2007 speech, which is which is a great speech and a source of many uh, insights and research ideas. So how do changes in various measures of inflation expectations feed through to actual pricing behavior? Promising recent research, the recent is this is back 20, uh, 2007, right? So promising recent research has looked at price changes at very disaggregated levels for insight into the pricing decisions, using clear on Nakamura and Tyson. But this research has not yet linked pricing decisions at the microeconomic level to inflation expectations. Undertaking that next step would no doubt be difficult, but also very valuable. 
And this is what we're trying to do uh, in, in this paper. Okay, so what, what we do is present evidence that the state of inflation expectations matters for individual pricing decisions. So it's related, you know, to what Refet and Federico were, were talking about and illustrating with, you know, with uh, episodes from Turkey, Argentina, and so forth. We're going to do similar kind of analysis with, with, with Brazil. The difference being that we're going to use uh, individual price data, so the micro data from producer price index in Brazil, to study how the pass through of exchange rate changes into prices um, varies when you move from anchored expectations to unanchored expectations, right? So that's kind of the core uh, of the analysis and the core result. So to that, we exploit various micro data sets over this 15 year period. Uh, we also present a case study of an episode in which an anchor was arguably caused by, by monetary policy, right? So I'm not gonna have time to, to go into that uh, uh, due to the time constraint, but I'm gonna try to at least show you some, some graphs that kind of give you a flavor of the episode and, and, and maybe convince you that there was a role for uh, monetary policy to unanchor, expect, to cause the unanchor of expectation. And finally, so we, we develop a, a simple model in which it, expectations can become an anchor. And, and we use the model to kind of provide a structural interpretation for our empirical findings. We basically simulate artificial micro data from this model and run the same kinds of regressions. And we, we find the same kind of results that we see in the data, okay? So this is to give you a flavor of what we do. Uh, so this is standard pass-through regressions with micro data, building on the work from um, by Gita Gopinath, Oleg Chalky, and, and uh, co-authors and others. So this is the change of prices at the individual level. Okay, we're gonna run plenary regression. So individual fixed effects, time fixed effects, the change in the exchange rate over the life of the spell, right? So we take each price spell and see how, how much the exchange rate varied during the life of that price. And, and this is the key object that we're interested in, right? So it's the change in the exchange rate over the life of each price spell interacted with an indicator variable which tells you whether expectations were anchored or unanchored when the firm reset its price. And this classification of, of time periods in anchored or unanchored regime comes from survey data. We look at kind of relatively long inflation expectations, you know, as long as you can get for, for Brazil, and then use that to, to classify these regimes of anchoring and unanchoring, and then a bunch of controls, okay? We also run versions where we, instead of this, Dummy variable for the regime, we use a continuous measure of the degree of an anchor. So this kind of an intensive margin and the results are very similar. So we also manage for a small subset of firms, roughly 170 firms. We can merge the PPI data with another survey where there's a question about firms plan to do with their own prices in the next period, which is the next quarter. Okay, so whether they plan to increase their prices, keep their prices constant, constant or decrease the prices. So we can look at sort of their accuracy rate, whether they get it right exposed because we can see their prices in the micro data. And, and then we run regressions again, looking at, you know, their, their kind of hit rates or, or you know, actually look at the mistake rate and, and see whether that changes when you have unanchored expectations. Okay, what we find. So first, when expectations are unanchored, pass-through goes up big time, okay? So pass-through is very, very low from exchange rates into prices when you have anchored expectations, but when expectations unanchor, pass-through goes up by a factor that ranges between three to, to five or six. So it's a huge increase in pass-through, okay? We find that firms also make fewer mistakes when they try to anticipate how they will change, how they will set their own prices in the future, right? So this can be linked to maybe attention because things are unanchored, everything is more volatile, inflation is typically higher and more volatile. Maybe firms are paying more attention, so they get it right more often, so they make fewer mistakes. Then we have this episode, this case study where we argue monetary policy can can lead to the unanchoring of inflation expectations, and we have we have interesting evidence using survey micro data to show that you have this very abrupt and very quick change in expectations after. Um, a change in monetary policy that had no grounding on what was going on with inflation and inflation expectations. So it was basically, you know, the central bank gave in to, to political pressure. Um, and finally, uh, we have this model that kind of allows us to interpret the results and we find pretty much the same results, even quantitatively. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip the literature for, for the sake of time. Uh, and now it's brief outline. I'm going to just show some graphs uh, that, that give you a sense of Brazil's inflation uh, targeting regime history. Then talk a little bit about the data empirical strategy. I actually just sh show you the, the equations for the empirical strategy. So I'm going to go over that very quickly. Then the measure of the degree of anchoring our empirical results. I'm just going to show a few because we have a lot of stuff. Then there's this um, episode where there was an abrupt change in monetary policy. Um, you know, we, we recommend you strongly don't try this at your central bank. We've seen other examples where this was done. Um, and then if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of the, of the model. Just to, to, to give you a sense of what we mean by this U-turn, this abrupt U-turn in monetary policy, I'm just going to show you a quick graph here uh, using YouTube. So, so, so people who, who don't know exactly what that maneuver uh, is can get a sense of, of what we're talking about. Okay, so, so this is what, what we mean by an abrupt U-turn in monetary policy. This is what the Central Bank of Brazil did back in 2011 and the results were, were, were pretty bad. Uh, okay, so this is 12-month uh, inflation uh, in red, and, and the target is the solid line, and this is the tolerance band around it. The, the, tolerance, the, the target and the band have been changed over time uh, for, for a few reasons. Um, our sample is gonna start with the, with the PPI data. Our sample is gonna start in 2008. So we're gonna focus basically in this two thirds of the sample uh, to the right, more recent. Uh, two thirds of the sample. This is a graph that gives you a sense of an anchoring, right? So this is looking at inflation expectations sort of in the third year out. So kind of between months 25 and 36 ahead. This is the target. These are the bands and red are these deviations, right? So using these deviations, we, we basically construct a measure of inflation expectation that has to do with deviations from target at this three year out horizon, which we argue is far enough for shocks to have faded or, or for the central bank to have reacted to shocks and, and, and put inflation back on target, right? So they're, they're basically these, these two windows of an anchoring. If you look at what's going on at the margin more recent, there, there's some an anchoring as well, um, but we don't have the PPI micro data uh, for the recent most recent period. So we're gonna focus mainly our data, like I said, starting in 2008. So we're gonna basically have like an anchored period for a while, then an anchoring, and then re-anchoring, okay? So that's that's the time variation we're going to exploit. PPI micro data, I'm gonna be very brief here. It's it's like standard PPI micro data. So PPI micro data are surveys, right? You cannot go off the shelf and, and check prices that firms are charging. Uh, so this is produced by a Brazilian think tank that produces many price indices and other economic statistics. Um, we have, we have two quarters that are from the, the, the that institute. So we had access to the micro data. And also we had access to this other survey, this manufacturing industry survey, where there are questions about demand, inventories, capacity utilization, and so forth. And importantly, there's a question about firms plan to do with their own prices in the next quarter. And for like 167 firms, we managed to merge the two data sets. So we, we have their pricing intentions, so to speak, and then we see what they did with their actual prices in the following quarter. Okay. Uh, the other data set we use is the focus service. So this is the survey of inflation expectations uh, of professionals by conducted by the Central Bank of Brazil. Uh, okay, so here, here um, with the little time I have, I'm going to try to go over the results, right? So we build on Chiquetti and Krauss measure of credibility and basically invert it to have a measure of an anchoring, right? Uh, so basically, if inflation expectations are at or below target, and there was never really a period when they were below target in Brazil, there was a brief period, but you know, there are some details that, that justify this choice. So basically, if inflation expectations are at target, we say there's no an anchoring. If they are above the, the, the upper limit of the tolerance band, this is the pi max here. We say they're perfectly unanchored or fully unanchored. And in between is just kind of a proportional distance between you know, targets to the upper end and, and where expectations are in that range, okay? Uh, 
Now, the, the horizon we look, this horizon S periods ahead here is, has to be, you have to balance data limitations in our case for, for a Brazilian survey, but also you don't want to have too, too, too short expectations because then there are shocks, like Federico was arguing that, you know, it's, it's actually optimal for the central bank to let inflation deviate from target if, you know, over some period of time to accommodate these shocks and then revert back. And of course, you have to do something with policy to, to assure that and to convince agents that you're going to do that. But you're not going to keep inflation on target every single period, right? So uh, what, what we do is we go out these three years. We're actually now doing results with four years, which is the most you can do with the Brazilian survey. And the results are pretty much the same, right? So is this inflation expectations sort of in the third year out, like this graph I already showed you. Um, and this is the index, right? So this is just the index converting the, de the, the deviations to an index between zero and one, okay? Now, people have looked at measures of inflation of an anchor of expectations using different measures. For example, one is the cross-sectional dispersion of inflation expectation. And this is what you get. So here, the shaded areas are based on the previous measure, but then we can look at the cross-sectional dispersion. Uh, and this is what you get, right? So dispersion does go up in the unanchored regimes and then sort of reverse back over time. Uh, and I wanted to focus a little bit on this change between the anchored and unanchored regime here around 2011, because this is when there was this abrupt policy shift that we are caused unanchoring, right? You can see this big increase here in the unanchoring index, and then it keeps going up. We argue this was caused by policy. Okay, so these are the regressions we run. Basically, like I said, we're interested in the interaction between the change in the exchange rate over the life of a price spell with this unanchoring dummy. Um, I'm gonna skip this. And these are basically the results that we get, right? So in, in a simple uh, pass-through regression with no controls and nothing else, you get kind of 4% pass-through in the micro data. This is kind of the first price change, right? Of course, there might be lags and so forth. We look at other uh, specifications with lags. When you interact with an anchoring, you see that you know pass through may sort of double or actually sorry triple because you have to add the two coefficients right so this is baseline pass through this is the increase in pass through when it's an anchorage so you kind of triple pass through but when you put more controls you kind of go from one percent to five percent right so this is kind of the range I mentioned pass through increases between three and five times um, when you unanchor inflation expectations uh, I'm gonna skip these other things because we don't have time. One question we address is like, is it really an anchoring or just non-linearity in exchange rate pass through? We have enough variation in the sample to have sizable depreciations, both in anchored and in unanchored regimes. So we can tell the two things apart. And it's really more about unanchoring, right? Uh, when you look at the non-linear term by itself, it's significant. When you put that together with an anchoring, it's really an anchoring that matters. Uh, non-linearity sort of disappears from the regressions. I'm running out of time. I just need one more minute, maybe. So there are a bunch of uh, these results about the accuracy of firms um, on price forecasts. Now, this is the case study about the abrupt change in monetary policy. And we're going to have time to sort of convince you that this was caused an anchoring. But check out what happened, right? This is a zoom. So central bank was tightening policy. And then it suddenly and very unexpectedly reversed course. It was a 50 basis point surprise for every analyst in the just a second, this is my, my time limit here. So I just need maybe 30 seconds and I'll be done. This is what happens using daily data. The, the survey, the Brazilian survey is, is nice because it's daily data, right? So you see this very abrupt change in, in the degree of an anchoring right after the policy meeting that had this abrupt shift. Dispersion also increased markedly right after the, the, this abrupt policy shift. So we argue this was caused by an anchoring. Uh, this is some newspaper articles, you know, arguing that 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 uh, the central bank gave in to political pressure. Um, finally, and I'm not going to have time to show the results. We have a model where expectations can become unanchored, so it's it has to do with agents' beliefs about whether the central bank accommodates shocks by changing the inflation target or not. Um, and then basically we simulate, we calibrate the model, simulate micro data, run the same types of regressions. And then we find the same kind of results, right? That when you unanchored uh, expectations in, in the model, pass through increases meaningfully. And these moments were not targeted in the calibration, right? So it's it's really like a result that we get that, that is quite similar to the data. So I'm out of time. Thank you. I'm going to stop here.
thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, one uh, more presentation. Uh, so, Alek, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, just give me a second. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it is honor and pleasure to be in this presentation. I already learned a lot from the previous talks, and I hope that my discussion will um, will complement uh, the previous discussions as well as uh, complement Yuri's uh, lecture. So uh, what we're doing in this paper is we basically, it's a small step in the direction or uh, we're trying to do a little work uh, in convincing people that uh, expectations are not fully rational or you know trying to do a small imperial work on the idea that uh, we need something in the middle between adaptive expectations and fully rational expectations. So that's uh, sort of continuation of this research program. Um, so why do we think high inflation is a problem? So why, one of the reasons why we think high inflation is a problem is that, uh, well, the households and businesses, when inflation gets high, they'll start to pay attention to it. And, uh, One person who noticed, so Alan Greenspan, uh, who noticed this relationship or who talked about this relationship, he talked about price stability is a state in which expected changes in the general price level do not effectively alter businesses or household decisions. Uh, as usual, he talks in a convoluted way, but most of the people uh, interpret the statement as uh, we want inflation to be so low so that people and businesses don't pay attention to it or don't notice it. And then, uh, uh, so 40 years later, we have another statement from current chairman of the central bank uh, that talks about dangers of high inflation. So when inflation is persistently high, households and businesses pay close attention and incorporate inflation into their economic decisions. On the other hand, when inflation is low and stable, they fear to focus their attention elsewhere. Of course, currently inflation is very high, so, so therefore, you know, people paying close attention to it. So then uh, why attention is dangerous? So why do we care whether people pay attention or not? Well, if people pay attention to inflation, uh, they will start asking for higher wages. And as they asking for higher wages, firms need to increase their prices uh, to make sure that they make profits. So we're getting into wage price spiral. As Yuri pointed out, expectations play extremely important role in many parts of uh, our standard models. So, and then in general, you know, in just the intuitive way, if people expect increasing and rising inflation, they will try to bargain for higher wages. And again, so that that's leads us to wage price spiral. So then do people always pay attention? Uh, the curious thing about economics, well, in particular, our part of macroeconomics is that uh, economists, we take very, very seriously costs uh, or idea that costs uh, play an important role. Uh, on the other hand, we're not taking very seriously idea of cognitive costs and that uh, it, it's hard to think and uh, it's, uh, it takes a lot of resources for people to think. And we always, or we often see it is in our undergraduate classes, but somehow, you know, after we come out of undergraduate classes, uh, you know, we write models in which uh, people are, you know, complete geniuses. Uh, so, so rational attention theory takes cognitive cost more seriously and poses that if cognitive resources are costly and if it is hard to think for people, and then uh, there are conditions under which cognitive costs are higher than benefits of paying attention. As a result, people will not pay attention to things that are not give them more benefits than their cognitive cost. And of course, like one example in US, uh, anyone who's been to US or who lives in US, uh, so the sales tax, uh, the prices uh, in stores in US, they're quoted without sales tax, but the sales tax usually is so low that almost no one pays any attention to the fact that 
the prices that you actually pay at the counter are a little bit different from the prices that you saw in the store. Uh, why don't we pay attention? Well, it's just a small thing compared to the, all other decisions we make in the store or all other decisions we make in our life. So we, it's just not, not that important for us. And uh, so we conserve our energy for more important things. Uh, okay, so continuing on that idea. So then uh, what we do in this paper, we explore changes in attention. So other changes, other shifts in attention to inflation. If there are shifts in attention to inflation, when do they happen? So, so, so what are the thresholds at which people start paying attention to inflation? Uh, why it would be interesting or curious topic? Well, so central bankers, if you're thinking about uh, shifting to this high attention inflation regime, so what's going to happen? So it will be harder to control inflation. And then uh, if that's the case, then maybe you don't want to let inflation to be so high that people start paying attention. So you want to keep it below this threshold level. And then, of course, uh, there was a, again, right now, this debate became less important. But before, so last 20 years, Fed consistently was below its inflation target. And uh, there was a concern about zero low bound. And there was some talk about increasing um, target inflation rate to a higher level. And uh, so that would be an uh, important topic for people to think about the optimal rate of inflation uh, in terms of the target. What do we do specifically? So we need to measure somehow attention. And the way we do it, we do it in two ways. Number one is we collect frequency of Google searches for inflation. And then number two is we collect frequency of, uh, me of mentioning inflation on Twitter. Um, we collect it for 37 countries. And then we basically do threshold regressions uh, in which uh, the, the algorithm searches for, is there a threshold? And if there's a threshold, how many of them? And then, uh, uh, so, so that's, that's what we did for 37 countries. What do we find? So this is the most important graph of my presentation. Uh, if there's any takeaway of, of whatever I'm telling you is this graph. Um, so it, this one is for US, but uh, we have multiple countries that follow same pattern. So as you can see, the threshold that the, the algorithm found was 355. And what it shows is that below 355, the slope of the line that connects inflation and Google searches, uh, basically it's zero. So it's not significantly different from zero. And then above three. 55, the slope is uh, positive. It's highly statistically significant. It's you know 10 times to 15 times higher. Uh, so the red line is below threshold inflation, and the green line is above threshold inflation. Uh, we find very similar patterns for multiple of countries for our 35 data sets. Uh, before I go there, so this is for Google searches. Uh, this is comparing Google searches and Twitter. So basically, the picture is literally almost the same. So for Twitter, the threshold is 339 instead of 355, but you know it, it's reasonably close. Um, and uh, the picture is very, very similar. So now not all countries fit the same pattern. So you heard a lot about Turkey. So nicely, uh, my, my talk connects to uh, talk about Turkey. Uh, so what we find in Turkey, in, in case of Turkey, uh, we find that slope for the levels below threshold is actually higher. Uh, and it's statistically significantly higher uh, for lower levels of inflation than for higher levels of inflation. Uh, and uh, Turkey is not the only country that has this property. So let me go to set of all the countries. So we have countries consistent with uh, this interpretation where the low threshold, the slope is zero, and above threshold, the slope is significant and positive. So, so basically, you can think of them as countries with a you know anchored uh, regime and uh, the anchored and the inflation staying in this low level. Then we have an intermediate set of countries where, and the, the way we classify the intermediate is that the countries where the first slope, so below threshold slope, is not zero, so it's positive. It's less than above thresholds 
so and significantly less, but it's not significantly, so it's significantly different from zero. So it's a small positive slope. And so that's the intermediate set. And then finally, we have set of countries uh, and you heard about Turkey today, you heard about Brazil today. Um, and uh, so, so they're, they're in a set of countries not consistent with US where people pay attention to inflation both below and uh, above the threshold. Um, I, would, I would bet that Ukraine would be somewhere here too. So, so Ukraine would be, as Yuri pointed out, you know, everyone in Ukraine's you know, not everyone, but many, many people pay close attention to exchange rate, close attention to inflation. So, so no matter what the level of inflation is, it's 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 so important to people or for their mistakes, for their decisions. So, if they don't pay attention, they make mistakes. Those mistakes are costly. So, they're going to pay attention. Um, now. There is a question. So we have uh, 35 countries, and even if we look at countries that are um, that are consistent, you know, are those are, are the all countries uh, the threshold is at the same level? Or the other the other question you can ask is, well, is it possible to increase the threshold or the inflation target somewhat higher, and still have regime at which people do not pay atten attention below the threshold and then pay attention about the threshold. And what we find is indeed there is some evidence of habituation. So in terms of, for the question, if people are interested, what question on increasing inflation target, is that possible? At low levels of inflation, of average inflation level, the answers seem to be somewhat yes. So I would not guarantee the results, but uh, you know, preliminary, it seems like, uh, it, or maybe, maybe I'd say it's maybe yes. Uh, at least we, we see the, uh, that uh, different countries have different thresholds. And, uh, you know, the, what, as inflation increases, the threshold increases somewhat. Um, so to conclude, uh, one of the classic stories about dangers of high inflation is that it causes firms and households to pay attention. Uh, we look at uh, whether households and firms, or basically whether people pay attention using two measures of attention, uh, Google searches and Twitter. And indeed we do find levels of inflation where people do not pay attention to inflation and we have levels of inflation where people do. Um, well, thank you very much. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. So, uh... We had a very good presentations on, on uh, credibility, expectations, and all the this uh, very important stuff for, for for the central banks, especially in for inflation targeters. Uh, I propose to shift to a discussion. We uh, for the audience, if you have questions, please uh, use the Q and A button and uh, ask them. Uh, but I propose to speculate a bit on uh, general topics like uh, we uh, from the presentations we could could get conclusions how uh, what 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 actually important for expectations for credibility how how they formed and uh, I just want to have a brief discussion on how the perfect credibility. Uh, of the central bank should uh, uh, look like and how to measure it how uh, actually it, what what is the ideal stance uh, for the central banks uh, that they could achieve in terms of credibility of uh, monetary policy so if someone wants to to, to start so please I, I can talk a little bit briefly about, you know, the, the experience uh, we we had at the central bank, right? So I, I joined the the board of the central bank of Brazil in in July of 2016, so actually right after the the inflation targeting conference in in Kiev, right? And that was the time was a time when expectations uh, ha had become unanchored, right? Between 2011. And kind of around that time, uh, and and you know this 
this kind of results that I managed to show here, this is something you, you kind of had the impression, right? So shocks seem to have higher effect on inflation and exchange rate for depreciation. There was talk of fiscal dominance at the time. It was a very uh, difficult period in terms of uh, macroeconomic policy for Brazil. And it culminated with an impeachment of the president and a change of, of government and a change of direction of policy, right? So both fiscal and monetary policy at, at the time, um, you know, Elon Goldfine became the governor. So Federico's uh, longtime friend became the governor of, of, of the bank. We started with tight policy. Fiscal policy changed in an important way. So there were, um, you know, signs that there was going to be an agenda, reform agenda, fiscal consolidation, pension reform, and so forth. So, so kind of this combination managed to, to re-anchor. And then we, we actually experienced a period with, with very low and stable inflation for a few years, uh, pretty much until COVID, right? So between kind of the end of 2016, when it became clear that inflation expectations were re-anchoring and before COVID. So this was a period when, when things were, were much calmer. So, so it's just kind of a testimony of the, the difference that, that it makes um, for, for, for policymaking, right? Yeah, thank you. So we have a uh, uh, Federica with raised hand, please. Thank you. I wanted to comment that uh, in a in a paper I have the, exactly the same result as Carlos on how the pass through changes when you the anchor expectations. And in the case of Argentina, you have 2016 and 17 which was the inflation targeting with credibility. And then you have 2018, 2019, that's the two periods I look at. And basically the exercise I do is that I look at weekly prices. And basically I check if the change in the exchange rate or the change in the inflation expectations affect uh, the pricing behavior, also regulated prices. And what I find is that during the, the period where inflation was anchored, the exchange rate plays no role. And once the system gets an anchor, it plays a very significant role. So I'll send you, Carlos, the paper so you take a look because it's very much along the lines. Now, in terms of your question, Volodymyr, um, look, look at this. What Carlos showed us is that 50 basis points in 2011, the anchor the system. And I tell you, in January of 2018, 50 basis points in Argentina, the anchor the system. But look, in Argentina, 50 basis points, the interest rate was 28%. In the US, it's 2%. So this is like if Janet Yellen would have brought down the interest rate five basis points, I mean, in, in, a, in a comparative uh, level. So I think the important thing is about consistency. What the market saw was that what you were doing was not consistent. It was not consistent in Brazil. At the end of 2011, it was not consistent in Argentina after 2008. It doesn't matter if it was five basis points, 50 basis points. So, so I would say in this quest for credibility, that's why I think uh, consistency, being able to explain what you're doing, it being consistent with the framework is extremely important. I would, I would kind of underscore that, that feature. Completely agree, Thank you. Federico. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Yuri. Yuri, please. Thank you very much. I listened to this panel with very much, uh, with great interest, very informative. One question for the panelists is this. Um, in Ukraine, we have extreme fiscal dominance. You know, everything is driven by the war. And uh, in these conditions, what would you advise to the National Bank of Ukraine? How can it keep it credibility, keep inflation moderate? Um, that's one. And the second question is, uh, like any other small open economy, the exchange rate is an extremely important variable. Uh, Ukraine has a fixed exchange rate. Uh, should we have floating fixed exchange rate? What are the trade-offs? Uh, what is your view on this? Thank you. I'll take the first part of this, if that's OK. I guess a good way of thinking about this is uh, along the lines of Federico's, uh, you know, not at fault misses of inflation, where you are able to say, you know, it is war, 
and we're defending the country and resources are needed for this. And this is not the time for us to say, uh, you know, inflation targeting, whatnot. And, and therefore, we're going to let the press level to rise. And the key is going to be to insist on saying that this is going to be an increase in the price level to help fund the war effort and not a permanent increase in the rate of inflation. Right? Uh, Federico was saying this in different ways, but um, I, I fully agree with the spirit in that central bankers should never talk about inflation as if it's something external to them. Because that really signals that you know inflation is doing whatever it does, which then obviously notes that we're not on top of things. Right? You may be actually thinking that inflation will be transitory, but the full sentence always has to be inflation is going to be transitory, and if not, we will make it so. Right? Um, and so here, I would think that um, you know Bianchi and uh, others have work on this uh, that that related to the Great Depression from an other perspective. When you are in a deflation, you may want to have a one-time special budget that is going to be money financed to kickstart an inflation. I guess the right way is to see it this way and package it and present it this way to say you know this is a one-time increase in the price level to help fund the war efforts. And when the war is over and we, you know, we want it, uh, we're going to go back to our regular inflation targeting. And as long as you're able to keep that up, I think it's going to be obvious to everyone that this isn't the central bank not doing its job, but it's actually the central bank doing its job the right way. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's very important. Uh... Uh, to 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 say that actually the central bank is uh, is taking inflation under control. Of course, the price level is changing, so that's a uh, uh, natural consequences uh, of war. But what what should not be permanent is inflation itself. So it's really important. Uh, Federico, you raised hand. I, no, I wanted to take the second half of the question, which I think was interesting, which was the foreign exchange. And for those of us who've been governor of Central Bank, I tell you, meddling with the exchange rate, if you enter into a danger zone, okay? You invite a speculative attacks, you invite hot money, which are betting on you keeping the exchange rate, but you may not be willing to keep it. So, so the, the, the portfolio flow a situation becomes uh, more complicated. Also, what becomes more complicated is that you tend to focus expectations on the exchange rate. If you have an exchange rate that's moving up and down all the time, domestic pricing behavior somehow detaches itself from the exchange rate because you see it's going up and down all the time. But if the government is saying, you know, this is the exchange rate, and the only thing that it can happen is that it can go up, then you're coordinating inflation expectations with the exchange rate um, and increasing pass through in a way that I think reduces the scope for monetary policy. So I I tell all my governor friends is uh, try to keep as far away from that as possible. And um, as long as your monetary policy is anchored, exchange rates cannot be whatever they want to be. I mean, the exchange rates have a relationship with monetary policy. But the flexibility that it gives you, I think it's it adds much more benefits than cost. So, so I would I would have a strong recommend. I would have a I have a strong view on on this second point. Yeah, thank you, uh, Alec. Um, I highly recommend. Uh, so, what Yuri suggested about. Uh, expectations so so just the you know division of labor so make your communication more professional hire people who are good writers and good at marketing and just use that so i think i think it's heavily underused by central bankers who are trying to you know be marketing people and they're just not good at it you know economists are not trained in marketing and you have pretty cheap marketing people who will help you and who will tell you what to do and how to do it so so you can use that part that that's one part and and i think it it, it was uh, I, I think it's important for communication things about inflation but also in general communication policy so so that's one and second i think you know being honest 
it helps with credibility. So, so if you if you're honest with people, if if you're trying to hide exchange rate, if you're saying like uh, you know exchange rates uh, places cannot show or cannot display exchange rate, that's not going to help you with your credibility. Like so, just being honest with people and say conditions are hard. We need to support fiscal system and so on. We're going to do it one time, or we're going to do it, you know, as much as needed when we have gaps. But here's here's what's up. Here's what we're doing, you know, and uh, communicate it in a simple, you know, simple language, repeat it often, so that you know, using using marketing tools. Okay. Thanks. So. Uh, I my proposal is to 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 pick up one one more to discuss one more issue is uh, about the credibility itself. Uh, are there any like ready recipes to get uh, credibility relatively fast? So, uh, for example, if you are. Uh, shifting dramatically your policy in order to get credibility will it work or, or uh, like gaining credibility is a long uh, story of building proper institutions and uh, there is there are no fast recipes on, on, on building this credibility so maybe someone wants to to, to, to share uh, opinion on this yes please Federico no, well, I want to bring to the table the experiences of Mexico and Colombia, and they started an inflation targeting regime. Uh, they they stick to it, but they achieved their and they were coming both from very high inflation rates, and they both achieved the target for the first time in their sixth year. So sometimes it takes it takes some time, but. Uh, I think that's why we were talking about the uh, consistency, you know, and, and and patience before, and uh, and also not get uh, too discouraged if uh, things don't go down as fast as you are expecting. So to keep this Mexico and Colombia example in your mind. Okay. Uh, so Carlos. Yeah, very very brief, just to add to Federico's example. I think Brazil early on, like when when inflation targeting was first adopted uh it actually turned out the first two years were, were great like the central bank you know hit the target almost almost perfectly but then there were shocks you know sequence of shocks and a very complicated election of of lula in in 2002 which de-anchored things completely and and um and there you know like the, the the government changed the inflation target and so there were you know it, there's a learning process here but i think looking at these other episodes of the other countries and i, I completely agree with, with federico is much better to stick to the target explain why you are going to deviate and then keep reacting you know to 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 bring inflation down at some point further uh, out uh, which you know it's understandable i really like the idea of this um excusable or acceptable uh, deviations right default because that that's really the case right there are times when when you just have to to extend the horizon a bit and accommodate uh shock so i think consistency and and uh and communication are, are really key to 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 try to make this work yeah. okay thank you so we are approaching to the uh, end of our panel. Uh, I'm really grateful for, to, to, to the panelists because uh, the presentations are great. Uh, we had an excellent discussion and we are quite in time with all of that. Uh, so thank you for your support. And we are uh, moving to, to, to the concluding remarks by the, by the deputy governor. Uh, Sergei Nikolaychuk. So, Sergei, please. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, uh, speakers, and participants. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, you all for joining our virtual workshop and making it possible to have this uh, insightful event, which uh, has exceeded my expectations. 
While most of us would like uh, to gather in a completely different environment, I'm really grateful for, uh, for the fact that we have been able to get together and uh, at least online. And I'm very happy that despite all these challenges uh, that we face uh, nowadays here in Ukraine, so the Central Bank of Ukraine managed to organize this insightful event and provided the platform to discuss uh, these uh, really important issues which uh, we as the central banks bankers face uh, nowadays. Sure, our challenges in Ukraine are really unique. Mm, today, since February, we have been conducted our monetary policy under conditions of uh, full-scale war, which uh, has affected uh, our lives in unprecedented ways. So we have, adapt, uh, we have uh, had to adapt ourselves uh, to the new reality under the, these con conditions. And uh, definitely we adjusted our monetary policy to these new conditions, uh, temporarily deviating from the uh, inflation targeting. But I like a lot this uh, reference uh, of uh, Professor Stutzer-Negger, uh, who called uh, uh, it uh, uh, excusable deviation, and I hope that in our case that we will really be excusable, as our commitment to low and stable inflation, as uh, the NBU governor Andrei Pishny pointed out, remains in place. And we continue to do our best to ensure the implementation of our mandate. And uh, while our challenges are unique, uh, actually today's presentations and discussions are extremely helpful and uh, relevant for us. Um, as the world uh, has, entered in, in, has entered a new era of high inflation, the central banks are looking for the instruments to bring it back to low, stable, and predictable level. Probably the scale of our challenges is a little bit different, but uh, the the main ta task actually remains the same. And um, yes, it seems that um, we already have the receipt, which proved to be effect effective both in advanced and in emerging economies. One uh, would call this receipt inflation targeting, but I would rather emphasize its major idea, commitment to low and stable inflation which in turn is the core for the sustainable economic development. And uh, while the idea of inflation targeting framework is straightforward and simple, the framework is very complex and flexible. And uh, as uh, Mr. Jaramillo uh, Vallejo mentioned in the beginning of his presentation, there is no miracle between our will of having uh, low inflation and the final outcomes. Different transmission channels may be more or less effective in different countries under different conditions. And uh, monetary policy targeting in advanced economies uh, definitely complicates a little bit uh, the life in emerging economies. Also, I should say the war in Ukraine uh, also you know, mm, complicates the life of many central banks. Uh, also, the central banks and emerging economies have these issues with the dollarization, which may harm the strength of the interest rate channel. And that was uh, very well uh, pointed out in the presentations of Tomas and Shalom. However, we learned today that in case of the Czech Republic, the transmission channel might still be in place due to the systemic um, and persistent monetary policy. Moreover, central banks have additional tool, tools to tackle the constraints of, of dollarization via macroprudential policy, as Shalva, Shalva described for the case of Georgia. Another element of the effectiveness of the monetary policy was raised later today here during the second session, especially for the emerging economies. A healthy balance between the fiscal and monetary policy might be crucial to ensure the mandate of both the government and the central bank. In times of unprecedented shocks, especially the monetary policy is limited, fiscal policy plays a crucial role to ensure economic stabilization. However, as uh, John mentioned today, 
in times of the high inflation, a consistent fiscal policy would help to fight inflation and could lower the size of needed uh, monetary policy tightening, helping to keep the servicing costs lower than otherwise. Uh, moreover, if central banks are successful uh, uh, in their policy and inflation expectation remains remain ensured, the price of borrowing for the government remains lower as well. So all these uh, uh, discussions are very relevant for the Ukrainian case, where we see this very hard interaction between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. So definitely we understand we have to find some optimal solution for the, in, for, the um, uh, for, for, for both institutions in order to perform our mandates in the optimal way. The importance of the inflation expectations, how they are formed and how to properly manage them, they are comprehensively discussed by Yumi. Also, it seems that uh, we still know little about inflation expectations, and there is a huge field for research um, for academics, uh, central banks. Central banks should do their best to keep them anchored, as inflation is a very bad thing for all economic agents. With uh, this respect, central banks uh, have to find proper change channels to reach the society and communicate their messages to affect expectations. And definitely, as uh, the discussion in the last session showed us, it's very important for the central banks to avoid policy, policy mistakes. And uh, frankly speaking, so probably that is the most uh, important lesson we may uh, uh, receive from today's discussions, definitely in our way to, uh, to, to inflation targeting back, we have to avoid uh, the, uh, we have to avoid uh, mistakes which were done by other central banks. Uh, so that is the lesson we, we definitely we, we learn today. Uh, I liked a lot the idea of uh, selling the, uh, to the population uh, this uh, idea of having one time increase in the price level and at the same time uh, so putting our efforts to keep inflation under control. Frankly speaking, so that resonate, uh, that uh, um, reflects a lot what we are trying to do nowadays in our communication when we talk about 30% inflation nowadays, but at the same time, so all the time we try to push, uh, to put attention of the public to the fact that inflation remains under control of the central bank, even in this environment. And our desire is uh, to put inflation to the 5% target, on uh, probably much longer policy horizon compared with the normal times, but that is still our, our intention. And uh, I suppose that uh, there can be really excusable deviation from the IT inflation, inflation targeting uh, best practices in the current conditions, but uh, keeping credibility uh, high requires from us sustaining the targets, even if we don't reach them now. And uh, our intention, our focus to uh, come back to inflation targeting framework, I hope will pay us uh, back in the nearest future. So with that in mind, I would like to thank you all again for being part of this event full of valuable insights and please uh, stay safe and uh, hope to uh, see all of you during our next uh, events, uh, annual research conference and also the workshop like this one. Thank you very much again.